Uh, so just for context, most of the attendees for today are moved to the live stream because um, the a lot of the congressional offices uh, don't like being like they prefer to be anonymous, so to speak. Um, all right. Uh, and we're live. Welcome to another uh, edition of Conversations for the Future. Thank you to those of you who are joining us for the second day. Uh, it's it's going to be an exciting day hearing more about uh, different mechanisms of assessing the risk of space, investing in space, uh, and will culminate in our third uh, business plan competition that we're doing in uh, cooperation with the, uh, as part of the new space business plan competition series. Uh, we're joined today uh, by Rachel Zisk from Payload Space. Uh, Payload's our media partner for uh, this month's conversation for the future. And Rachel uh, is one of their reporters who is going to help moderate uh, some of the uh, talks today. So Rachel is a... Um, Nomics uh, communication specialist at the National Institute of Health. Uh, she holds a BS in journalism from Northwestern University. And Ooh, okay. right now, as I mentioned, uh, works for Payload Space covering the business and policy of space. So Rachel, excited to have you here. Thank you so much uh, for agreeing to help. And uh, I'll turn this over to you. All right, and thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I am so happy to be here and so excited to hear from our speakers about the state of the space industry as it is right now. Um, so I'm also thrilled to introduce our first speaker, um, Adam Rentschler. Who Of sources, including strategic venture capital, venture debt, friends and family, and a U.S. government intelligence agency. As a very junior VC, Adam had one positive exit. He co-founded, ran, and sold BetterVote.com in 2000 as the dot-com bubble burst. Valid Eval was born of Adam's frustration with poor learning outcomes for companies competing for grants, prizes, and acceptance into accelerator programs. So Adam, we're so happy to have you here today and excited to hear your thoughts on the space industry. Oh, thank you so much, Rachel, and go Cats! Go Cats. Um, so if you have a um, presentation prepared, you can um, go right ahead. We would love to hear from you. Sure. Um, let me pull this up. All right. Is that looking like a slide? Sure is. Um, All right. Oh, and it wants to autoplay. That's always fun. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much. Um, so my, uh, my presentation today is really geared for those who are in a decision-making role uh, with regard to funding investments in space, grants from space, government contracts, whether it's from Department of Air Force, Space Force, NASA, um, folks that are in those sorts of decision-making roles uh, in program management roles uh, will, will benefit from uh, the content that you're about to see. So it turns out that deciding who's gonna get funding, who's gonna get an investment is a very complex group decision-making activity. Uh, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So a little bit about our company. Uh, we're a small business uh, located in Colorado, um, no foreign investors on our cap table. Uh, our customers, uh, really like us, which is uh, very gratifying and humbling. And we are experts in a very gossamer thin bit of the world, uh, but we're the, best, we're the best around at it. And that is this notion of using uh, assessment science, user experience and systems engineering principles to more effectively manage these complex government programs. So 
over the past three years, which was uh, fir first contact with the federal government was uh, only in 2018, uh, we've come up the learning curve uh, pretty darn quickly. Uh, and in fact, in, in less than 12 months, we won a phase one, phase two, and a phase three IDIQ uh, with the GSA. So uh, very, uh, very cool that, uh, that, that our product has been so resonant with the federal government. Uh, the, the flagship program for us today is the Army's Applied SBIR and XTech Prize Competition. So the acquisition process is really the thing that we're here to fix. And uh, I think that those who have been following things in the news uh, can understand and appreciate that uh, we are in many ways slipping behind our near peer rivals. Uh, with regard to space and other matters of, uh, of importance from a national security perspective. So the sand chart here on the right uh, describes everything from sustainment on the left all the way to the blue sky research that happens in federal government labs uh, that won't have an impact for, uh, for, for 10 or 20 years. We are moving from right to left on this uh, on this particular sand chart. Right now, we're playing at uh, the lower TRL and SBIR end of the spectrum. Uh, we're, we're keen to continue to, to march towards the left. So here are some of our clients. Um, it's a pretty diverse group. Uh, it's everybody from grassroots uh, community nonprofits that are doing economic development type work. Uh, all the way through uh, some of the biggest uh, biggest agencies on the planet. So this is DOD and civilian. It's academic and, and industrial. Uh, it's rapid and traditional acquisition. Uh, spans the whole gamut of research uh, and uh, includes all levels of, of government, from city to state, uh, up to up to the federal government. So. What we've brought is not only a scalable software platform, but also best practice workflows to help humans make better complex group decisions. So uh, just a, a, quick, a quick hit on a little bit more of our experience. I mentioned the Army SBIR and XTech programs. We're currently in charge of uh, three major AFRL programs in support of the Space Force. Uh, and those are listed here. Uh, one of the cooler things that we did during the pandemic was uh, we helped uh, save a DOD program from uh, what some insiders described as months of flail uh, as the federal government was trying to figure out who had technology that could help ameliorate the effects of the pandemic. So this was the largest ever market research project that the DOD had engaged in. They got over 3,000 responses and uh, evaluating that uh, required some expert help. So we, we were happy to be able to dive in. Um, so today's process is a little bit like these uh, gentlemen here on the right. Uh, it's a little shoot from the hip. And that's not to say that you can't that you can't ever hit the target. In fact, it's remarkable how folks can get to pretty good decisions uh, without really any thoughtful process and in an ad hoc approach. Uh, however, uh, conversation and, and paper-based workflows are not how we should be doing things, in my opinion, in 2022. Uh, and I think that it's also fair to say that, that we are much more cognizant in today's world about bias than we have been in the past. And gosh dang it, bias has got to get addressed. Uh, furthermore, I think one of the big problems that is uh, talked about a lot less than it should be is the value that non-selects get from having applied to these programs. And if you're not delivering value to non-selects, your program is not gonna be very successful in the long run. Uh, finally, one thing that, that is a big bugaboo for our program managers is the fear of protest. And so it would sure be nice if there was something that could be done about that. So our approach is very, very simple. Um, we've had, the, the kernel of our idea is, uh, <laughs> is, is easily stated, and that is we, been, we bring the best practices in assessment from a field called the learning sciences. Uh, we are actually, uh, the three co-founders of the company are all uh, Northwestern uh, alumni. Uh, and uh, our, uh, our learning scientist got his PhD from, uh, from Northwestern in, in this field. And so all we've done is bring that best practice, which has existed for decades, to the innovation space. Um, so with that, we combine known good workflows and clean data and an automated debrief process, which is what provides that value to the non-selects. 
The result is something that scales beautifully from a handful of proposals to, uh, to literally hundreds and hundreds of not only subject matter experts and warfighter uh, judges, but also hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of applicants. So the key is to codify commander's intent in something called a rubric. And uh, I'm about to date myself because rubrics were not part of my academic world as I was growing up. I'm a little too old for these to have been a thing. Uh, but we fielded uh, so far 208 of these, and that's more than anybody else in the world has ever uh, been silly enough to develop. Uh, so with, uh, with a, a good clean rubric, we've got everything codified, we've got commander's intent captured, and let's see, I need to start a video here. Sorry about this. Now you're seeing my screen, this is embarrassing. I should have had this queued up, I'm so sorry. And now you've got my financials. That's not good. <laughs> um, I tell you what, we'll skip the video. Um, sorry for that. So when one of our off-the-shelf rubrics isn't, uh, isn't right for your program, um, we have consulting engagements that can either instantiate a brand new rubric from whole cloth or modify one that we have off the shelf. And chances are one of those 208 is going to be a really good place to start uh, for a given program. So the inputs into this thing, and there's my video link, uh, the inputs to this process are the proposals, pitches, or demos uh, from industry, and then your judge's expertise. And let's see what happens when I click this. Here we go, we're back on the golden path. So one of the things that we've worked very hard to do, uh, hopefully this video is playing, is to make this uh, a training-free experience. So here you see a judge interacting with, uh, with our rubric. That little widget follows them around. There really isn't any training required whatsoever. So this is a, a mixed method approach. It captures both quantitative and quali qualitative data. Uh, introductions are possible. And then comments can be made on a government-only basis or anonymized and shared back uh, with industry. And in this way, uh, the, the workflow is very, very efficient. Uh, and in as little as 20 minutes, an expert evaluator can, uh, can charge through a couple page white paper, which is a pretty typical performance artifact for our clients. So that workflow by itself uh, is what drives and delivers the rest of the slides that you're gonna see here. So one of the things that's really important to realize here is that this is not some artificial intelligence that is uh, seizing control from program managers and making decisions for them. Rather, this is designed to provide actionable data with which a group of human beings can come together and make much more efficient, uh, more easily defended uh, decisions with regard to a program. So uh, all the results get rolled up in, uh, in some pretty nice looking and intuitive user interfaces here. Uh, the, the thing flagged A, I'll talk just very briefly about, not only do we use an evidentiary basis to help enhance what's called inter-rater reliability, we also treat every judge's score with something called an expectation maximization algorithm. And this is the canonical method of identifying greater bias in academia. And uh, the bias patterns are identified and then removed globally for each of the judges. And as a result, you've got two layers of, uh, of enhancement to this inter-rater reliability which gives program managers more faith than they might otherwise have in the data moving forward. Uh, some comparison screens here. Uh, one of the things that I'm fond of saying is that most of us wouldn't buy a dishwasher without doing a side-by-side-by-side -side 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 comparison of the options that are available to us as consumers. Why the heck shouldn't government program managers have the same sort of capabilities? So lots of different ways that, uh, that intelligent comparisons can be made, including all of the comments that the judges made including uh, exploding each of the so-called evaluations uh, out on a judge by judge basis so we can see what each of the experts thought and pull those people into the conversation. Often an introverted judge will need to be invited uh, to share uh, his or her thoughts uh, with the team and this has proven to be a very effective way of doing so. When we pull that introvert in, it's pretty cool to be able to pull up their implicit rankings of all the proposals that they reviewed and this can really help drive discussions and, and sharpen things up and make those, uh, make those meetings uh, go a bit faster. 
In terms of feedback, uh, this is the bare minimum that is provided out to the teams would be the aggregated anonymized comments at the bottom and this uh, nice looking heat map, which will show the aggregated, in this case, uh, four judges clicks on those uh, qualitative, uh, qualitative metrics in the rubric. Uh, for government programs that are keen to uh, be a little more transparent, we always love it when they do that, uh, we can show the performer where they stood relative to their peers on every single dimension that was measured. We think that this is a big boost to industry in the sense that it can show uh, a given proposer uh, where he or she fell short very, very specifically and what they need to improve on if they want to re-attack and, uh, and be, uh, be funded next time. Um, so with that, uh, the program manager, after decisions are made, will come back and uh, do a quick scrub of the comments, make sure that everything in there is appropriate and is going to reflect well on the program. Uh, with that, they flip a toggle and these debriefs are uh, these debriefs are in the hands of all of the proposers, whether they won or lost. At the end of the day, when everything is wrapped up, we have a, a pretty uh, robust suite of reports that program managers can download and file away. And in case of protests, they have literally every single click that all of their experts made uh, with which they can defend their procurement decisions. Um, so that's it. Thanks for letting me drag you through those slides. Thanks so much for sharing all that information, Adam. It's really interesting. Um, and it's, it's great to see the the workflow that looks super easy to use and simple, which I imagine is an upgrade from um, usual decision making processes, which I know can get very complicated. Um, but I'm interested to hear more about how you develop these rubrics and who you talk to and what kind of considerations go into that decision making process. Well, it's interesting, Rachel. Generally speaking, a really good program manager knows in her guts what it is that she wants to see. Uh, but it's there. There is this paradox of expertise, right? Which is to say that that the further away you are from being a novice, the the more difficult it can be to explain what exactly good looks like. And so, over the past ten years, we've gotten very good at sitting down with those experts and literally pulling out of their guts what the difference between amazing, pretty good, and awful is in the eyes of that particular program manager. And everything we do is in service to those program managers and the goals and the mission that they have. And so getting that rubric right and having that really be resonant with the guts of that program manager, what they know at an intuitive level to be true, is that's the, 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 the pivot between success and failure. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any specific um, kind of considerations that are different for space industry decision making processes versus you know, other branches of the DOD and other considerations of the DOD? Uh, well, every every program is different, Rachel, which is how we got to 208, right? So if there were one rubric to rule them all, uh, we, we wouldn't we wouldn't need to have nearly as many. Um, I'm going to I'm going to give you a silly example uh, just to just to make a point. And the silly example is that our system would be great for evaluating Olympic diving. I know nothing about Olympic diving, but if we were to sit down with optimally six Olympic diving judges, uh, and Olympic diving coaches, you know, that sort of archetype of person, we have the skills to pull out of their guts and really understand what makes uh, a, what, what, what an excellent versus a mediocre Olympic dive would be. And so for space programs, to be sure, there are unique elements to it, uh, mm -hmm. but that's true in every corner of the universe where we're, we're uh, deploying our tools. Yeah, that's fascinating that this is sort of a process that'll work for any real decision making process or any anything that needs to be graded, would you say? With the following caveat, human mm -hmm. beings are really good at getting together and talking and hashing things out, right? It's it's something that 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 goes back many, many millennia, in fact, probably to the birth of language itself. So uh, what, what I'm fond of saying is if all of the relevant stakeholders to make a decision can fit around a kitchen table, you don't need a software tool. You can have a group discussion and get to a good outcome. Uh, however, if you're dealing with tens or hundreds of stakeholders, if you're dealing with tens or hundreds of proposals, uh, and you need to pull in different archetypes, different sorts of experts from across a large organization, that's where we love to play. Absolutely. 
Um, could you tell me a little bit, you mentioned um, transparency being um, a pretty big value and something that you um, considered a lot while you were building the software project. What is the value of um, that transparency and feedback for um, these groups applying to um, or uh, <laughs> trying to gain these other government contracts and um, how does that program help them to improve and um, rehash their process? Sure. Well, let's let's start with kind of the ick factor that many who haven't worked with the government have about the prospect of working with the government. Right. It, so so many of us are conditioned to believe that the decision making happens in some smoke filled room with a bunch of insiders and they're going to pick their cousin, their favorite, their, their father in law, whatever it is. And that must be how government works. Now, why do people have that perception? Well, it's because there isn't really any tangible output. There isn't any explanation beyond two very polite paragraphs, which say this to the non-selects. And it's always the same two very polite paragraphs, but that's it. You don't get, there's no explanatory power typically in those. Now, today, most government programs will offer you the opportunity to beg for a debrief, which comes typically three or four months after the fact. And with the pace of today's world, if you're going to give me feedback on something I did three or four months ago, Lord help me. I don't have any idea what I was doing three or four months ago. I mean, so much water is under the bridge. So that's kind of baseline. In terms of how we enhance it, there's some really interesting stuff that happens. We pre-publish the rubric for everyone to see and say explicitly, this is the thing with which you will be measured. And before the proposers put pen to paper, they can see exactly point by point, qualitative box by qualitative box, what they have to do to be excellent. This creates a rising tide. It's something called formative feedback. And it's feedback that happens before we even begin to produce our proposal. So that's on the front end. And on the back end, you get that heat map that we just looked at. And optimally, when we can convince the program managers that it's a good idea, they can see what their relative performance was without, any, without outing anybody else, but giving them uh, the, the brackets and, and those box plots that show where their performance fell on a quartile by quartile basis. It's really interesting. Do you think that, um, or have you seen in the feedback that you've gotten from your clients that that has had any impact on like the, the range of um, contracts that are accepted? Are there more innovative, um, younger technologies maybe being accepted into these programs? Or um, have you noticed any trends in that way? It's, it's hard to say because we don't, we don't uh, often have access to the before data. Um, so, but one of, but let's, let's talk a little bit about data and let's talk about the, what, what, I, what, what I consider the holy grail for government programs. And that is to adopt a system that can be predictive, predictive of success however we define it, right? And there's this notion in within the Department of Defense called transition. Now, if you ask three different DOD employees what transition means, you're going to get 10 different definitions. That's a whole different problem. We need to figure out what the, what the heck transition means and come up with a good basket of definitions. But let's imagine a world where there were two or three definitions of transition with which everyone agreed. What you want are programs that can be predictive at a very early look, at a very low TRL, they can predict the teams that are most likely to transition. Well, it turns out we've done exactly that in the private sector. Our, our principal rubric that, develop, that evaluates startup companies that are desirous of, of uh, venture capital, we are predictive of five different su success metrics in the startup space. And so, if we've done it there, I'd like to think that it's possible to do that in DOD. First thing we got to do is come up with a shared definition with which no one's going to fuss, right? And that's, that's a big, hard problem, but, I, but I'm certain that we can get there. So what we want is to be predictive of those outcomes. And if we can be predictive of those outcomes, um, man, then, then the promise to industry is not just, hey, you're going to get this $50,000 phase one SBIR, or hey, there's 200K on the line. Uh-uh. If, if we can develop things that are really predictive and show that through line where it's not just 200K on the line, but this is a life-changing, like you're going to be a big company and this could be tens of millions of dollars for you and your team. This could create life-changing wealth creation for you. Why don't you go ahead and get on this escalator? If you can fight your way into this program, that would really be a smart idea. 
And that's how we're going to get the defense innovation base broader. That's how we're going to get more people to come play that are uh, scared or don't think it's worth uh, don't think it's worth the headache to get involved with the government today. Mm -hmm. Are there any pain points that you think are remaining even after this um, kind of decision making process um, oh, aid that you think need to be addressed to make this process even easier and simpler? I, so uh, there, there, there are too there are too many for the time we have remaining. <laughs> but but let me say this: one, one of the things that I'd really like to see change from a policy perspective. Let's again imagine that we can change that we can create these shared definitions of three or four things that represent transition. I would like to see a capital gains holiday for all of the investors in any company that is willing to invest in the government and get all the way through transition. If we had a capital gains holiday for those companies to where they could you know, have uh, just a, a bump of 30% on what their returns would be when they sell their companies, man, I think you'd get an awful lot more people to play in the federal government space. All right, well, thank you so much for that. I can see that we have our next speaker waiting in the room here, but thank you so much for all that information. It's been really interesting to listen to you. Thanks for having me. Rachel, in. it's been a pleasure. It's always good to meet another wildcat. No, <laughs> go cats. <laughs> Take care. Take care. Have a good one. Nino, how are you doing? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm good. I'm great to glad to hear it. Um, so I have an introduction for Nino here as well. So Nino is the deputy director. course of actions from 900 senior executives and key acquisitions officers from across the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and the new Space Force, as well as the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Proud father of Sophia and Nicola Leon, married and blessed with Virginia Diaz Marcantonio. So Nina, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. All right. And if you have a presentation prepared for us, um, I'm thrilled to hear it. Oh yeah, so uh, well, we want to. I want to just kind of go, go go off and talk a little bit about what the DTIP does as a public-private partnership uh, in preparing technologies. We we scout in the wild, and um, uh, we've. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background on how I got into into what I do. Uh, I, I started getting into the government contracting in 2013, uh, working with the with, with CACI at, at the Department of Veterans Affairs at the EPMO office. Doing some good business analysis work and risk management, and uh, I, I I realized I had a good knack for um, uh, national security uh, driven initiatives in, in in modernization. So um, I began learning a lot uh, from my from my uh, uh, from my coworkers from 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 my offices, and, and I I began making my way to business process reengineering and, and identifying technologies that were advancing at the time or you know, as things are moving very, very fast. And then uh, fast forward, I got to the Pentagon um, and uh, I was at the Office of, of the Undersecretary of Defense, PNR, uh, uh, Force Education and Training, uh, and I got to the Pentagon. So I was very excited to, to do the work that I was already doing across the board. It went from the VA to the SEC, to the Department of Homeland Security. To, I, did, I did six, seven years of just kind of moving on up. Um, so to, to get to the Pentagon, I, I, I had I had a mission of looking at uh, the national defense strategy and, and see how we, we could we could improve the way that we were bringing in innovation. How do how how do we how do we get in how do we how do we accelerate innovation and how do we go ahead and find the emerging capabilities uh, to help us advance faster. So <clears throat> I started working with many different groups within the Pentagon with senior leadership. I had the blessing of, 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 of doing that. And we started we started experimenting on, on bringing in innovation. So the, the, the rapid capability assessments and you know live live events uh, within the Pentagon uh, behind closed doors. And if, after you start doing that after a while, they, you start getting people's attention, you know, at the at the secretary level, at, at the general level, at the DASA level. Uh, um, and, and you and you kind of like they take out 
they, you, you know, there's a box where they put you in. Well, they took out that box for me. They started walking me around the Pentagon, meeting different people. And with my personality, I, I exploded that into a public private partnership with um, uh, OSD, Sec, Def, Executive Committee, uh, Thomas Van Heer, who was under Rumsfeld back in, in, back in the 2000s. And having, <clears throat> having a partner who, who, who kind of really knew the mechanisms of how to work through a public private partnership, how to, how to do what we do at that level was, was very important. And it's literally, it's an ongoing learning. Uh, <laughs> it's an ongoing learning experience because I'm getting trained like a secretary uh, of defense and I'm dealing with people at that level, which is great. But I'm also, I'm also a, on, on, on the public side, I deal with people, so I, I build bridges. So my, my goal is to scout technology. I scout people, start working with these people to bring them in to our forums now that are run by policy. And you're like, my, maybe you're saying, well, what's the policy? What, why, why policy and not acquisition sustainment or or an R? What's well, everybody really around policy that comes? So we, we, we the, the goal, and you know, I just heard Mr. Adams speak on you know, bridging that gap of, 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 of technology transitions. Well, th there's a big problem. It's moving way too fast right now. The, the, emergency, the emergency capability is, is moving too fast. So we need to change the way that we build requirements. So if you think about the strategy that we put together is we bring in a revolutionary innovator of an innovator of an innovator. It's probably a small little company. Maybe it's not, you know, it doesn't have five billion dollars backed up from five years ago or two, but it's the guy that's innovating in the garage that's creating an, a, an AGI that it can take down a network, for example. <laughs> so those are the kind of things that we look at. So when we bring things in, we're not like a, kind of like a tech factory of a sort. We're like very, we, we do extensive reviews through the SMEs and HQEs that give us those, those bottlenecks and restraints or technology gaps. And uh, we 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 really look at those uh, those innovators. We, we 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 have a different formula of looking at the technologies. Like that means that it's not so much like are you VC backed, are you X Y and Z. We're more like we look at what you're actually doing, what the art of the possible technology is. We try to present, but it's not just one size fits all because because you know we we work around we work across the spectrum. Um, you know space, maritime land domain cyber so it, it's more like what it's more like what is out there that is really oh my god is that real <laughs> and and we we're able to do this because we we brought in about 85 in the wild half of them are born from our allies so so we we have we have this tech advisory globally that we've because of my personality and my and my director uh will has all these international connections as well he's out of sweden we're able to see what's going on in real time to help the government see maybe that there's innovation, not to take over a billion dollar program or, 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 or change the status quo. It's more to give us a good comparative analysis of what is the art of the possible because we're trying to leapfrog our peer competitors. Because we can't fit things into a requirement nowadays. We've got to make requirements every month with, with the exponential growth of our technologies. If that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like what you're doing is you're trying to figure out ways to broaden these requirements to kind of bring in technologies that don't fit into these, you know, set boxes of what the DoD says they're already looking for. Yes, that's 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 one thing that we so we scout, assess, identify revolutionary technologies for the advancements of, 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 of our national strategy with that, you know, with technologies that are, you know, yeah, we're talking about the dual use technology. We're talking about broad range of convergence of these type of technologies. So, you know, AI, quantum networks, uh, uh, the cybersecurity, new types of materials, uh, uh, nanotechnology. It's really broad because once you start, once you start seeing some of these convergences of these technologies, What's in an iPhone? You know, what, what, what did what did what? Why is this phone so disruptive? Well, it's a bunch of technologies put together by uh, a, a, a gentleman uh, called uh, what's his name? Uh, um, uh, the Apple guy. Um, <laughs> it's really <laughs> simple. Anyways, uh, the, the, when you build when you build a phone, you got to you got to put together you got to put together a bunch of different technologies. Well, what's the next step after digital? Well, it's brain machine interface, right? So 
you know, AR, VR, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, you know, all, all these things come together. That is what we're going to be seeing in the next, in the next 10 years, really, it's already happening. These convergences are going to change the world and it's going to be so exponential that we need to keep track of what's happening on the outside because it's moving too fast. So we need like a thousand different, different, you know, DTIPs. And there's a lot of different islands of excellences in the Pentagon. Uh, there's, a, there's, you know, they, they do the innovation ecosystems, but they're not really interconnected. Our goal was to bring a lot of senior leadership that are, that are inside each innovation ecosystem or tied into that, bring them in through our, our policy forums and look at something that might comparatively say, well, this is, we are here. These guys in Norway are here, or these guys in St. Louis are doing that. It's not so much like the VC from, uh, um, from California which is we have we just brought a couple of technologies that are you know we see back and they're already doing some fantastic work but it's also about the other it's also about the other innovation ecosystems that are so far and wide like how do we how do we know how do we know that we are better than uh missouri's ecosystem or virginia or 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 new york's ecosystem like how do you how do you tell which one? I mean, people talk about let's bring things in from uh, 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 Silicon Valley, which is absolutely amazing. But why limit yourself to that? Why not look at what's going on in Brazil? Why not was look? Why not look at what they're doing in, in Korea, South Korea, uh, Japan? So you know we you know that's that's what the Navy does really well in our F, you know uh, uh, the Air Force. But like I said, are are they talking together? I've been able to triangulate senior leadership to start collaborating on some things. Not that I'm the one that's like, because I'm absolutely on the wall, but the fly on the wall moves and makes some things happen that are important to, to have that collaborate and see the comparative analysis of some things. It's very competitive, but it's like, it's also healthy competition if the Air Force knows what the Navy is doing. And then yeah, it's all it's all like a funding game, right? Like who's going to fund this, who's going to fund that. So, you know, the, the Army, right? So... <laughs> I, th I see it as, as, as having a very fun position to be able to bring in focus areas, start working groups and do a bunch of forums that actually make impact. Because a lot of these things, we're not saying, oh my God, this is the greatest and latest best. We're more like, here's the problem. Here's the solution. Here's what these three technologies are doing. Here's what we're bringing in. Let's take a look at it. You know the value that that creates? That creates a comparative analysis of what's happening in real time on the outside, which is what we're missing. Now, there's also another big problem that uh, that uh, uh, your honorable Suze is, is, is talking about is understanding what's going on in our R&D uh, ecosystem within the government. So how do you know, how do you how, how do you break down those silos of understanding what is happening in real time? Navy, ONR versus Air, uh, AFRL versus NASA versus DOE. That's we actually are trying. We're trying to bring everybody around that table. Because if we get that feedback, it's like a loop, right? If we get that feedback on the technology capability. You know, you get feedback when you're uh, three months later. The, the stuff has gone dark, right? It's gone. It's gone. It's gone to a classified program, or there's a follow-up demo. We're not trying to. We're not trying to change the status quo so much. Like, oh my God, come here. We have to do it this way. It's more like scaled, situational, technical awareness of what's happening on the outside to senior leadership and the senior leadership have the power to get these companies in front of some of the right people and make things happen. But it's not like so much like, you know, we, we don't lobby, we bring in the capability, we help curate the presentations. Okay. So we're very, we're, we're, we're a humble group. Like we're very, very low, low hanging. We, we actually work with the, with the companies on the outside. So that's kind of like a little bit of an advantage of, to be able to do what we do. But, you know, we knew this because it's, it's 30 years, 40 years of experience. And um, um, we, I really enjoy what I do. Uh, I scout, assess all day. And I use LinkedIn heavily. I use my social media. I use geniuses on the outside that I work with. I built a strategic alliance membership, including Tim, which I love. I love, I love, I love, I love building these, 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 these strategic partnerships through associations. You know, it's the ecosystem model, business model. I think it's 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 what we need. If we can build these networks of of of, of innovators, space, maritime, you know, uh, the, the wherever it doesn't it doesn't matter where it is because the brain we need to see different angles from different people in, in diversity and inclusion of our ally and our strength is really going to be the um, 
or strategic partnerships in, in, in everyday life, all the way to strategic partnerships for the future against our peer rivals, because that's really going to make the difference. So that's the, you can do the same thing with innovation. So it's not just about uh, the technology. It's also models of how do we uh, bring in someone who can integrate? Okay, so for, 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 for example, we, we have a big problem in the government, I think, that we're trying to solve. Give the government back more power of, of you know, upskilling the government. Some of these requirements are like, when I look at some of these requirements that are out there, not, not to be me, and we bring some of the technologies, there's a big gap. That gap, we cannot miss that gap. We cannot write requirements. We, we need to upskill the people that are doing a capability assessment. So the form is also a way of doing that in a rapid capability mode. Not that we're trying to rewrite it. We're just like saying, look, this could be something that we need to go towards. You make the decision. Like I said, it's, it, 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 it's comparative analysis and technology scouting is not, you're also scouting different types of models. How do we get the lead system integration back to the government? Why do we have to pay so much money just for you know big 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 integrators? Let's just start thinking about also how to get creative with doing less with more. That that's an important topic. Um, and you know I, I'm not trying to bring down Boeing or 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 uh, uh, Raytown. Actually, we partnered little small innovations to those big companies, and that's a win for us. So we don't win simply. With our winning is like if we actually have capability that is, is actually kind of leapfrog right against China or against Russia because those guys are are playing unfair and you know we still we're, we're still stuck in a little bit in the 1980s the way, doing doing the way that we do acquisitions back then so we need to go towards just be more agile, shorten the time processes uh, of, of of doing business and you know we've heard it all on the on, on the transitioning of those technologies I think we have a lot of great things. But we also need to, when the companies come in, we need to give them a good, like Mr. Adam was saying, I took, I took a note, with, you know, right before I came on, he was talking about that problem, you know, with the, the, with the companies not wanting to do business with the government. Well, we have to figure out that way to say, okay, look, you come in, we have to speed up that acquisition process. However that is, there's, we have to be more creative. We have to, we have to upskill and we have to really educate our, our senior leaders all the way down from, you know, from the guys that are coming in, I think we have so much talent that we're un not tapping into. That's like, that really needs to be like a big, um, a big movement for, you know, you know, we work with, with DAU. I, I literally, I want to work with everybody, right? So I'm, I don't go in to try to compete. I try to enhance everything that I do. So to me, it's like working with the NAFWorks, you know, with, with Dillard, with working with, with, with Naval X, with, with uh, 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 Captain Nutt. Uh, or somebody else, uh, uh, you know, FRL uh, uh, with Walsh, Dr. Walsh, or uh, Rear Admiral Selby, for example. Those are personal relationships that you build, and some will move, some will wait, some. But but you're 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 trying our best from innovation. It's also because policy is supposed to run these forums to close these gaps at that level. It's it's it, there's a duty. There's a specific duty on the policy that allows us to do what we do. It's not some random, uh, and plus, you know, plus, you know, we, we try to collaborate with the Army, Navy, Air Force, but we, we pick policy because we kind of stay a little bit neutral. Now we have acquisition and statement, we have r &E that's like, what's policy doing in, in innovation? It's not. It's let's get everybody around the table. You know, let's get let's get the Office of Direction National Intelligence. I got I got them coming to 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 our forums. So it's like more the more people come and look at what we bring in, it's gonna give us better outcomes potentially for something that we have identified because that's all we really do. You know, and we don't bring in things like we do like quarterly reviews. It's not like fifty five technologies that compete for something. No, we 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 go after that innovative the innovator of the innovator. The people that are innovating Google, the people that are innovating uh, NVIDIA, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, Amazon. Those are the guys we chase. We that's the mastery of scouting, and it's not it's not easy. It's not always a success. Um, but that's that's pretty much how we 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 kind of roll with this DTIP thing, you know. And uh, yeah, there's a couple of really big big things happening, uh, especially right now. We we uh, we we're, 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 we're We've hit a couple of really great notes as of last year, and we have a lot of senior leadership applauding and, and liking what we do. So we just keep going. We keep 
equally. We keep collaborating. And really, you know, we're, not, we're really not trying to, we're really compete, we're trying to foster collaboration and increase competitiveness between us to make us better. It's really like a team of team of concept, right? You know, you got to make your team better, but how, how do you make your team better? You got to, you got to, you got to see what, what the other guys is doing during practice. And then you let the coach, which is the Pentagon, make a decision on, on who gets to play, who gets on the field. Cause you know, you, you got to be ready to be ready because you got a big you got a big you got a big tournament coming up big tournament so you know i speak in soccer because i'm a, I'm, a, I'm an ex-professional soccer player and i was an outstanding uh a student athlete you know um so i brought i brought that passion and that and that uh, that drive uh to the pentagon and, and i'm really blessed you know on, on, on what i do I, and, and i work a lot of hours to to do what to to be able to do what i do and it, it's really rewarding yeah, absolutely. It sounds really exciting kind of being able to witness like the cutting edge of all these new technologies. And I'm really curious to hear from you about what that looks like in space, kind of what technologies you're most excited about that you've seen through your kind of discovery process for these uh, meetings. Yeah, so right now with the space, you know, we're looking, well, you know, you got, you got, you got, you got, you got the, you know, high speed internet, that's going to be kind of a big thing. Um, uh, you know, quantum protection, you know, uh, that's, that's, that, that's, that's something that, that, that we're going towards and we need, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, fusion is, is coming on, is coming on board. You know, we got some of these early bets that we had that are gonna, they're gonna be the, the game, you know, uh, uh, we're looking at, we're looking at some, you know, some of the, some of the, the new types of energy uh, uh, forces that are, that are a little bit on the edge that are, I think are going to be making some big, big news coming out in the next couple of years. Um, what can we say? Um, yeah, just the, the, you know, the, the, right now the, the, the space economy is going to be, is going to be, the, you know, depending on the, on, on the, on the orbits of where they, they, they want to place these the small satellites. I think those are going to have like SpaceX is making, is making big moves based on what they've invested. <clears throat> so, so the government, I think SpaceX is going to be, is going to be, um, you know, they, they're putting doctrines in right now that are, uh, you know, we have to, we have to, we have to look at space just like anything else, right? <laughs> uh, we have to put some order, and we have to, we have to really, we, we are in a really tough, we're really in a, in a, in a, in a tough uh, uh, decade, right? Because, because, or you know, it's like back to where we were, but we have to be able to stay ahead of all of these emerging capabilities because it's going to be. It's going to be, you know, <laughs> we have also, you know, space, you know, doctrines that are, you know, are trying to prevent, you know, the future Star Wars. But, you know, right now everything is going out there, going out to the moon, to Mars. Uh, we, ha we have companies uh, with, with the Canadian Space Agency that I'm looking at very closely, They're doing some great things. Uh, of course, NASA, uh, the, working closely with, with, uh, the, with some of the senior leaders there. Um, uh, that have given us some 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 really great insights, some some revolutionary technologies that we looked at. So those have been some blessings as well. Um, most most disruptive technologies, I I would think. Um, yeah, I think I think we have to take a, a closer look at uh, what's what's happening in, in nanotechnology at the moment and, and in the quantum space um, for you know for satellite comms. Um, and the speed of the uh, of, of of the networks, you know, uh, on the edge. I think those are going to be. I think everything in the you know it's going to be hyper. It's going to be hyper uh, warfare uh, <laughs> happening, and, and and those are the the milliseconds that are that are going to be decisive on how to make faster decisions. Just like Mr. Adam was talking about, it's all about command and control and decision making. At the CS two, three, four, five levels. <clears throat> so we are looking to always see where the where the technologies are of course what what we can talk about but also 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 how we can always uh, 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 inject that right technology at the right time to help us move 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 ahead so i guess those are the those are the technology i think in space are most relevant but like i said for us working working closely with you know um with the navy and the Air Force, you know, it's all tied in space. I, I don't. I think technologies 
<laughs> all space technologies are, are going to directly affect us, affect us. You know, the, you know, GPS. Right now, you have the non non GPS efforts. Those are those are coming online. So we need to have different arches. Um, you know, we need to be we need to try to stay dominant. Um, and the more the merrier. There there just isn't enough. I I think I think having all of those prototypes done, and you get to pick them. The competition is going to be that. So against China, because right now we're a little bit have a little bit of disadvantage in the way that they're very let's throw ten billion dollars or something. They're going to try doing that over and over again. I think if we if we if we if we take an, a step back and look at you know uh, smaller agile approaches, especially how you know the, the Navy um, O and R is trying to go about it right now. They're having this agile campaign. You know the small, you know the agile, the many. You know, it's like swarming. You know, kind of think about it as as having a lot of different different small innovations, and you and you you have to be able to counter if if something. So the edge strategy, uh, Ramos Halby talks about. Um, those are the kind of things that you know you can you can plug that into to all of the uh, uh, sectors, you know, it's not just Navy, Army, Air Force. Uh, so those are the things that, that we're, we're trying to, um, that we're trying to instill, that we're trying to teach, that we're trying to uh, press on, get a lot of folks um, with really, really smart brains around a problem, try to solve that problem faster. And, and, and you know, bold, I call it bold leadership. So I see it in real time. Bold leader really likes something. They send their HQE, and that HQE moves moves on action. Those action, those actions are not like, oh, here's a, I'm gonna grab a million dollars and throw it at you. It's more like start having that conversation where it needs to go. And I and and it's just in year three in the program, we actually are trying to like move that needle a little bit faster with like more decision making faster. So uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. I mean, in space, you know, the, the the space force is still a little bit. We're still breaking into a little bit of their mold. I'm starting to get a lot more interest. Uh, but like I said, working with Air Force, um, with, with some senior leaders there over over the year, they they know what we can bring. So it's just about integration. It's also a, like integrating programs into other uh, things. They, everybody seems seems to like what we do. Seems to uh, uh, press some very important technologies forward, and that is all that we like. If it's if it's got to be one technology out of a hundred, I'm happy, and I don't even want to know about it. If it's going to help us win later, um, that's just our strategy. Like we're happy with how we do things, and, and it seems to bring a lot of value. Um, you know. Um, on the technology side, but also the people side. The, the, the people that we're proposing are people that are that are, that are that are just you know bringing in new models and trying to do things a little bit differently. And and the power is really is really on that coalition building. So you know if I have somebody from 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 the NSA give me some good feedback, a director or the CIA or 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 you know the, um, the NASA or from the Department of Homeland Security, you know at, at CISA. Those are that's powerful when you get that brain around a, a forum. Those forums are, are are built for that, and and you want those conversations to move somewhere. <laughs> so we keep working, we keep chipping away because it's really important. And you know, we we really we're not here to really bother anyone except make 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 the important noises of things that could be slipping through the cracks. At the Pentagon, when I got in there, you know, one of one of my directors there. I was saying, we cannot let anything slip through the cracks. You know, he was talking about you know the PMEs and stuff like that. But you know, the same thing. You, know, you take, you take, you take, you take that because if a few of those things, the really you could catch, you could catch the one guy that that you need that has the answer. So it's not about like VCs. It's not so much about the interest behind. It's more like here's the technology. If we develop this high risk, high reward, we can give we can get an edge for a democracy to stay alive later on. <laughs> I mean, I, I I simplify it, right? But it's really like that. It's it's it, I simplify it to that T, but it's it's really the truth. It's really the truth. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds really exciting, kind of being able to get all these um, great ideas all into one room to really 
um, impact the decisions that are being made at um, a larger scale. Exactly right. It's it's about scaling the uh, situational awareness of the emergence of of potentially catastrophic um, uh, uh, convergence of technology. It's 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 not, it's like it's too scary um, <laughs> for people to fathom of what is happening right now. You know, thinking about the metaverse, thinking about this stuff. You know, look at the movie Matrix. I mean, we're not that far off from 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 sci-fi. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of walls are coming down, and and people. You know, the, the more at least the senior leaders. Do we want everybody to know, freak everybody out? No, but we want to have senior leadership say, wow, I'm using spreadsheets in the back, you know, by making policy. And, you know, you have this AI that can tell you how to, you know, what you did in 1977. Or, you know, you, you have, you have this, you have, you have, you have this type of uh, uh, proportional system and you have five different, you know, uh, uh, ways of doing it. And we need, we need to make that best decision and try to, try to kind of like take out the calculus of, of, you know, the politics of it or, or the, or, or the money behind it. Like we have to try to be very honest with ourselves, uh, and, and that's that's also a big that's also a big part. I feel like uh, we are we are we are trying to do now. Of course, you know it's extremely competitive. You have you have you have you have people that have that have that have fought wars for certain certain others that are in certain positions. We are trying our best to do this, but as long as people look at it and they hear it, they see it, then it comes back around. Because four years later, if something doesn't get picked up, you're like, why was that not picked up? And then something happens. But the detail brought it four years ago. I mean, I'm just, just very small, very small little fly fly on that wall. But it's it's a it's an important fly making that noise. It's like kind of like whispering those important things to you, right? It's like, hey, yeah, we told you about the guy. And then you know, if you see somebody else developing it, that's kind of problematic for for national security. Yeah, absolutely, and it's so important to have those. Um technologies on your radar as early as you can. You want to be the first one to them. Um, well, thank you so much, Nino, for, um, for sharing all that information about DTIP. It's been really interesting. I think I'm going to take a quick break here before our next speaker comes on. But again, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been fascinating. Thank you. And I look forward to the, the being full support uh, of, of your program. Uh, looking forward to great things. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks so much. I'm going to take a quick break here.
to introduce our next speaker. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Bucky Buteau. Bucky Buteau is the director of the space portfolio at the Defense Innovation. One thirty and MC one thirty P aircraft. In his reserve capacity, Buteau is a brigadier general serving part time as a special assistant to the director, Air National Guard, in a federal Title Ten status. As a researcher with the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, Buteau worked on instrument concepts for Mars surface soil analysis at NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. He later served as co-principal investigator for a series of airborne science missions for which he was recognized for outstanding achievement and contributions to the Space Science Division in 1999 and received an Ames Honor Award as a member of an astrobiology mission project team in 2000. Buteau graduated from San Jose State University with a BA in Physics and Astronomy and earned an MS in Management with specialization in Air and Space Strategic Studies from the University of Maryland. So I'm glad now to turn it over to Bucky. Your, uh, Feel free to start presenting. All right, looks like we uh, just lost uh, Bucky there. I'm going to assume there was uh, some technical difficulties. Um, it's, uh, it's really cool to be able to bring in uh, someone like Bucky to talk about the work uh, that DIU is doing, uh, in part because there's a widespread perception across industry that um, the defense acquisition process uh, is uh, at best damaged, um, but uh, at worst completely broken, but that uh, the Defense Innovation Unit has uh, figured this, this out and been able to advance uh, investments into the defense industrial base, has been able to uh, make a lot of plays for uh, evolving technology and do it in a way that was friendly to uh, both the customer and uh, or the, the company developing the technology, but also to the uh, warfighter. And that uh, that is something that we you know, at the foundation are always looking uh, to learn from and take those lessons as we go out uh, to the policy community here in DC, talking with lawmakers whose first question is often, how do we streamline the existing investment channels into the space sector? Uh, and so uh, assuming 
that uh, we're able to get the uh, the feed from uh, Bucky back. It uh, it'll be a exciting opportunity to hear uh, some of those lessons. Um, yeah. So um, in the interim, uh, while we're waiting, I know uh, yesterday I gave a bit of an update on where uh, we were, what was going on here in DC, uh, and what's next on the policy front. Um, it's, uh, it's been a interesting year for a lot of the policy discussions um, between the election, January 6th, and uh, the closely divided Congress uh, it's increasingly uh, challenging to get legislation pushed. Um, one of the statistics we cite uh, as accomplishments for the foundation is that last year we helped influence roughly 2% of all legislation that passed Congress and became a law. At first blush, that sounds incredibly impressive. Um, and no doubt is uh, a notable achievement and a credit to the team here that's that's working that. But um, it speaks to a larger issue that we face, uh, and that is that 88 bills passed last year. Um, typically at this point in the Congress, uh, several thousand bills uh, have passed one house or the other and are nearing uh, final passage into law and uh, well north of five to 700 have already become law. And so when we're operating in an environment that less than 10% of legislation is being advanced into law, it's extremely challenging to move a lot of the priorities that matter to those of us um, who are in the space community. When NASA is even unable to get its authorization bill uh, the military is operating on a continuing resolution. Those are significantly higher priorities than new initiatives that the space sector is looking at, uh, including uh, some of the things that Steve Wolf discussed yesterday, uh, like our Space Corporation Act. Um, so as we've um, sort of taken a sense of what this Congress, so last year and this year, have done and are going to do, we've had to recalibrate some of the expectations around what is feasible to expect as we go forward and what, what should we start doing in order to prepare the groundwork for 23 and beyond. If, um, as it appears uh, that there will be a change in control of at least the house, uh, we can we are starting to look at how do we work with a number of the leaders uh, in the Republican Party who will be in charge of designing the committee structure for next year. Um, how do we work with them to ensure that when they do that, that space has a more expansive role? It's a, a little known uh, quirk feature of Congress that there's uh, not a set um, number or type of committees and subcommittees in uh, the House or the Senate. Those are set. Uh, oftentimes, what was there is more or less automatically renewed, um, but there's the ability for incoming parties to change the, the makeup of those committees uh, and add or take away. But usually that's done at the subcommittee level. And so one of the things we've uh, started advocating for and have been working in coordination with our uh, affiliated political action committee is to educate lawmakers on the idea that space needs additional representation on other committees in Congress. Right now it lives in the science uh, and technology world. Uh, and that is, it's a subcommittee of that. And so 
when space is being discussed, it's through that lens. What science projects need to be funded? What uh, what is NASA's needs? Uh, and what you know engineering problem is there? And that then leaves out a lot of the broader discussions around labor, around commerce, around um, you know as far flung issues as um, agriculture. And so, likely. In the future, there will be a place throughout many of these committees for space. At the very least, even now, with space accounting for approaching 2% of the US GDP, there's a place for it in a commerce committee, probably one of the committees that governs education or workforce. And so that's where we've started doing a lot of talks and there has been a lot of interest in elevating space as a uh, mode of transportation um, and a lot of other people are working that but uh, when and if that does happen that uh, is likely to advance space uh, into the conversation of a lot of the transportation committees and subcommittees um so is there, um, you know, one of the questions I get a lot is, is there a path towards radical or aggressive change to how we do space, whether it's acquisitions, contracting, or financing of space? And for most of last year, my answer was pretty consistent. Yes, I think there is an opening uh, through the investments made in the infrastructure bills that are being negotiated. As the year went on and Congress remained increasingly dysfunctional, uh, we've had to update that assessment. And while I do think there remains an opportunity to move the needle with this Congress, I think the true change uh, is going to be possible by taking some of these ideas, packaging them in a way that they're appealing to a broader segment of the population, educating that segment that Matthew McConaughey's ad at the Super Bowl doesn't represent facts on the ground, that space actually has the ability to change the standard of living and quality of life of people here on the ground and use that as a mechanism to insert advances and investments in the space community to the political platforms of various members of Congress that are running, candidates running, whether it's for House, Senate, or the presidential campaigns. And so one of the things that we have outlined in our strategic plan for the next few years is starting to shape some of that conversation with the national parties around talking about the benefits of space from national security to workforce in the platforms that they adopt in early 2024 for their national campaigns. And so I think that is going to be uh, the more significant vehicle for the um, change that a lot of us are seeking in the space sector. And so between now and then, that gives us the opportunity to, as a community, start coalescing around what ideas and concepts are most useful to us, what is that minimum viable product that we seek, and how do we then translate that message to the American people in such a way that it is politically palatable, for lack of a better term. In the 1990s, um, Bill Clinton won in no small part because of his uh, campaign manager's slogan, it's the economy, stupid. And until that, uh, that shift happened in the Clinton campaign, there really was this idea that they could use technical references, uh, they can uh, talk in jargon, um, but that's not what resonates with the public. We need to 
as a community meet them where they are and talk those uh, kitchen table issues. Bucky, welcome. Um, glad to have you here. I really apologize. Uh, sorry about oh. being, being a few minutes late. Uh, a lot of going on in the world right now, but uh, you know, thank you for having me. Yeah, glad to be here. Um, what uh, what I was uh, hoping to talk with you a bit about is uh, the, um, you know, what is it, you know, what's happening with DIU recently? Uh, there's been some news about you know, the state of the space industrial base, sort of the conclusion, tactically strong, strategically shallow, I think it was. Um, and what's DIU looking at to do uh, to address that? Sure, I'll, I'll correct you. So tactically strong, but strategically fragile is what we use. In other words, so uh, if you look at what's happening, we're in a renaissance of uh, commercial space. I mean, it's all around us. Uh, all you have to do is turn on YouTube and watch what's happening on Boca Chica and other, but that's not everything. Uh, it's uh, on the all coast. Um, there's space companies in the Midwest and, uh, and, um, and starting to flourish in Europe and other places as well. So. The most important thing that we see is there's a tremendous amount of investment uh, going into commercial space. And, uh, and uh, what we really need to do is see more adoption, uh, adoption across uh, the whole of society from uh, you know, civil, uh, commercial, and national security space. So civil space is actually leading the way. So you know, uh, NASA's Artemis program, I read a stat the other day, which is very impressive. You know, twenty percent of that program is is pure commercial um, uh, technology. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, which is really phenomenal. And you know, uh, there's a lot of people criticizing uh, uh, government all the time, saying, "Well, it should be more." But twenty percent is a lot more than DoD does. I, I tell you that much. <laughs> so, so, so we have a uh, we have a lot of uh, climbing on the ladder to do uh, in the national security realm. And and uh, I've said this at a few other meetings, but. Uh, a very good friend who's actually at the National Reconnaissance Office. Uh, his his uh, his line is buy what you can, and uh, build only what you must. In other words, you know the government shouldn't be competing with private industry. Yeah. Uh, so in the case of commercial crew going to the space station, and in, in, in the case of commercial resupply for the space station, that is purely a commercial activity. Mm -hmm. And the space force, you don't see any you don't see any programs where the space force is building rockets right now. They, they really see that launch as something that they can procure as a service. And, um, and they intend to do that for, uh, for anything that doesn't involve, you know, uh, actual war fighting type of thing. Yeah. Well, and, you know, to that, you know, you mentioned DOD struggles to, you know, hit um, a lot of the targets for that commercial overlap. Um, DIU is, is usually recognized as one of the entities that gets it right. Um, what is it that makes DIU so different? Um, I like to think that uh, we use more of a commercial model. So all those, all those investors who are investing in, in, in new space, uh, they're not just doing it on a whim. You know, they, 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 they do a lot of diligence um, and, and they carefully look at what the market potential is for for uh, each of these, each of these technologies and, and the companies that they're investing in. In fact, you know, uh, one of the best things that we learned from the investors is invest in teams, don't invest in technologies, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that it's the people that really, and we have ex the companies and the people that make them up are really extraordinary uh, in the, in this in this field, as you know. So, uh, but what we do is we look critically at three things. We look at the technical feasibility of whatever the company is putting forward. Um, we look at the team, of course, we look at the commercial viability of what they're doing. And then, and then we also look to see, well, you know, uh, who's invested in that company, right? So that um, later, mid to later stage companies are generally the best for DIU. We don't, we're not a small business um, program. There's lots of those. Um, a great place to start uh, if you don't have any backing or if you're just organizing and you have a new idea is uh, with SpaceWorks and, uh, and uh, entities like that where you can get SBIR grants. You can get an SBIR grant through NASA, through the NSF. There's lots of different avenues for that. But, but if you really, if you really uh, you know, rolled up your sleeves and you're like, I'm starting a company, I'm gonna raise investment, I've done market analysis, I know who my customer base is gonna be, 
Uh, those are the ones. If you're if you're thinking about talking to investors, you should be talking to us, and uh, and that's that's probably a good uh, thing. And now here's the other thing: when when we choose something uh, to do something, uh, now launch is a great example, a small launch. Uh, we didn't just like try to pick one winner out of the field. We awarded right. a lot of contracts. So we, I like to say we build a menu and then uh, and let the market decide who the winners are, right? So we're very market-driven. Um, success to me is that the company reach, attains uh, commercial success and that we have uh, the ability to leverage that technology uh, for national security and defense. That is like a win-win-win. And uh, like the SpaceX is a poster child for that, but there's many others. Uh, planet is that way uh, on the robot sensing arena, um, you know, uh, orbital insight uh, in the uh, analytics, advanced analytics. Uh, so we like to see that that type of uh, uh, mix and diversity. The word what we can't do is we can't create uh, defense contractors. So if you say, hey, I want to build this, tell me what to build and I'll build it for you. Which is, yeah. We get that a lot. <laughs> it's like, hey, that's not our stick. You know, that's that's yeah. Uh, now, what we can do is this, and um, we've actually, we actually have some really cool projects where we've teamed up uh, non-traditional, what we call non-traditional uh, defense contractors. Yeah. So the bucket we throw all the commercial companies into with traditional companies. So they have, they have Mavericks, they have people who think outside the box too. And, uh, and uh, we're cooking on one right now, which I think is going to be really awesome. But, uh, but uh, I like that because we're basically redefining the chemistry of how we actually ta uh, tackle some of the toughest problems uh, that face us from a from a national security standpoint. Yeah, and you know when you when you talk about it, like hey, we're going to award multiple contracts, let the market pick the winner. Um, that seems like something that is almost a no brainer. But historically, there's been this push for large bespoke systems. You know, mm -hmm. NRO satellites are a great example. Um, putting a school bus sized system in space, uh, you probably don't want multiple contracts for that. <laughs> um, do you see the rest of uh, the department uh, starting to move towards this? Uh, yes. So actually, I'll give you a great example. So the, uh, the next generation of uh, fighter that the Air mm, Force yep. is working on, uh, it's going to be it's going to be designed purposefully designed to be more of a uh, like a platform, a platform device, kind of like these things, okay. right? Yeah. So, so what's going to happen is they'll have an open architecture. So you, you don't have to get, you don't go to the same company for everything. In yeah. other words, you can have a modular bus and then other companies can make modules. Uh, you, and it, it's just like consumer electronics. And, um, and that's the direction that we want to see satellites go to. So it's okay to have yeah. a big satellite, you know, as long as it's maneuverable, but, but the thing is, uh, but uh, uh, what you attach to it, how you service it. Um, there's a whole market of things that are being uh, developed right now and the commercial side, which, which actually will be, you know, they'll be able, they'll be integrated into these platforms, which is really awesome. Yeah. Uh, as a kid, I always liked those pictures that showed the fighters or the helicopters with all of the different weapons and pods that could be attached to them yep. laid out on the tarmac. And it's cool to think that, there's a lot more things that are about to be added to those lineups. Right. Uh, so, that's, and I uh, think a, a key thing, you know, um, I, I love the fact that you have a space shuttle and a, and a, and a Saturn V behind you. And both of those things were designed and built during an era when the government was, was, was really the, the big, the big kahuna when it came to research and development yeah. today. Uh, the government less represents less than a third of all the research and development done in the United States. Mm -hmm. Two thirds of it is out in the commercial sector. So yes. we're only hurting ourselves as a nation if we don't try to bring all that together and uh, and uh, in a way that that creates new things, new industries. You know, uh, you know, the government created uh, the internet, but it was the commercial sector that actually turned it into something uh, really outstanding. Uh, yeah. six, I think it's a six trillion dollar global, uh, you know, industry today. So that's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> not not very bad. Yeah. But uh, but space will blow that away. You know that. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, well, and so a lot of our, um, you know, at the foundation members and the audience uh, that we have is from the space investing community, mm -hmm. and you know, you mentioned if a company is looking for investment. 
um, you know, pairing that with DIU might be an option depending on the size. Mm-hmm. Um, what is it that you need from that investment community uh, to, to help you all with your decision making or just improving uh, the process? Well, you know, uh, investors are diversified just like uh, government uh, you know, entities like uh, DIU are diversified. So, yeah. so we always look for uh, a good mix for, for one. Um, you know, we're not a requirements based organization, right? So what we do is we present a problem and we tell the companies, tell us how you'll solve the problem with your commercial solution, your commercial technology, right? And, and we want the investors to know that if we select them, the company, we're not selecting the company to do something different with it. We're selecting it because we're also vested in, in that, uh, that end state, that technology that they're invested in, right? So yeah. That's, that's, that leads to a different discussion because the investors often want to know, well, what do you like about it? You know, because we're an early adopter customer. We're not an investor, right? Yeah. They want to, yeah, they want to know, Hey, what do you like? What, what do you like most about this? You know, what, where do you see the strengths and weaknesses in this? And, that, and we have those conversations. Uh, we had an hour long conversation with somebody just the other day uh, on this whole thing. And, and, and what's good about it is, is that we're, we were purpose built to be able to have those conversations. Mm. Um, so we're not the end user. We're we're like an intermediary to somebody, you know, back in the Department of Defense uh, who who has a need for this. So, and the interesting thing too is if the company, in the pursuit of almost everything that's been pitched to us when we first see it, it, it looks totally different when it's done, right? Because oh, sure. they do agile development, they learn things, and they 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 pivot, adapt, and as long as they still work on a problem that we're interested in, we can pivot and adapt with them. So. Um, so we're, we're in, we're in it for the long haul. Uh, if they, if their business plan takes them a different direction, it's okay. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll just break off and, and go a different, direction. that's why we build that menu with lots of different options. Uh, oh, cause that right, does right. happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, uh, but yeah, again, it just seems like it, uh, makes a lot of sense, but turns out, you know, it's probably been an uphill struggle for DIU this whole well, time. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's culture, right? So yeah. it's, it's like, uh, you know, um, imagine how people communicated before, you know, before smartphones and that, you know, and, you know, if you grew up in that other universe with the landlines, you know, you're, you know, you're lost. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. so um, but actually I, I think we're doing pretty good on um, our, my, my goal would be, uh, it'd be nice to see us uh, to, uh, to attain a type of double digit percentages like NASA's done in terms of adoption of commercial tech. I think we're going to get there. Um, you know, by the end of this decade, uh, it's, it's uh, estimated that there'll be a thousand uh, commercial sensors for every government sensor on orbit. Wow. So wh- why would you not want to take advantage of that, right? From, yeah. uh, and these are sensors that are doing everything from looking at climate change to um, uh, observing the oceans to do all this stuff, but weather up uh, at, I mean, there's a lot of data there yeah. and, and, and the data, the data has value. And so, uh, and we're not saying, Hey, let's uh, spy on, uh, on your backyard you, using commercial stuff. That's not what it's about. Yeah. What it's about is that if we ingest a lot of data and we use advanced analytics, we can we can, we can detect early indications and warnings of advanced threats like what's happening in the Ukraine right now, and and have the lead time to be able to go after these problems diplomatically yeah. and do other things to basically lower the temperature of conflict is is the way my my boss uh, likes to refer to it. So so I think that's uh, that's really enviable and uh, and that's not too far away. But oh. it will, but there's a lot of culture, you know, that's that yeah. stands in the way of that. You know that where, where you live. <laughs> so, oh, <that's> true. <laughs> so, uh, but but it's coming around, and, and it's it's exciting to see. Uh, and the nice thing about the commercial technology, all that information is unclassified. So oh, it's right. not we're not the only ones who can benefit from that, right? Uh, our allies, other nations, regional partners. So we can lower the t- uh, temperature of conflict uh, globally. Uh, mm-hmm. If we, if we uh, use our data uh, and that's probably the greatest benefit of space is how it's going to redefine uh, the way that we uh, live with each other oh, on yeah. planet earth. Yeah, for sure. 
All right. Thank you so much, Bucky, for all that information. It's been really interesting. Um, I've noticed that our next speaker, Rob, is in the call right now, but thank you so much for joining. Um, thank you. Thanks, Bucky. Thing. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, so our next speaker is Rob Meyerson. Um, Rob Meyerson is the founder and CEO of Deladoon Space, a management consulting company focused on the aerospace, mobility, technology, and investment sectors. He's an angel investor, advisor, and director for companies included Hermes, Axi Axiom Space, Hadrian, ABL Space, Starfish Space, and others. He's currently the CEO of C5 Acquisition Corporation. Rob is the former president of Blue Origin, Rob oversaw the steady growth of Blue Origin from 2003 to 2018, building the company from its founding into a more than 1,500, 1500 person organization. Prior to joining Blue, Rob was a senior manager at Kistler Aerospace, and he began his career as an aerodynamicist at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Rob earned a BS degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Michigan and a master's degree in industrial engineering from the Univ University of Houston. He is an AIAA fellow, a trustee of the Museum of Flight in Seattle, and a member of the University of Michigan College of Engineering Leadership Advisory Board. Rob was awarded the Space Flight Award by the American Astronautical Society in 2017 for his accomplishments at Blue Origin. So welcome, Rob. It's great to have you on. Uh, thank, thank you, Rachel. It's nice to, nice to meet you, too. So, um, and uh, appreciate what you do at Payload. So uh, thanks for that. Um, Let's see, I'm going to just uh, launch into, I've got maybe about 15 minutes of remarks and um, share a little bit about uh, about my background and how that's led me to investing. And, um, you know, uh, as Rachel kind of said in my background, I've spent about 35 years in the space industry, about half of that in, you know, what I consider hardcore um, technical development, and then the other half working at Blue Origin, taking a 10-person company, a think tank, and, and building it up into an engineering organization um, that was about 1,500 when I left and is, you know, more than 3,500 reportedly now. Um, that that um, career uh, gave me experience working on the space shuttle, you know, America's first um, for the um, International Space Station, um, which didn't get built. They ended up uh, deciding to use the Soyuz and I, I worked on that transition. Uh, I left NASA in 1997 and I joined Kistler Aerospace, worked on a two-stage reusable launch vehicle that was privately funded um, and, and then uh, left there in 2003 to go to Blue Origin. And uh, Blue Origin was interesting in, in that it was um, really a think tank when I joined um, and over time built up the, uh, the engineering team to design and build New Shepard. Uh, and in 2012, we looked at the, the market. We saw the, um, the um, M&A activity going on in the liquid propulsion market between Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne and Aerojet to form Aerojet Rocketdyne. And um, we decided that uh, the U.S. government was really going to need another supplier of engines. So we decided... Um, to, to start selling our engines to, to other customers. And that led to um, the deal to sell BE4 engines to the United Launch Alliance for the Vulcan rocket. Uh, and Blue now has an engines business, which is, which is one, of the, one of the business units at Blue. Um, we, did, we did work on New Glenn. Uh, it's very active in the sale of, um, sale of New Glenn to, to major um, global satellite providers, uh, satellite services providers developed the concept for Blue Moon and then developed what's now called the Advanced Development Programs Business Unit, which is really where, where all the uh, future stuff gets done at, at Blue. And that's what I did in my last year at the company before leaving in November of 2018. Um, over the past three years, I've been an advisor, uh, a board director and an investor to space and technology and hypersonics and telecommunications company companies. Um, I also had the opportunity to work with the uh, AIAA, the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics, to create Ascent, which is um, an event. It stands for Accelerating Space Commerce, Exploration, and New Discovery. Uh, and Ascend is a convening um, and uh, started out virtual. Uh, we had a live event, but uh, bringing together the people and the companies focused on building our off-world future. And uh, we, we kicked it off in 2020. We held our first live event in Las Vegas in November, 
Uh, and our next event, AscendX Texas, will take place in Houston on April 27th and 28th. Um, I never thought I'd be, you know, call myself an angel investor, uh, but I've evolved to that because I, I really do, you know, enjoy enjoy meeting new founders and, and helping to understand their vision, help to shape their vision and and uh, helping them with, you know, small checks that aren't going to like turn the tables uh, on, on their on their investment round, but but certainly um, show my confidence in what they're doing and and um, and um, give them confidence that I'm going to be there to help them as they go go through the process. And companies like Hermias, um, the ones that Rachel mentioned um, are uh, are exciting and interesting. And, and, you know, today I'm, I'm, I'm in Austin, Texas, because uh, one of the companies I've invested in, which is not a space company at all, it's called NLX. It's a conversational AI company, um, is doing a corporate retreat out here. And, and uh, it's really interesting to see how companies have evolved during the pandemic and, and enterprise companies are more able to do this where they, they can actually work in a very remote and distributed fashion uh, as, as a hundred uh, percent part of their corporate um, being uh, in this particular company it's using quarterly retreats to to actually bring the bring the team together and it's um, got to witness firsthand like how you can do that and still uh, develop a very strong and positive corporate culture. Um, as Rachel mentioned, I'm the CEO of C5 Acquisition Corporation uh, and that is a SPAC which um, which is uh, focused on national security innovation in the space, cyber, and or energy transition sectors. I realize this back is a four-letter word, so I got to be careful um, talking about this on a on a live broadcast here. But uh, um, but uh, I, I believe in uh, I believe in SPACs. I believe in special acquisition, uh, special purpose acquisition corporations as a mechanism. I see it as a tool for fundraising. Um, it's an option for founders and uh, and. Founders of great, strong companies have many options today. Um, there are, you know, private investors. Many of you here on the phone today that um, are looking for for deals in the space in the space area. Uh, we see mega rounds happening all the time. You know, Locked Orbital's large 140 ish million dollar round recently is a just one example um, of that. Uh, Sierra Space last fall is another, um, and so. We know that that great companies have have options, but we do think I, I do think the spec uh, mechanism can be can be a very positive one, primarily because of the approach we're taking and the the leadership team that we have that that we bring to the table. In addition to me as as CEO, our our chairman is um, Steve Dimitrio, who is the CEO of Jacobs Engineering, which is a fifty five thousand person public company focused in all of our target sectors um, with an emphasis on national security. Um, C5 Acquisition Corporation has $287.5 million in trust, and we're now in the, in the hunt looking for a target company. And, and our, our objective is to grow a company into a national asset. So we want to find companies that, um, that are interested in growing their capabilities uh, into national security in one of those three sectors, space, cyber, or energy transition. Um, I'm going to kind of close up my remarks with... Uh, um, talk about my investment thesis a little bit, and then uh, happy to take questions. Um, I've kind of developed uh, my own thoughts on the space industry um, over the years and, and what, what those are and how those drive my thinking about, about investments. And, and um, you know, first, first point, I'll share a couple of points with you. Um, the first point I think is that, that we're, approaching a point in, in our history now where we're going to be able to build new space capabilities and companies on infrastructure built by others. So it really is sort of the, the cloud computing moment, uh, moment if you go back, you know, decades um, before AWS. Um, the idea now that you can build a space company and you don't have to build a rocket or build a satellite um, uh, is, uh, is approaching. And uh, you can you can launch on SpaceX. You have many opportunities on SpaceX or other companies. You can buy from Spaceflight or, or one of the other uh, companies that offer rideshare. Um, you can fly. You know, you can put your payload on on Photon, which is you know uh, Rocket Labs upper stage, um, really a satellite bus that can can handle it. Or you can buy a commodity bus from from one of a, a, a multiple suppliers. It's you know. 
it's not as easy as one click shopping. Um, and it won't be that way for a while because, because space is hard and there's differing requirements for differing missions, but we're getting closer to that. And, um, and I think by the, by the end of this decade, um, we're going to have competing providers for all legs of the earth moon transportation network. And what that's really going to do is it's going to open up a lot of new business cases and ideas, um, for people to think about like, you know, um, how they can get their their algorithm or their sensor um, into space and utilized and in, in generating revenue in a um, um, much much uh, uh, an environment where it's it's they're getting there much faster, getting to market much faster. Um, the second part of the thesis I think about is related to the defense industrial base um, and getting back to some of the comments from from Bucky and from Tim. You know, our industrial base is fragmented. It's it's really weak. Um, we need strong suppliers uh, in areas like machining, uh, composites, components, materials, and engineering tools to support not just space but all the frontier tech. I mean, if you're going to build a small modular nuclear reactor, um, you know, an urban air mobility flying flying car, um, high speed hypersonic or supersonic aircraft. Um, you're going to need all of those things. We we need them in space, but but we we do struggle um, with the the fragmentation and the, and the um, the you know the financial hardships and challenges that the that suppliers are taking the the long you know standard approach of offshore offshoring over the last couple of decades um, hasn't hasn't done anything to really improve our our industrial base, and we need to start to focus on it. So I so I am encouraged. Um, by the work being done, you know, by uh, by the DoD, uh, by by Bucky and the Air Force Research Lab and the Space Force, uh, on really focusing on the industrial base, the new methods and tools that are being used, like AppWorks and SpaceWorks, um, um, faster acquisitions, um, supporting smaller uh, startups, um, and uh, and really finding finding ways to to strengthen uh, the industrial base, but. But most importantly, it's the private investors that are out there that are starting to look at these things, um, looking at companies like Hadrian, for example, um, which I'm a, an early investor in. And it's, um, you know, that that interest in a company like Hadrian, for those who, who don't know, they're, they're a, a, a technology enabled machine shop. So so if you're going to build, you know, most machine shops I've had experience working with are um, owned by sole proprietors. They are. They are run on, you know, Excel or even pen and paper. Um, they don't take advantage of, uh, um, you know, modern tools for scheduling um, or for uh, situational awareness, uh, customer interaction, customer experience. And so, what what that means is that you need a network of people, of buyers, um, and supplier management, um, supplier quality experts that are traveling to calling. Um, and and really having to to you know uh, trust but verify get get into these uh, suppliers to figure out where their parts are, um, and because of the you know the historical cyclic nature of the um, of the industry, these these suppliers you know the, the for space where the, um, the the jobs are more single digit types of orders rather than hundreds or thousands where they where they might get in a commercial. You know, airplane buy or something like that. They're they're really um, you know they really struggle to 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 close their books and and uh, um, and so what we want is a we want to strengthen that you know strengthen that uh, industrial base and I think Hadrian is doing a part a part of that and 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 it it, it gets back to um, the large number of startups that are out there. Um, I you know I believe there there is a a market for more than a handful of launch providers, and uh, we have we have you know hundreds to thousands of satellites uh, that are planning to be launched. We do have thousands um, now. How much of that market is addressable? We can we can argue about, but uh, um, the, we need a supplier base that can build all those satellites and build all the launch vehicles that are going to deliver deliver those satellites and. Uh, not all of them are reusable. So we need a lot of machine shops. We need a lot of valve makers and composite suppliers. And uh, and so I think the investment into that sector um, is going to be quite important. So with that, I'm uh, um, 
really uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here and I look forward to hearing your questions, so. Absolutely, thank you so much, Rob. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Um, so there are some big changes that are potentially gonna be happening in the space industry this year um, with heavy launch, um, heavy lift launch vehicles coming online like Starship and New Glenn from Blue Origin, for example. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how that increase in launch payload capacity is going to change priorities in space investment going forward. Well, I think I think that provides an opportunity, um, and I think what people haven't talked enough about, you know, with Starship, um, we all talk, we all kind of hear the projections of potential for lowering costs by one to two orders of magnitude, and um, I, you know, I think I think that that'll be a game changer for the industry um, if and when that happens. Um, but what we haven't talked about is down mass, um, and so. With Starship, you know, if you can take 100 metric tons to, or 150 metric tons to low Earth orbit, um, that vehicle's capable of bringing that much back as well, or some amount back. Um, and what are the payloads? You know, like I can't even fathom, you know, even in 10 metric tons, like what you would do with that kind of capacity. So think about, think about global trade and a trade imbalance, and what the result is. You have shipping containers being shipped from one place to another that are empty. Um, and so what can you find, what can you develop to utilize that capacity? And I think that that is not, you know, not capacity that's going to be built, you know, within a, within a year, but over time it will be. And so um, I think that's just an interesting way to think about the problem. You turn it, turn it a different way. Uh, and add, add a, you know, one to two orders of magnitude price decrease, you know, Starship's, Starship can leapfrog everything out there. The, the U.S. government will never just rely on a single supplier. Um, there, there's always going to be room for the other vehicles that you mentioned, but, um, but um, at those price points, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's got the potential to be, a, um, you know, it's going to drive a lot of development worldwide uh, for while others try to catch up. So. Yeah, absolutely. I know you also mentioned, um, in your investment philosophy, the importance of um, funding businesses that are a little bit earlier in the supply chain, like manufacturing businesses and kind of the foundation of um, space companies. And I'm curious about what's going to have to change in that area, um, what kind of investment activity is going to happen in that area in order to support um, long-term human presence on the moon or potentially Mars later on. Well, so, so one other, um thing I think about in, in investment is what are the levers to lowering mission cost? And I think after reusability, um, you know, there's vertical integration, you know, there's um, uh, agile development, some, some things that have been successful in sort of accelerating progress. Um, reusability, you know, is sort of the, the first big lever. I think the next big lever is, is space resource utilization. So if you don't have to launch it at all, if you can build it in space, then, then do that and focus your your launch costs on the things you can't build in space, like you and me, you know, like flying people, you know, um, and that's that's what launch will be for someday. Um, and you know, we'll we'll make the things, we'll grow our own food, we'll we'll build our own products, um, and I think that's um, that's the uh, the um, the next big lever. Now, we've been talking about ISRU for thirty years, you know. Uh, um, and uh, what we haven't done is gone out and done extensive amounts of experiments. Moxie is on Mars right now, and they're doing the, the Mars oxygen experiment on perseverance. But there's just not been a lot of experimentation and, and you know, you know, machines on the ground demonstrations. And we need to do a lot more of that. And I think NASA's starting to do that, funding that through space uh, space technology mission directorate. Um, but uh, the clips program with these small landers is going to provide the platform to, to do all that experimentation. And we just need to get out there and show it. And so, um, but what, what's going to be critical to make ISRU work, whether you're making propellant or additive, you know, structures or, 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 or extracting other things um, is power. And so we're going to need space power and, and, um, for the moon, you, you've got choices. You, you know, solar, nuclear, 
can be can be options. There there um, there may be others. Um, you know, I, I think you know as you go to Mars and beyond, you you want to really focus on nuclear because because your solar capacity is going to be be lesser. So at some point, we're going to need to get comfortable. We're going to need to pick a power platform and get comfortable with it and start to start to use it and demonstrate it because everything everything we do going forward to to lower emission costs is going to require it. So. Yeah, absolutely. I do want to leave a little time just in case anybody in our audience has any questions. Feel free to drop those in the chat and I will make sure that I see them. Um, but in the meantime, while reading for those, um, I know you mentioned that you are um, a fan of SPACs and that you, you know clearly you're the CEO of C5 Acquisition Corporation. Um, but we've seen a lot of volatility in stock prices and a lot of sensitivity to failure in space SPACs specifically. And I'm curious about what you think is the marker of a company that maybe is ready to go public via SPAC or maybe when that shouldn't happen or um, how that sort of works from your perspective? Well, I, th I think in terms of R&D research and development, if you have a, have a lot of research to do, if you don't have product market fit, if you don't, you know, if you haven't completed a development and a demonstration of your product, you know, not you're not ready to go public, whether it's a SPAC or an IPO or or something else. You've got a lot of work to do, and we see we see some companies that are um, struggling to get you know to demonstrate their their capability, whether it be uh, um, you know a satellite solution or a launch solution um, that are that are struggling the market, and they're getting getting um, you know the, the the public market investors are beating them up over a failed launch. Um, uh, I you know. I think that um, uh, companies, the kinds of companies that I think are candidates for SPAC are companies that could easily, you know, raise a private round or go, go, go for an IPO and you're making a decision on which way you want to go. And it's a very personal choice as a leader. Uh, you want to, you know, if you, if your goal is to become a public company and take advantage of the public markets for, for all the things that you can do as a public company, you know, growth acquisitions, um, using public company stock as currency. Um, those are all, you know, those are all choices that leaders can make. Um, I, I think if, um, if going public via SPAC is your only option for raising money, um, you know, the, the results aren't going to be that great. And, and so, um, and I, you know, I don't want to criticize any of the companies that made those choices because I, you know, I wasn't in the boardroom or in the room making the decisions, but I do think that, that, um, you know, I want to be like, I believe that I can be a great partner to, to a leader that's, that's in a position to, to, you know, take a company public via this mechanism. So, so, and, and I'm a big fan right now. I, you know, we just went public on January 11th, <laughs> ask me in five months, we'll see. <laughs> but, uh, um, but uh, so far, you know, so far, so good. I think there's a lot of great, great uh, options out there, so. Absolutely, congratulations on that. It looks like Eva Jane has a question for you. Hi, Rob. So you, it's interesting that you're involved in a SPAC at this stage, because usually the people who are involved in the first stage of SPACs are, just there for cash flow and a few other things. And then they aren't involved at all as soon as they choose a company and, uh, and the, the merger or whatever you want to call it goes through. So what's your, what, and the way you described what you were looking at sounded to me that you were almost looking at creating a fund rather than choosing a company. So can you talk a little bit more about those? Because you left me very confused. Yeah, yeah, sorry to miss uh you know, if I uh, miss, miss. Uh, and and sorry for anybody else who doesn't really know much about yeah. these, because this is a yeah. little technical for some of uh, otherwise. Yeah. So, so with the SPAC, I mean, a SPAC is essentially a merger um, where, where the private company is basically taking the public company vehicle that we've created. So uh, there is an option for, for me or someone else from the SPAC organization to join the board of that private company. Um, and I believe in, in our situation where we have, um, you know, uh, Steve Demetrio or Jeannie Tysinger, formerly of the CIA, or 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 myself, we we have some um, strong candidates uh, to to do that and help help that company grow um, and evolve as a public company. Um, 
it's it's not a fund. Um, they, you know, typically you target one company or or at most two. Um, you know, uh, in a in a in some kind of a merger arrangement, but uh, but it's very right. different. So the way you were describing it, it sounded to me like you were looking at or to choose a lot of companies, and maybe I just misunderstood the way that you were. Yes, yeah, no, 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 no. It's uh, we're we're looking for one company, and and you know, if there's a possibility, two companies. So maybe, that, that, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. space, maybe defense. Still haven't uh-huh. determined. De- definitely defense, uh, space, cyber, or energy transition is our focus area. But our but our mandate allows us to go anywhere. But our strengths and our background is in those three sectors. So and, and you're targeting six months to come up with a company? No, I didn't say that. So well, usually um, they usually it's six months, but yeah. sometimes it's longer. Yeah. No, usually specs uh, can range in, in uh, uh, duration from fifteen to twenty four months. We have fifteen months. So uh, um, I suggested to Rachel that in six months, my, my position might change, but I, I don't think so. I, I'm, I'm very encouraged by what I'm seeing. So It's great to hear, Robin. Thank you so much, Eva Jane, for your question. Um, we're at the end of our time here for the Q&A, but thank you so much, Rob, for answering all those questions. It's been great to hear from you. Um, and yep. now um, I am going to throw it back to Tim to introduce the Space Business Plan competition. Oh, Tim, you're muted. Two years into the pandemic and I still get half my thoughts out before I unmute. Um, If I had shame, I would feel it. Um, Yeah, but it was an exciting uh, morning hearing from a wide range of uh, investment perspectives, you know, ranging from Bucky Buto and sort of the defense acquisitions model that he runs through Rob here uh, and SPACs. And so it's been cool over the last couple of years or a couple of days rather to hear the almost full range of types uh, and perspectives of investing in the space community, including investment banks uh, like Barclays, the uh, public markets from Bank of America. And now we have a chance to um, see the front end of that uh, as uh, small companies uh, with some exciting ideas compete for a prize in the new space business plan competition. Uh, So this. Everyone, this is uh, this will be today officially the 21st New Space Business Plan competition that my team has hosted over the years. We started this all the way back in 2009. We became officially our own uh, 501c3 nonprofit in 2015 when we when we branched out from the Space Frontier Foundation, and uh, we have done a lot of great things. There are other companies, some of which you may have heard of, companies like Spire who uh, went to our program many years ago and are now we're doing insanely well. So uh, we're really happy at the progress we've been able to do and the great, great new early stage companies that we're able to profile in this competition. Uh, we only have a short time today, we only have a couple hours to do this. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. We were gonna have seven teams uh, today. We were down to six. One of the teams had to drop out at the last, kind of like the last minute for well, essentially business reasons. So when you're an early stage company and you've got the call to, you know, do some real work, uh, you, you take that. Um, so I get it. That happens all the time uh, in this in this industry and even in this competition. Uh, we still have six really good teams today. Um, what's going to happen is uh, it's just the time will, re- will be a little bit different. Uh, originally with seven teams, we had 
uh, nine minutes for the finalists to present, followed by about six minutes of judges Q&A. Uh, uh, it's still nine minutes for the finalist teams, but the judges Q&A will increase to seven or eight minutes is all. Uh, and so we'll, we'll fill out the time slot really well, and you're gonna get some really great insights into one of, I think, really great companies. Um, so first, before we start, I just wanna very briefly introduce our, uh, our judges for today. We always try to get judges who are from the financial services industry or who've been in the business or who've done a little bit of both. And uh, we've got a very interesting mix today. Um, let me go through that very quickly. The uh, first first judge you actually heard from uh, today is Eva Jane Lark is with us today. She is a, uh, she's a senior wealth advisor with BMO Nisbet Burr. What we used to do, we used to present the uh, finalists in alphabetical order by the name of the company. Uh, given the far more international flavor of this event now, especially since we've gone virtual, I, I thought it was better to uh, do it by time zone. So the farthest time zone you are from a uh, US Eastern, eh, they get to start first. And then we kind of back it up until we get to the Americas. Uh, and so today we will be starting with uh, the United Arab Emirates and with a company called uh, Virtual Satellites. And uh, Wael Khatib, welcome. Thanks for being here. Did you, uh, did, yeah, you've unmuted yourself. Very good. 
Okay. Okay. Here's what's going to happen. I will be timing you for the nine minutes and immediately after that, your presentation, and then the judges can have at it for uh, asking you questions for the next eight minutes or so. And then we will move on to the next team and on and on through all six teams. Um, so welcome. You get to be up first. If you would share your screen, Wyatt, well, and, uh, yeah. So shall I share my screen? Yeah, please share your screen. And there you are. Hope everybody can see this. He's got your pitch and you've got your pitch deck going and there we go. Lovely image. Um, whenever you start talking, yeah, the timer starts. Okay. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Wael, the co-founder, uh, the founder of Virtual Satellite with me also uh, together, my team, the co-founders for the Virtual Satellites. We are from UAE. Uh, so our vision for Virtual Satellites, Virtual Satellite is dedicated to connect internet to the remote and rural areas in the world, to the 3 billion people who are yet to be connected to internet by virtual satellites, which is uh, alternative to the uh, satellite internet. So in virtual satellites, we are developing a new technology, alternative to the conventional satellite communication. We call it virtual satellites because it creates a long range communication channel from transmitting from transmitter to receiver without physical object without physical satellite, orbital satellite in between. So it's a direct connection between transmitter and receiver in curved communication channel. That's why we call it virtual satellites. So the engineering concept behind virtual satellites is we are creating an artificial ionosphere layer in the low orbit. This, this concept of utilizing the ionosphere for, reflect, for reflection, the radio frequencies. It was used 100 years ago for uh, radios, for TVs, for AM and FM. But uh, in virtual satellites, we are repurposing this concept with a new technology by creating an artificial ionosphere in the space. It has high degree of ionization for molecule because the ionosphere, it's something in the nature, it's out of our control. But, but what we are doing is creating artificial layer, which is we can control it. it. It has high degree of ionization for air molecule. It has the ability to reflect higher frequency than normal radio frequency, the long waves. So in virtual satellites, we are making this concept design so we can be able to reflect SHF frequencies, which can be suitable to uh, transfer uh, data such as uh, suitable for internet for GSM. So how we can do that? Uh, there is uh, uh, something in the photonics, uh, in, the, in the physics, it's developed from 2007, something called airy beam or arbitrary airy beam. This concept is developed from 2007 uh, this, uh, in this concept, you can play with the photons by a special algorithm based on changing the phase of the, the photons in specific sequence. So you can design arbitrary, uh, it's called arbitrary, not because it's random, it's called arbitrary because you can control it. So you can control the range of photonics. So we make this design, so uh, this wave, it will have effect only after 100 kilometer altitude far away from the uh, spatialite modulator station. So why this is so important? It is so important for space because the issue of space junk is dramatically increasing. It causes the risk of collagen. It causes light pollution problems. That's why we are providing preventive solution for the space junk. So there are many organizations all over the world. They are working hardly to monitor and control the space junk, uh, such as Astroscale, uh, Clear Space, and, any other, and many other organizations. So as you can see here in this photo, the process of clearing 
the debris from space. It's very uh, complicated process and very expensive. We are providing preventive solution, another alternative for satellite communication, so we can reduce our dependency on the orbital satellites. Of course, our competitors in this one is a very famous uh, Starlink Reliance Yahsat. Yeah, so here I would like to give you a brief, like a comparison between the conventional satellite and the virtual satellite technology. Virtual satellite technology is more sustainable because it will not create more space junk. In terms of latency, we can work on lower orbit. We don't need to go to high orbit. We can go on very low orbit. Latency is much better. Circular economy. We can utilize the same existing infrastructure for the satellite stations with some uh, upgrade, it can be suitable for virtual uh, technology. Coverage, it's same like conventional satellite. In terms of cost, the uh, capital cost for virtual satellites is much, much less than the conventional satellite. Now the progress so far in this project, we did a progress in phase one and two, which is the R&D and the concept design. Uh, still, we need funding to go forward for the next phases, which are uh, the testing for this technology and to uh, produce the prototype. This is our business model. Uh, we are, the business model for, for our company is to sell this technology to the internet providers in the countries. So uh, we are looking for uh, 0.5 uh, funding for the first year to complete the R&D, and we are looking for 1.5 for the next year in order to produce the prototype for uh, our business. So this is the, our team uh, who are working on, on this uh, promising project. So uh, our director, Dr. Hudal Khazani, she is very famous in the Middle East. She's, uh, she uh, supported many startups uh, and she's supporting us also giving us di direction in this project. Myself, I am the founder. I am uh, electrical en uh, engineer basically, and I have passion with quantum mechanics. Also with us here also in the meeting today, Tao, he's, he's expert in satellite communications and he did many experience before for the reflection of ionosphere and also reflection from the moon. Uh, he's very expert in this field. Tatiana, she's very expert in photonics and the quantum mechanics, which I told you about the arbitrary A-beams. Also, uh, we have two physicists, Ragat and Wyatt, they are working on the details for this project. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, please. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, it's now time for the judges to take charge of this for a few minutes. Uh, Eva, Wald, do you have questions, comments? Hi, this is Wald. I have a question. Um, what altitude is this? Uh, are you creating the ionosphere? What's the range of altitude where you're creating this artificial um, uh, reflection point? Yeah, around 100 kilometers. Sorry? Around 100 kilometers. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so I, I guess uh, uh, the, I'm trying to envision what you're actually building. So the existing um, sending and receiving are existing stations. So you're effectively building this generator in the middle to create this beam that the signal will go through. Is that is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. Now, uh, imagine that we have two satellites, transmitter and receiver. They are communicating through a satellite in the orbit. Instead of this physical satellite, we have another uh, like station in the middle. It will create another beam. It's not the same frequency, another beam. It will do high degree of ionization for the air molecule in a specific point in the space. This, this high degree of ionization for the molecule, it will be like a reflector for the satellite frequency, for the satellite wave from transmitter to receiver. 
but that is that going to be on the ground beaming up or is that going to actually be in the ionosphere yeah it's on the ground it will okay. be on the ground yeah and and so so the, your market or the placement of this particular device almost depends on where the transmitter and receiver is right yeah Okay, and, and do you know what the um, accessibility of those locations would be like? Because that may be it cause a major problem in terms of your business plan if you can't actually put your, trans, your, your radiating station to create this in the middle. Actually, have yeah, you looked well, into that at all? Yeah, yet? this is a very valid point, and this is what you are studying now. We are studying to shift this station to near to the transmission to the transmission station. So two will be in the, in the same place. So we don't need another place to fix this, what we call it the spatial light modulator, which doing this artificial ionosphere. Yani, imagine that we have transmitter receiver. Instead of uh, putting this generator between, we can shift nearest to the transmitter. So you have one station for transmission. And beside one station to create this artificial ionosphere. This is what we are studying now. We are doing some calculation for this. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, you didn't talk so. I so effectively, your market that you're looking at for your company is is any internet provider. Is that right? Yes, or? right. Yeah, right. But we are focusing on the remote areas where uh, it's not yet connected with internet like Africa, there are 3 billion people not yet connected. So we are thinking to provide an expensive solution, an expensive internet for them. Okay. I've, I've got another question just about the frequency in terms of the bandwidth, the amount of megahertz of bandwidth that you can transmit through a single point, number one, the frequency ranges that you will be able to use, number two, and in terms of a link, what would be called a link budget on a satellite, what kind of power levels after you transmit through there are you getting? Um, are you losing a lot of power because you're effectively acting like a bent pipe satellite without the satellite? So um, to, to help, I'm trying to understand a little bit about the actual business case, how much bandwidth you have and what frequency you're using. Yeah. So we are, we are targeting to use the same frequency utilized by normal satellite, uh, satellite frequency, which is between 10 to 50 gigahertz. Why? Because we need to utilize the same existing infrastructure. Uh, like for example, any other uh, satellite internet uh, providers, they are using some frequency. We, need, we are targeting to use the same frequency, which is from 10 to 50 gigahertz. Okay. So if you're going so to let's our say, trick will be only for creating the uh, artificial ionosphere. No, I'm sorry. So if you're using, let's say, the KU band, is that possible to use that? We are using uh, SHF frequency from 10 to 50 gigahertz. Okay, so KU band is in that range. So if you're using that, um, you would potentially interfere with uh, existing geosats already using. KU band, you might have interference pattern. What is your strategy to avoid that interference from existing uh, geo operators? Um, Actually, we are still studying these details. We didn't go through uh, the, the details about the solution for this one, but we are still studying. So um, one, I have one thing that just sort of occurred to me and it may or may not be useful for you, but um, there's a number of companies who are working on uh, quantum key uh, transmissions and so have satellite uh, launch, satellites launched to test their theories and things like that. If, but you know, one of the concerns is that maybe the satellites can be hacked. And so this may be something that might appeal to somebody who's trying to use quantum key technologies um, if it doesn't actually go through a satellite. I don't know if the signal would be more or less hackable that way, but it's maybe something to look into possibly. Yeah, so here we have like communication directly from transmitter to receiver, we don't have 
like something in between to regenerate the signals. Yeah, you are right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Intriguing. I, uh, might like to have a question since it's very interesting to what we're doing um, in my space. Is that is that okay, Tim? I'm not sure if I'm if I'm. Uh, to. I've got. Well, we still have a couple of minutes uh, put aside. Normally, it's just for the judges to do. If the judges don't uh, mind uh, a third party question, if you're okay with it, I'll let it go this time because we have a couple of minutes, so we can you know put something. That'd be fine. I guess they're saying okay. At least they're not screaming at me. Okay. okay. Yeah. Nina Mark can tell you a detail. Um, it, the very very interesting. Have, have you guys have you have you have you used it? Have you have you tried it out, or would we would you need funding to build it? Yeah, we need funding to, to build it. We we did like good job for the uh, R and D and for programming. We we make some programming and R and D. Uh, yeah, we need funding to uh, make, to testify this technology. Okay, very interesting. Thank you very much for allowing me the question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Anything else from the judges? No, we're good. Um, okay, uh, Wade, thanks so much. And uh, if you'll give back your screen. Okay, and we're gonna uh, move ahead now. The next company to present is A-Space. Um, Alusha Gun, I see you're there. Um, I am not seeing uh, Gabriel. I know I saw, um, I've been trying to reach out behind the scenes to him as well. I know that uh, during our coaching sessions, uh, Gabriel was going to present, but uh, I'm sure you can, uh, you are prepared as well. Uh, Lucia again, if you could uh, kindly unmute your mic and so we can hear you. Hi, Thomas. Uh, there you are. Everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. You yeah. were sharing your screen uh, a minute ago, and now it seems you're not any longer. There we go. And you've got your... Okay. It's, um, this company's called A-Space, so... Uh, Alusha Gun, if you're when you're ready to start the actual presentation, uh, please do. I'll time you from there. It's uh, again, you still have nine minutes. I'm sorry, Alusha Gun, can you hear me? Sharing my screen, well, uh, I'm trying. I'm talking, but I can't. Uh, I, I think you're not hearing me. I think you have a bit of. Yeah, I'm hearing you now, but you stopped your screen sharing. I don't know why that would make a difference. Um, okay, I see your screen now, and you need to put your presentation in plain in slideshow mode. Okay, can we, can you hear us? Can we, uh, can you speak? I'm not hearing you. This is interesting. Uh, you know, we, uh, all these technologies and this, this is, uh, since we're working on, you know, someone else's platform, this is uh, something I personally have no control over. Um, Does it make sense to try and see if a different presenter uh, has the same problem? Maybe put another presenter next and see if they have the same problem. If they don't, then that will. Yeah, we could probably, we may have to do that. And, and in fact, his partner Gabriel is ex actually is going to be the one that's supposed to be doing the presenting and he's not here at all. And I've been reaching out, you know, um, through the back door. You can, uh, you can put up the presentation yourself and he can do the next page, please part. If we've got his voice, right? 
Yeah, well, let me see. Yeah, I could actually, I could do that. Hold on a second. Let me see what I've got here. I might be able to actually do that in this particular case. Uh, I don't know if it's all of them, but uh, let me, let me, let me check some. Hold on. He should unmute now so we can hear him now before you do that, if possible. Belusugan, if you could unmute there. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So can we can you hear, hear you now. So let's see what happens if Tom puts up your presentation for you. See if that works. Send me. Okay, that's the uh, Okay, here's the thing. I want to. Is it from last night or this morning? Just give me just a second. I got to find the right thing because he sent me two versions and I saved to my desktop the PDF, but I do have an actual PowerPoint that I could use. And I'd rather use that if I could. Uh, No, I'm not seeing you after all. Never mind, we may have to go with what we have. Um, okay. All right, all right, all right. You know, I have some PDF version, so that may end up just a tiny bit clumsy, but uh, let me see what I can do here. see it yes yeah hey good yeah. good good yeah. i guess it's gonna be a little clumsy but uh, we can do this um okay alusha gun can yeah uh, okay uh, can thought, i start now good yeah alusha gun are you with us yeah okay um uh, good evening everyone uh my, my name is uh, I'm the CEO uh, and co-founder of uh, a space company. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, a space company is a business intelligence uh, startup. Uh, what we do is we use AI to solve uh, just partial problems. Uh, with our solution, uh, we're able to help decision makers actually monitor their domain and offer them um, answers to industry uh, led in questions. Next slide, please. Um, the problem that we are solving is uh, across, largely across Africa. Uh, and these problems include and vandalism of oil and gas um, pipeline installations. Uh, we also have um, security problems across the country um, in different parts of the country, especially in sub Saharan Africa. Uh, we also have development needs of government sectors, government sectors, government customers, permit me, um, that carry out contracts um, on, behalf, on behalf of the government in terms of road constructions and all of that. Um, and we need solutions to actually monitor the activities of all these industrial players part time. 
so the solutions that we've actually been able to put together to solve these problems include um, change detection using uh, artificial intelligence, um, key insight analysis, uh, strategic partnership for Tonki solutions, and object detections using AI. Next slide, please. And so these are the two products we've put together. Um, one is an ET uh, et, et observation product, and one is a software as a service um, using ET et observation products. Uh, what we offer include um, a 70, 70 centimeter super resolution, uh, with high, high geospatial data. Uh, we're also able to offer daily updates, um, high resolution imageries, uh, and also um, on much frequency and resolutions. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We're, we're there. Okay, um, our services include uh, at observation products, uh, software as a service. So with these products, what we're able to do is the following, um, a future extraction. So with our solution, we're actually able to view um, from time to time what goes on in that particular domain. Uh, we're also able to see objects. And apart from seeing objects, we're also able to actually monitor the changes in those areas per time. And we're also able to conduct what we call key site analysis and also track activities that are going on in different areas per time. So um, this, is, this, is, this is just uh, a, a feature of how of this, this imagery actually, what we, what, we, what we refer to as a change detection. Uh, from the first image, we can actually see what happened. Um, on the second image, we can see the changes that have occurred. So with, um, with the solution we have, we're able to actually see um, changes per time in certain areas. So this is uh, what we call object detection, uh, uh, object detection and, and monitoring. So from the images we're seeing, uh, we're seeing changes in objects here and there, uh, monitor things like jet fighters, like helicopters and all that. So for example, uh, where you have problems that are going on across, um, Africa, particularly in Nigeria and the Northeast, where you have um, different helicopters and jets and all of that flying across different areas. So you can be able to monitor them as spins go on in that area. So with our defense, uh, with our defense intelligence uh, uh, solution, um, like I mentioned, this actually helps to support uh, uh, government activities in terms of security related decisions. So with the solution, uh, from time to time, you see the activities that the military uh, activities are carrying out there. And we are also able to monitor the activities of bandits and all of that. So this helps the government to actually know what is going on in that area per time. So this um, solution has, um, like I mentioned, object detection, uh, critical infrastructure monitoring, and also damages and all of that. So this, at the end of the day, will support the government in making accurate uh, uh, policy decisions. So also border asset um, surveillance. So we have a movement of people um, across the border per time. Uh, with our solution, we can be able to gather data of the movement of people across the border per time and help the government to actually make uh, better solutions. So our business model is, is this. Uh, for image data, we charge about um, $19 uh, per square meter and for um, and for software as a service, uh, we touch we touch one dollar uh, per square meter. So our target market, uh, when we talk of the, um, the 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 estimated target market, we're looking at about three hundred and forty uh, billion, and um, these sectors include oil and gas, uh, agriculture, energy, government agencies, maritime companies, and natural resource. So our team is made up of uh, experts from different areas. We have those in uh, defense, we have those in, uh, in water, we have those in oil and gas, and uh, I myself am uh, into business development and my partner into technology. So um, the reason why we started this, um, this, this company is that we've seen um, activities of banditry constantly increasing, not only in Nigeria, but also across um, uh, also across Africa, 
Um, and we've seen that um, the government has not been able to actually find adequate solutions, proper solutions to solve this based on the fact that they don't have adequate data and there are no monitoring satellites. So we come in and said we can be able to help with object detection and all of that with the solution we have. So well, we are looking to raise about um, $500,000 um, and we're going to use that for engineering and product development, um, for networking to grow our brand and also possibly introduction to affiliates and, and prospects on networks. So thank you very much. I look forward to your feedback and questions. Hello. Hello, I'm Walt Anderson. How are you doing? Um, I have one quick question that wasn't clear. Are you planning to utilize the product, the raw product from other Earth observation? I know of 46 Earth observation companies that I know of. Um, so are you planning to use some product from one of those companies and analyze it to get your data? Or do you want to put a resource in space to provide that direct, uh, get, you know, product in effect? And um, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we're working with uh, we're working with satellite companies, uh, particularly one currently in Argentina. Um, they will be the ones to actually provide the satellite service for us, okay. so that we can be able to get the data in near real time. Then uh, we'll use our proprietary algorithm to be able to process that data and provide the relevant information for our clients. Okay, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I don't know. I'm sure there's a lot of people that have the raw data, and maybe with 46 companies already operating in that space, you can um, be more efficient by simply processing the data effectively. That's good. I think that's a good approach. Yeah. All right, I'm late. A little time zone issue here. Let's go. Um, I, I had the same question, but you've answered that one. Um, and uh, so effectively, you still have an intermediary involved. So how, uh, why would they not just do it themselves? Why would they sell to you as opposed to your customers? And have you had customer discussions is the other thing, especially with the oil and gas companies yet? Our pipeline. Company. I didn't get that. I didn't get that question, Eva. Please come again. Okay, so um, two things. Uh, uh, first, let's talk about the oil. So, a potential customer are the oil and gas pipelines, which the people are. I mean, I've heard that Africa has this problem that people sort of uh, steal from the pipelines themselves and put holes in them. So, have you had actual discussions with the pipeline companies? And is this a problem for water as well as for um, for oil, or is it just an oil and gas problem? Okay, um, the, it, it's it's an oil and gas problem. Um, you have a whole lot of refineries um, across across the country, particularly in Nigeria, um, and you have what we call oil bunkery, uh, illegal illegal refining of oil, and you have a whole lot of bandits that are destroying um, this these refineries. Um, that's why we are having a, a, a gap in terms of production of, uh, of oil. So uh, with this solution, you can be able to monitor the activities of those bandits per time, the, the, the things you're carrying on and all of that. And uh, that actually helps the government to make a decision. So who would pay you? Would the government pay you or would the uh, oil and gas company pay you for the intelligence? It's 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 the oil and gas company that will pay us for the intelligence uh, rather than uh, rather than the government yeah because it's their um it's their private uh, it's their private um, infrastructure uh -huh. mm. and and then in terms of the you when you're using other satellite companies data um, you can't necessarily get it as instantaneously maybe as uh, it's as you were alluding to I don't think but um What's to keep them from just taking over your business? Okay, um, there are uh, there are other satellite providers which the which private companies as well as the government can can work with. But with what we have uh, with the service provider we're working with, um, they, they they're able to provide high resolution of satellite imagery in near real time. And aside from that, um, we've looked at the costs um, in terms of other provisions from other companies that will be, and we know that ours is much 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 more affordable and are, are much more effective. Okay, thanks.
Okay. Any other questions from uh, the judges? No, well, it's completely offline here. Uh, okay, I guess either you're you're good. Then I guess we'll. Uh... Um, but uh, but I mean I hope you can do something to solve the uh, the issue of the really terrorists more than bandits. But uh, in uh, Nigeria, that would be awesome if you could actually make an indent there. Yeah, we, we we're talking with um, we're talking with private companies like um, the Amnesty International um, to be able to because they are they are they are more like um, it's easier to penetrate through that sector than going through the government. Um, mm -hmm. Going through them, we can be able to help gather data and that gather data for them, so that they can be able to provide uh, you know interesting money, interesting uh, information for the government to work with. So that's an easier route rather than going through um, the government itself. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. There's there's also a potential market for ocean piracy. So if you can find out uh, techniques to do that, you may have a valuable product to offer to um, crew, you know cargo shipping. Rachel Walter, uh, Rachel Walter, you're right. Yeah, we we'll look at that. Okay, I guess we then we are moving on. Oloshigan, thanks so much for your presentation. And uh, we're gonna be moving on. Uh, next up is a company from Argentina called Innova Space. And I've seen it here, Elika Abayo. What is this? Hi, good afternoon. Okay, I will share my screen. Yep. Okay, so. We know the drill whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, so good afternoon. My name is Eldi Cabello. I'm CTO of Innova Space, and I will be presenting you our project to get things connected no matter where. Did you know that 80% of the world has no communication? And this is not going to change in the short term. According to the ITU, between 2017 and 2019, mobile phone coverage increased only 1.3%. Additionally, according to FIO, food production must be increased by 70% by 2050. And it is estimated that arable land will rise only 5%, while 90% of food production should be as a result of higher performance. The huge waste in crops and low productivity are the result of poor modernization and lack of communication. This is a fact around the world. Currently, our agriculture is not giving a solution to all of these problems or is doing it inefficiently. Besides, the lack of supervision and monitoring in remote facilities in the oil industry encounters several problems related to expensive maintenance of equipment, high risk of incidents of human injury and death, on track waste, and hazardous spills and high environmental impact. As in agriculture, waste and low productivity are due to lack of modernization. That is why it is necessary to find a solution that involves process technification at a low cost and high impact. Innova Space will democratize the access to Internet of Things communication around the world, contributing to a better future for society. We will launch into space the fear low cost PICLO satellite constellation in Latin America, giving global communication access where there is no connection. Our solution will steer towards the following United Nations goals. First one, zero hunger, by improving food production to supply the future population. Second one, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, by enabling modernization with the application of smart technology. And finally, responsible consumption and production by providing efficient service for better decision-making in resources consumption. So how are we going to do that? Our constellation will have around 100 satellites orbiting at 500 kilometers height that will connect with our communication models on ground. This model is connected with our partner sensors that will provide key information such as humidity, temperature, device status, and so on. The information will pass through the satellite to the ground station network. Finally, the ground station will send precise data to the cloud where the end users will have access to the stored data from everywhere. On this table, you can see several companies that offer similar services. There are two main differences between us and current competitors, which are the big reduction in terms of cost and the integration with current IoT terrestrial network through our partners. 
Currently, the IoT market in Latin America is owned by Iridium, which offers traditional geostationary satellite communication, which are three times more expensive than our solution. So how do we get to lower our prices? It is thanks to our technology. We use PICO satellites that weigh less than 550 grams, thus the launching cost is very low. We use high quality commercial of the shelf components, which make investment required for satellite development and manufacture also very low. Our technology is scalable. It is a homogeneous product that facilitates integration and reduce production time. And last but not least, we have an in-house R&D team in charge of develop the satellite platform and communication system. Here you can see a comparison with traditional bigger satellite technology. Other than the benefits previously mentioned, because we will use a low earth orbit constellation, we can use a smaller and cheaper ground station and a smaller and cheaper user terminals. And we will have less vulnerability of blocking line of sight and we have more reliability. Our product consists of a communication model plus a customized monthly data fee. We will sell this to all commercial partners that will offer compatible IoT solution to the end users. There are also other cases in which the commercial partner is the same end user itself, like the Argentine national oil company YPF. Currently, IoT has become a crucial element for every organization, and there are great market predictions for satellite IoT. Today, it is estimated that around 2.7 million devices are serviced by satellites. This number is projected to increase to around 24 million IoT connections globally by 2024. The revenue for the satellite IoT market is expected to grow from 520 million today to $400 billion in 2030. Our initial market would be Argentina, where producers has more than 5 million acres and, sorry, 50 million acres and 50 million livestock. But we will scale up to the rest of Latin America countries shortly, which has a potential of growth of three times the devices in the next five years. If you're wondering how this project began, well, it all starts with an idea in a technical school at Mar del Plata in 2019. A PICO satellite called Saduino was developed by Alejandro Cordero, teacher of the school and now CEO of InnoSpace, and his students, which are now part of InnoSpace technicians. They realized that this tiny satellite could be used to respond to the lack of cellular network coverage and began to outline the project. Today, only a couple of years later, we are a multidisciplinary team of 13 people passionate by space technology. The management team includes professionals with a lot of experience in the field, such as our CEO, Alejandro Cordero, who has 24 years of experience as an entrepreneur in the technology and automatization industry. Ignacio Pintos and myself, that has a master's degree in space technology, and we have both previous work in our respective space agency. Other members include mechanical engineers, electronic technicians, communication engineers, and software developers. Additionally, we have several advisors from Argentina, Mexico, Venezuela, Brazil, and other countries with vast experience in aerospace field who validate our path step by step since the beginning. We have also agreement with different partners in various activities that are out of Innova's space scope, such as launching service agreement for free suborbital test flight and low cost ride for our satellite, win-win alliance with emerging satellite component manufacturing companies, integration and testing advice and facilities at particular practically no cost in Argentina, and ground station usage around the world in strategic places. Since the idea was born in the classroom, Innova Space has made huge progress. We have validated the business model by participating and winning several entrepreneurial contests. Until now, Innova Space has been economically accelerated by a private company in Argentina with 250,000 USD and, achieved la and also received uh, 550,000 from the Argentine government in the form of not refundable credit. This led us to achieve uh, last month our first huge milestone. Uh, which was the launching of our first satellite on board of the Falcon 9. We are planning to do our financial, our first financial round uh, in Tel Aviv and Dubai in the following months. Our next milestone is the launching of six more satellites this year to keep testing our technology. We plan to launch even more satellites the next year 
and begin the commercial services at the end of 2023. During 2024 and 2025, we expect to deploy most of our final constellation of 100 satellites. In no space is seeking for 4 million US dollar, which will be distributed as you see in this graphic. 1.5 million will be used for the development and launching of the second generation of the satellite platform, plus the construction of a better ground station. Additional 1 million will be destined to the third generation of satellites. And at the final 1.5 million will be used to begin the deployment of the constellation. So thank you for listening and I will be glad to answer any question right now. Hello, Ms. Wald. Um, Ms. Well, are you using existing low RAN technology on the ground? Yes, the idea is for us to, to use the already existing technology through our partners. We have been talking with several IoT companies and oil and gas companies that already have like ground solution, but they have these black areas where they, they need communication. So, uh, so we will uh, do it uh, compatible to their technologies. Okay, thank you. This is Dennis. Um, you have a strong technical team, but I didn't see anyone in marketing and sales and yeah. no one in finance, no CFO. Uh, uh, yes, like uh, currently this uh, company that is accelerating us, is giving us uh, all these uh, facilities and, and personnel that is supporting us with the financial and marketing uh, part of the company. It's probably important to put that in a pitch, so because it's definitely something that jumped out at me as well. It's great to have a good technical team, but you really need the business side of it or it's not going to succeed. Yeah, sure. Thanks. When, when would you bring on your own dedicated personnel for marketing and finance? Uh, when we raise our, our own funding, that it should be this year. So who, who is your market? I mean, you didn't obviously talk enough about uh, markets and really for businesses to succeed, it's important to uh, address those in more detail. You've talked about oil and gas and you talked about agriculture in terms of are there both or and who, how would you sell into the agriculture market? Because that's actually a very, very difficult market to sell into. Yes, as I mentioned, we are selling this uh this market through our partners. I mean, we are not expecting to contact directly the, the, the farmers or the, the Actes uh, company. We are already talking with uh, some IoT companies that already have uh, clients and sensors, but currently they are like, uh, they have a very high prices for, for satellite communication. So they were partnered with us to lower their cost and get more clients. So we are not dealing with the end user. We are dealing with these partners that they already have the contacts and the clients and all the strategy uh, in the agriculture part. Uh, by the oil and gas, that is uh, also uh, another that target market. We have direct communication with the companies in Argentina. We have already in a, some talks with the YPF, that is the state uh, Argentinian company. And they are, they are very interesting in using our system to uh, put sensors on their site. So there we, we don't need to, to develop any sensor. We are not going into the censoring part. We will just sell the communication. <clears throat> yeah, it would help to show that in your pitch in the future, show your sales channels and any evidence of interest. That would, that would strengthen your pitch a lot, I think. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, so I, I guess I, the last question that I had when I was reading over your material and looking at the pitch beforehand, was um, yeah, what, is, what is the lifespan of these satellites and how often are you going to have to be launching? Because Pico satellites don't usually have a very long lifespan, is my understanding. Yeah, the lifespan is uh, around three to five years if uh, we're planning to use uh, propulsion at the, at the final uh, platform. Uh, this uh, 
it could be seen like a kind of disadvantage, but it's also, I think it's an advantage because you can like refresh your technology uh, very quickly. So you can improve your, your platform. And since the launching cost is very, very cheap, uh, so this won't be like a, a huge uh, cost thing for us to, to launch a satellite every three or five years. And you have one in orbit right at, right at the moment, and are you communicating with that? Yes, we are. We have the first one, and we are performing tests and receiving some signals. But it, it was uh, mainly to to test the satellite platform, and the next one we will improve the the payload. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. You are mute, Thomas. do that i do that to myself um i guess if there's nothing else i'll uh go ahead and we'll see the floor uh finally yeah there we go okay thank you so much thank you so much alika and uh great job and we're gonna move along and we're we've now we've crossed from uh we've crossed from the emirates to Niger to uh Nigeria to Argentina, and now we're going to land on the eastern coast of, of the Americas. Um, and I want to hear right now from Justin Park at Intergalactic Education. Hey, Tom, how's it going? Uh, hey, good. Good. I'm not seeing myself yet. Here I am. There you are. Okay. Great. Well, let me share my screen anyhow. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll just uh, fire away here. Um, if you're ready, absolutely. Yeah. Full screen here. Sorry. Didn't put me in the right. Uh, There we go. What uh, regular presentation mode here? You just call F five. Not doing it for me today. Um, right there. You I already have sandwich on. Okay. On, uh, sandwich. Hold on, let me All right. You, right. you guys can see the full screen, okay. or do you guys see the notes? Yeah. 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 It's slow. It's slow. No, I had, I had no. I had, yeah, I had a peanut butter. Jelly. I told you I was getting a PBJ. I already made it, and I have it, sweetie. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. No, I don't want more food. I have lots of food here that I've got to eat, or it'll go bad while I leave. Do you remember? Well, we're all hearing you. All right, I can't. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, my name is Justin Park, and I am the co-founder and president of Intergalactic Education. Intergalactic Education has been around for about six years now. We've got uh, over a dozen apps in the App Store and on our Intergalactic storefront on our webpage. Uh, we've been uh, working with a number of educational institutions in the greater DC area, but today I'm going to be focusing on our newest product called Space World. Uh, the problem we identified is that uh, the general public does not know very much about what's going on in the space industry. Uh, it's an important uh, area where we get to global positioning, we get to communications, we get the weather, all of these things come from space. Not a lot of people appreciate it enough, I don't think, uh, nor do they understand uh, the importance of space situational awareness and some of the uh, problems with space debris. Uh, there's been some ASAT tests recently that have really kind of um, made a mess of the lower Earth orbit. And so, um, yeah, we've designed a product um, that helps explain that to uh, people out there. Uh, at the same time, the space community, uh, space companies are hiring, or they, at least they need to hire uh, the latest and greatest talent. They're in competition with companies like Facebook and Google. 
Um, and so one of the goals of our software is to inspire uh, the next generation into wanting to work at companies like Lockheed Martin or Boeing or SpaceX or Blue Origin. Uh, and at the same time, everyone kind of has this insatiable desire to be entertained. Uh, you have uh, organizations like Netflix and, and Disney Plus and um, all the gaming companies out there that are, are really doing quite well, especially during COVID. Um, there wasn't a whole lot to do. Uh, so people turn to entertainment to, to advance their lives, I guess. Um, so we came up with the solution um, that uh, leverages gamification to teach um, space technology in a really interesting way. Uh, we've got a storyline, we've got all these great characters and missions that the players can do. Uh, we've optimized it now for mobile so that we're able to reach, you know, literally billions of users. Uh, we leverage data analytics very heavily so that we can see how players are uh, progressing through the software. Uh, at the same time, we can use it to maximize their um, retention. Uh, you want to try and get as many daily repeat users as you possibly can. Um, Space World itself is, um, we don't want to, I don't want to give away all the secret sauce, but uh, yeah, a lot of the game evolves around the real space industry, you know, building private space stations and cleaning up space debris and launching uh, mega constellations are all a major, major part of Space World. Uh, at the same time, um, players uh, have the ability to go into cis lunar space and start um, going to the lunar surface and collecting regolith and building things on the, the lunar surface. It's really kind of a uh, space exploration resource management game where you have reputation points and you have money and research and development points. And so you can do things like ASAT tests, but you know, they're not, that, that mission is not very good for your, your reputation, right? It's really bad. And so, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of uh, things you can do in the game. Uh, you can go out to the gas giants um, we focus most of the missions in the game on our solar system, but, um, yeah, after players, um, uh, colonize the solar system, we are, uh, we've built kind of a framework now where they can start going out into the deeper space, um, you know, Alpha Centauri type missions, um, after you have enough research and development points, um, yeah, and at the same time, uh, this allows us to offer advertising opportunities uh, for real space companies. Uh, I really envision once we, we get a large enough user base, um, company, satellite companies wanting to advertise in our software. Um, it's uh, brand awareness is really, really important, uh, I think. And uh, we can help uh, the space industry with that. So um, I've been. Um, through a number of incubator accelerator programs. Uh, I went through the I-Corps program at GW. Uh, I've got a number of great mentors, uh, George Mason University, uh, George Washington University. Uh, I know most of the faculty at American University. And so I'm able to hire and recruit uh, a lot of um, really talented young students who don't really know their worth. It's one of the ways I've been able to keep the cost of development um, low. Uh, a lot of video game budgets are in the multiple millions of dollars and we've been able to make a lot of great products for just a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, myself, I, I'm an alumni of the International Space University. I spent a year in Strasbourg. I was part of the Space Generation Advisory Council as an executive editor for about five years. Uh, I've consulted at NASA a couple times, and so really my background is, uh, is in space, and so that's kind of one of the things that differentiates us from a lot of the competition out there is that uh, I just know um, a lot about the space industry at this point. Uh, our marketing strategy, and uh, one of the things that we're doing with uh, the money that we are hoping to raise is to um, advertise through AdWords on Google and Facebook, and at the same time, um, we've identified a number of social media influencers. Uh, Twitch is a really big one. Um, it's a game streaming service uh, that's uh, really popular right now. Um, uh, a good way of getting traction in the game community is also to um, get uh, reviews from game review sites. 
Um, we've also identified some podcasts that we would like to be on and, and some influencer platforms. Are really, yeah, we have a solid marketing strategy. We just need the funding to implement it. Um, there is a lot of competition out there, um, uh, but at the same time, uh, the, it's just a huge market, right? Uh, Activision Blizzard just got uh, acquired by Microsoft for almost $70 billion. And so it's really, uh, the game industry is a really, really hot market right now. And it's one of the reasons why we pivoted kind of away from our old, older education model and towards this new uh, gaming model that focuses on in-app purchasing. And so we're expecting to uh, hopefully find revenue from some of the aerospace companies out there. Uh, we've gotten some revenue in, from that channel, but not nearly as much as I'd hoped. I think part of the problem is we have this chicken and egg problem where we need lots and lots of users. Um, and we have had 50,000 downloads over the years, uh, which I think is pretty substantial and non, non negligible, but uh, we want more, right? We wanna be in the millions. And so, um, yeah, we use a freemium model where you can try out the software for free. There's lots of in-app purchasing where you can get speed stones or buy research and development points. Um, people probably aren't too familiar unless you're a gamer, they're called battle passes where every month you can get like a new skin where we'll offer new rockets uh, that people can purchase. Um, and then I also threw up um, our, our rocket report, uh, kind of our old business model where we would go into the schools and, you know, we've got a couple suitcases full of iPads where we can hand out the iPads to the kids and they hand it back at the end of the uh, hour and then we go to the next school on the next day. Um, we, we managed to generate uh, a fair amount of revenue from that, um, 135K, um, not a huge amount, nothing to write home about, but it's, um, it's revenue, which is a a lot of startup companies don't have, and so um, it's it's the the education model wasn't scalable, and it's one another one of the reasons why we're pivoting more to being a app game company. But uh, yeah, those are numbers uh, relatively conservative, actually. Um, yeah, the early stage funding um, came out of my pocket. Actually, I was an early investor in uh, Bitcoin, and so I've been funding. Um, all operations up until this point, this doesn't, um, yeah, I consider all of the sweat equity I guess I put in over the last six years. Um, but yeah, we're hoping to get uh, eight to 12 X return. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'm coming up on my nine minutes. So I will open up the floor to questions. Thank you. Right on time. Thanks, Justin. Um, okay, Evie Dream Walt, Dennis, we have. I'm not completely clear who you're selling this to and how they're going to, what methodology of payment. Is it a subscription service or one time? Uh, no, it's in app purchasing. Um, so the average gamer uh, that we're appealing to is 11 years of age and up. Uh, if you were smart enough, I guess you could play the game at a younger age, but it's really a resource management uh, software. Uh, a lot of our educational apps are uh, algebra based. And so, yeah, middle school, we've got a solar system simulator. Um, actually, younger kids can use a solar system simulator. But uh, yeah, a lot of our apps are geared towards um, middle school, high school, college. Um, that's uh, where a lot of the gamers are. But, you know, people play games all, all into their late um Late age, right? My, my dad still plays solitaire every day on the computer. And so, uh, yeah, we, we have um, an in-app purchase model where basically anybody can download it and try it for free. And uh, this model has worked really well for a lot of companies. Um, yeah, it's just uh, kind of a, a model that seems to work for everybody. How many users do you have today? Uh, we've had over 50,000 downloads. Um, uh, I'd say daily active users are still probably in the hundreds now. Uh, we haven't rolled out any updates. We've really been working on um, Space World now for the last six months, and we're really ready to push it out the door. Um, we just need a proper advertising marketing budget to be able to uh, grow as large as we'd like to grow. So 
if I'm understanding this correctly, this is a new product in an existing company with other products, right? Yep. Okay. So this space world, you can go to the app store and buy or and download it yet. It's not available yet. We, okay, um, that's fine. You know, that's still... fine. Which, which means that all the what you have in the past doesn't affect what the market looks like for this because it it's actually new, right? Um, yeah, it's so, a new product. I guess we kind of we've proven that we know how to make apps, right? We've got a we've done this before, right? We've got a dozen apps now. We understand how net purchasing works, and we understand how the analytics works. And there's a lot of things we didn't understand, you know, four years ago when we were first starting to release things. And so, yeah, we've kind of, uh, we've come a long way and I'm, I'm really excited to be uh, finally releasing Space World. We got kind of tied up doing a lot of the educational stuff uh, for a couple of years. We were focused on Common Core and Next Generation Science Standards. And it's not really something I'm uh, that passionate about. My passion is really about space. And so we finally have this product that I've been uh, looking forward to having for, for years and years. Yeah, um, one little minor thing I have to say, I love your fonts. I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, that, that font that you have is really intriguing. I don't know if it's an existing one or if your team created it, but it's very neat. Yeah, very we created it. we've got some really talented graphic designers on staff. I've gotten pretty lucky over the years. And so, yeah, we've got animators, uh, all these people who are contractors who are just ready to... Um, iterate and make the next version. But uh, yeah, we want to push this one out and, and uh, market it properly. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really time to just, uh, I want to see a huge amount of revenue, right? We've been kind of going year after year and uh, tech companies, especially app companies are supposed to be able to scale really fast. And so I want to be able to show people that we can do that. And I think we're in a good position. Yeah, I, 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 it, it's, it, unfortunately, I think that all app companies are it's not a homogeneous market there's some apps like say wordle that becomes super popular um almost immediately and then there's lots of others that you know they never quite make it or or you know a year into the when there's nothing new they fall by the wayside so it's a tough market that you're in and um, and both it and the educational but at least i think that there's maybe a little more potential on the game but i'm not sure if i have any other questions though um let's talk about competition for a second are there other apps generally like yours or very similar we're pretty Google unique. Space program, this sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah, Kerbal. Uh, how do you, uh, what differentiates, uh, first of all, how successful are they, which kind of validates your addressable market? And then secondly, how do you compete with them? Uh, yeah, so some of these companies are wildly successful. Kerbal's been around for many years. Uh, they're a multi million dollar uh, brand now because they've done so well. They. Uh, teach orbital mechanics in an extraordinarily um, intuitive way. Uh, we differentiate ourselves because we're more of a resource management type game. We've got a unique storyline. Uh, I'm actually a, a science fiction writer as well. I published uh, my first sci-fi novel um, over 10 years ago, actually. And so uh, we've got a lot of creative ideas about what to do or what we, we have been doing with the storyline. And so... Yeah, I haven't, uh, there's games that are kind of similar, but I think we definitely have enough uniqueness about our product uh, through the artistic um, style that we use. We, we've redone our menus and graphics many, many times over the years. And so we finally found this uh, really good kind of um, sci-fi feel where it's not too childish. You know, before we were marketing to a little bit younger demographic, but now we're really, I think we've refined it enough where it's uh, gonna hit the nail on the head with the high school college kids, um, just because it's a really interesting um, game. It's, and it's, it mimics the, the, the real space industry as much as we can, right? Uh, I think a lot of game developers out there that haven't spent 12 years in the industry and gone to the International Space University. And, and so one of the things that really differentiates us is the realism of the software. 
Okay, I, I have a, just for a point of personal privilege, I have a, uh, a comment I got from the, from the, the general group. And the question was, uh, Justin, are you guys interested in entering the uh, uh, DOD market? Because there is, uh, there's, there may be a huge opportunity in what they call upskilling senior leadership via gamification. Uh, especially uh, yeah, in areas I'm, like the Space Force. Yeah, I'm interested in that. Actually, I talked to a Brigadier General a couple months ago about um, getting the Space Force in our game, and I even put their logo on one of our rockets and sent it to them, but uh, I didn't hear back, so I think they're really busy right now, and they're trying to... But yeah, that's... Um, uh, yeah, something that I'd be interested in just because I think the Space Force is doing a lot of really great things. Okay. You, you said you already tried to talk to someone there? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Troy, I'm trying to blank on this last name right now. Um, but yeah, I, um, you know, I'm in the DC area and so we have space security happy hours and stuff. And so I get okay. the opportunity to run into Space Force people uh, pretty regularly. All right. I was just curious. Um, judges, anything else? Okay, then I guess we're good. Uh, Justin, thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And we're going to move on. Um, okay. Next up, now from the moving from the East Coast to the Midwest, um, we're going to talk to uh, Kel Morris, Inc., and uh, Troy, where are you? I think it was Troy oh, Morris is going to present. There you, you are, yep. sir. Can you hear me? I can. Wonderful. And I, I can see you guys. I've been enjoying the presentations. Let's make sure that my screen will share here. All right, Tom, so are you guys seeing that? So far, so good. Yes, sir. All right. Then do you have your timer ready? I do. Whenever I'm ready, whenever you are. All right. Well, thank you so much. As he said, I'm Troy Morris from Call Morris Inc. or KMI. Uh, we are an orbital debris company focused on keeping space clear for all. So you can look at the 10,000 meter view of space debris and it's discussed many times and it's great, but I like to bring it back to the people involved. The average American is leveraging space 30 times before they finish breakfast. So Amy, for example, here is using it to get to work, check her email, stay connected with her friends. And as we've experienced in the last two hours here, when those services are even minorly disrupted, the whole life feels disconnected. What we as a species are facing is space debris doing this disconnection across the world and for generations, leaving us all feeling that disconnect. So our solution at KMI is to build and operate a fleet of debris removal spacecraft. It's gonna be efficient for multiple captures using prepared proprietary characterization. And from the US Space Force, which we've just been talking about, I can't tell you enough how important it is to rapidly characterize debris. And that's one of the components of technology that KMI is bringing to the table. Off to the left then, you're seeing a CONOPS visualization. Uh, the full video is in the appendix, but just kind of showing how this process would go to a large rocket body, the size of a school bus that these can be, and be able to securely capture an unprepared target. So let's look at that technology a little bit more. Technology is extremely important in aerospace. On the first half is TumbleEye. This is at our TRL of four. So this is going to be that trade secret software that actually one of our co-founders developed himself. So this is using a convolutional neural network so that you can take input video like from a webcam and be able to characterize the tumble of an object that the system isn't pre-warned of what it's seen. On the hardware side, we then have a patent pending hardware, which our other co-founder is leading the development with. This is mechanical tentacles with electrostatic gecko adhesion so that you can grab onto objects that were never intended for. In the bottom right, you can see a still image from our float test on a air bearing table where we were able to grab onto a simulated solar panel. And this is all brought together by our unique team, the inventor of TumbleEye, the developer of Reach, and myself with a decent business experience if I am uh, confident enough to say so. Our scalability for the technology is everything from the length of a box truck down to the small size of a basketball. So it really is something that for the variety of debris objects out there, KMI is prepared to go capture and do something with that debris. Our market size is looking at the entire satellite industry for how it's impacted, but we're looking first at our target market, and that is the rocket bodies. 
An example of one put on the screen here. Those rocket bodies are by mass a major part of this problem as any one of these colliding with another object creates thousands and millions of pieces of debris. Our beachhead is gonna be targeting six of these per year based off of a 2010 Kessler study that was showing that the number of significant objects removed per year would take that exponential growth we're currently experiencing and baseline it, bring it to a level where we are already just able to mitigate, just able to survive and keep these services functioning. How do we do this as a business though? The tragedy of the commons is the cliche we hear so often when talking about orbital debris. The first half is with the Space Force and other entities like that. Uh, down at the bottom, you'll see I pay by the ton if they can remove debris, General David Thompson of Space Force. So this is the debris removal as it's been thought about for years. Emergency removals, risk mitigation for an area that you're operating in and removals of opportunity, something from A to B that you can pick up and take out of the way. And that's great. It, it's got some good understandings, we're seeing contracts by JAXA, by ESA, but there needs to be more. Industry and business needs to do more, and that's where KMI has begun working with our partners for debris repurposing. This can be the general repurposing of turning a whole object into a whole other thing, component reuse, taking a solar panel on an otherwise dead satellite, but they're still functioning. Let's reuse those in orbit, or the really cool material recycling, melting down materials in space, reusing them in space, and avoiding the costly difference of re-entry and launching again into orbit. We were able to work with one of our partners with NanoRack saying, I anticipate long-term continuation of debris exchange and repurposing of targets captured by KMI. So it's something that we are chasing both the private and the public opportunities to make space clear for all. Some of the things you can make are what we were discussed at the OSAM conference with NASA back at the end of last year, where we're looking to repurpose, reuse, recycle, and another general saying there is a use case for industry to go after that as a service-based opportunity. It's a future that's approaching and KMI is happy to be a part of it. The path towards that future is already being laid. We closed our pre-seed round this last year for $250,000. We are looking at a series of contracts, most importantly with the US Space Force, leading us as direction into our $2 million seed round this upcoming summer and continuation of testing and fundraising and development from there on. Now the customer. If there's a difficult part of this problem, the technology definitely is there, but the customer has been a huge nut to crack. We see uh, some of companies that are talking about minimized complexity. They just want it to work. Available technology, we want it to work and we want it to work now. National security, a continuing interest for angles of the government and many of those who operate in that space. But the biggest category you might see there is cost efficiency. What we find though, is it's not just the cost efficiency where everyone's looking at the bottom line from Iridium to Cirrus to Intelsat, but the ability to actually do it. And that's where the characterization and capture comes in for those unprepared, unrecognized objects. So as you take the customer needs, we bring it to the competition view and focusing on that chief point, characterization and capture, KMI stands alone with really no one else in our category. There are other great companies out there looking at other aspects of the problem. Clear space, uh, looking for uh, great missions on ADR focused and doing great work for a specific set of targets. Demonstrated technology with Astroscale having some further announcements today that they're trying to re-ramp their program that's in space right now. Working for things that are launched with their adapting plate. US-based companies that can help deal with that national security concerns, but maybe not as far along. And then multiple captures with numerous ideas across the board, but then lacking some of that demonstration. So we found that we have that customer market fit from talking to the customers, finding the market and being involved in the whole process. The team is more than just myself. As I've mentioned, there's Austin Morris, our director of engineering and Adam Call, our director of technology. Uh, with the pre-seed round, we were able to bring on Will, Bilal and Liza, bring a wealth of experiences uh, since we founded in 2019 and built the team, including NASA, Snap-on, Piasecki, where we did some uh, aerospace, R Army, DOD, R&D. A lot of acronyms right there, but the important thing is where we all came from and why we're doing this. So Adam and Austin were actually freshman year roommates years ago. They were playing Kerbal Space Program. They were using some of these systems that we've talked about and they discovered a passion for science from the first day they moved in together. I've been fortunate enough to know Austin the whole time as we are brothers, but the three of us were able to connect during our university years and discover we had a long standing passion for science. I mean, the first things I ever got is a toy right behind my shoulder. That's how ingrained this is into our lives. And we looked at space of what can we do with it? We went off and did careers, we were doing great things, but we saw debris as a growing problem without the appropriate solution. And so we figured, 
How can we be part of that solution? And we've been able to find supporters, advisors, and team members to join us on that mission. Now, to fund the mission, financials are an important question. On the first end is the government path. This is where we're seeing the US Space Force with their 250K a pop orbital prime phase one. Now that solicitation closed just yesterday at noon Eastern time. So there is a lead time as we find out the number of awards that we got, but the company did have multiple proposals in with partners ranging across the country. There's additional agencies though. Those you think of for NASA, but also NSF and DARPA. Uh, we are also seeing on the commercial path, number of partners, oh, Thomas, oh, thank you. And uh, also for satellite operators, those that are in the communications phase and mega constellations. So it brings through a development cycle we're looking at for aerospace that over the years, that profit will continue to grow as the missions and options in space continue as well. So our ask is for seed investors. We're doing a $2 million raise with a five-year exit and some details of the convertible note there, but we're looking to finish that technology development, expand the team further and do that demonstration in space. So I thank you for your time, your attention. My contact is Troy at callmorris.com. Our website and social media is Call Morris, but I'll like to open up to questions. Thank you very much. Okay, judges, what do you think? A very good presentation. Um, and while you talked about uh, customers, uh, you didn't talk anything about the legal challenges because there are legal challenges with orbital debris removal, which is another between between the, the commons issue and some legal issues. It's one of those things that still makes it a really tricky area in terms of getting a business started, I think. So uh, what what's your thoughts on the legal issues involved? Oh, sorry, wrong slide there. Um, so with the legal issues involved, it's something that that's one of the benefits of being US based. As you look at the UN treaties for operating in space, one of those primary hurdles that many companies are looking at is the international question is just currently outlined right now, just impossible, impassable. So that's one of the benefits of us being US based and working with the United States for rockets we specifically launched. Uh, so that's one of the hurdles, but we're in continuing conversations with both space, space lawyers, which didn't know that was a job when I was growing up, and working with confers and other international uh, organizations so that right. we can be involved in that solution because it's developing. When the treaties were established, it was more of a concern for nuclear armament, not for going up there and doing a mission extension vehicle. So it's a continuing development, but under the current framework we're seeing, uh, any country would be able to go and operate on its own, as we saw with MEV-1 and 2. Yes, I, I think it's one thing if you have somebody who wants um, a piece of equipment that belongs to them removed, but it's a different story if you're just trying to clean up the garbage. No, no, and that's definitely true. That's why our starting basis is with the U.S. rocket bodies that would be in the initial demonstration missions for the U.S. Space Force. And then from there, we'd be building the framework of we can do it. Here's the contracting we want to do so that it moves from just the government dollar to commercialization. And that's where the conversations have been really productive talking to Spaceworks, Space Force, and the Air Force for moving it to a commercial solution. Okay, no, very interesting. Thank you. I'm not real clear on your market. I know your paper mentioned insurance companies and they certainly have a financial interest. Um, you mentioned government agencies and then you talk about a lot of commercial space companies. Uh, uh, who do you think is going to put the most money into orbital debris removal? Mm -hmm. So. That's, that's the way the question has been framed, and I'm not disagreeing with that statement, but that we need to reframe for the answer is paying for debris removal is costly, dirty, it's cleaning up garbage, no one likes it. But it's something that as we've talked to some of our partners, there's a higher interest for being able to manufacture or reuse materials in space. And that's where we see the second half of this slide coming in for that debris repurposing is rather than pushing for a societal good, we should all do this is drawing materials so that you can be building those new structures in space. So that's where we're seeing it for a lot of OSAM operators, the new station providers for commercial LEO destinations. Uh, there's been some interest and discussion there of the cost savings of if you can use raw material in space rather than having to launch it and you're only launching you know, microchips, that's an astounding cost saving. So that's where a lot of the conversation has been is that the customers for long standing outside of the demonstrations with governments 
would be for those new companies building solar farms or any number of structures in space. Yeah, but isn't that a industry in its infancy? I mean, yes. uh, Space Station, we've, we've been sponsoring some tech demos uh, on, on in-space manufacturing, but to make that a core uh, <clears throat> element of your business model, I think is a bit of a stretch, wouldn't you say? Very optimistic. <laughs> I mean, I hope it comes to that, but I think it's very optimistic at this stage. It, it, it is an aerospace, but it's also something that the development timeline is that long out. Um, both none of this technology is, you know, currently ready to sit on the launch pad. Things take time to develop, but the uh, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is today. And so we're laying those steps, building this framework. Um, as I think as I got to um, here is that we've got some of the commercial LEO destinations in 2027 and the microspace foundry by 2028. So yes, some of these technologies are not flight proven yet, but they're on the path towards it. There's ISS testing, there's already ISS developments showing that, you know, on the Astrobees you can do these experiments and those are the building blocks towards that future. Um, so it's something that we're working to get our technology ready for that future rather than trying to adjust once OSAM becomes the big market it's being expected as. What do you do when you actually get, so you've hooked on to this rocket body, what's next? So with that is where we've got the CONOPS. Um, so this is where we'd be looking for, it depends on the mission. If it's something that we are doing a just pure disposal to Point Nemo, we would bring it down and it's largely inefficient to deorbit your entire craft with the rocket body. More preferable would be a holding point graveyard orbit, or if we're far enough in the future that the commercial partners are online, bring it to a recycling plant, a servicing station, whether they're repairing that specific piece or using it for components, that would be the mission framework is being able to keep it in orbit for the uh, Delta V uh, benefits that you get from not having to go all the way down into the gravity well. So step nine, align spacecraft for next target orbit. So all of these are in different orbits, different inclinations, different altitudes. Mm -hmm. Where are you getting your Delta V to, to go chase down a rendezvous with the next piece of debris? Yep. So yeah, uh, it is something that with the releasable part of reach, we are able to go and get multiple targets. Uh, and a lot of that Delta V is based on the efficiency of using electronic propulsion, as well as for uh, with TumbleEye, it's not just the RPOD uh, gapping solution for that final kilometer, but it also does work with us on some of the optimization of routes We've looked at it with the fuel savings that we're able to do in this COTS uh, assembly, kind of what you're seeing pictured here. That's anywhere from four to seven real rocket bodies with actual NORAD signatures. Um, so it's a question of whether we want to go after the optimal points to get the most objects, or the military wants us to go after a specific target for a specific reason. That changes the efficiency of how many objects, um, but that's the electronic propulsion of uh, Hall effect thrusters is where we're looking at for that Delta V. Um, your, the grappling technology, I mean, very interesting between geckos and octopuses and things like that. I like the biological um, inspiration. Uh, does it have any other um, terrestrial applications or even undersea applications? So the terrestrial applications is something we actually have a conversation that was started back in October when I was down at uh, NASA Huntsville um, for silicon wafers for some of that development that you're seeing of these clean room environment terrestrial applications that we're making that don't exactly have a tow hook applied to them. So it's a conversation that's continuing, uh, but it's something that hasn't found additional terrestrial impacts yet. Um, but it's something that we continue those conversations with partners, both private and public, because we're, we're interested. So it's something that we're well, keeping our eyes open. Terrestrial applications um, can get you through the pain of the space delays that always occur. So your timelines for 27, 2027 and 2028, I think you had, I think are optimistic at best. And so if you had some terrestrial markets, it might mean that you could survive until that actually was a reality as opposed to um, an idea at this stage. And, and, and undersea strikes me as also, if there's applications between your your um, your orientation thing, I can't remember what your acronym or name for it was, and, and also the, um, the, the tentacles. So. For, for REACH, are you talking about for TumbleEye? TumbleEye, TumbleEye. Gotcha. 
and can you survive just with the SBIRs for a while? Well, that's why it's a, a partnership there between uh, SBIRs as well as the funding. I think we hit it. Yeah, if you don't here. need, but but let's say because because a lot of this is further out, it would be why it would be worth doing a plan, you know, B, C, whatever. To what if we only got SBIR fundings for five years? What would it mean? Could we survive? Because I think you have some ideas, but I'm not sure if you could raise money for them or not. Yep. And that's something that we're operating the company in kind of a software lean model for exactly that reason. We're based in uh, Marquette, Michigan, which has many of its own benefits for light pollution and viewing for tracking of targets, but it also has a lower cost of living and a high quality of life compared if we were trying to base in Silicon Valley. So we've We've already put that into some of our models for making sure we have the length of our runway to match some of those development concerns for OSAM or some of those commercial partners. If they have delays, we don't want it to kneecap our entire business. So we've focused that on getting the most out of the dollar, using that capital efficiency with the pre-seed funding we've already had and with the partners we've lined up for this summer. Very interesting. Well, I guess if there's no one else, we're going to uh, we're going to carry on. Joy, if you can give up the screen, thank you so much. Great thank job, you. everybody, and uh, and we're going to move on to our, our final finalist today, uh, who has to be uh, Isa Fritz from GeoJump. If she can join us now. You've been very patient waiting. Sorry about that. I've been having some slow Zoom over here today as well. <laughs> it's, it's one uh, of those days. Technology isn't here for us today, guys. I know. It's, uh, well, it's uh, still morning over there in Seattle. Good morning to you. <laughs> Thank you. Good Thanks for being here. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, everybody should see a whole bunch of purple here in a second. All right, does everybody see those slides? Yep, sure do. Okay, awesome. I'm going to go ahead and, and get my own timer going too, Tom. Um, <laughs> all right. I'm one of those people. Um, all right. Well, well then, defenders. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. And thanks everybody for sticking around to the end. Um, my name is Issa Fritz. I am the CTO of GeoJump. And at GeoJump, we strive to deliver space access for all. And space access for everybody going to something that is, you know, a little bit different. So like SpaceX did for LEO, GeoJump is striving to open up access to everybody to geosynchronous orbit to satellites, hosted payloads via rideshare access. So just taking a step back in case anybody uh, is new to the world of geo, a geosynchronous orbit is this beautiful orbit such that if there is an object, uh, it will remain in the same position in the sky with respect to observers on the surface. So this provides constant visibility to assets 24 seven. So as you can imagine, this is ideal for our communications and surveillance customers such as DirecTV, Sirius FM, and anyone that's doing um, comms or uh, surveillance over a particular area. So geosynchronous orbit is the most valuable place in the solar system with Earth access. Um, Fortune Business Insights is anticipating um, the total market uh, to geo orbit approximately $9 billion by 2027. So it's extremely valuable, but it's also extremely hard to get there and very expensive in general. So unlike LEO, there's not a ton of rockets that can drop you off directly. So spacecraft typically need to maneuver to get there. And for scale reference, it can be about 100 times farther away than LEO. So spacecraft are using um, electric propulsion system. That means that the entire time that they get to, to take to get to GEO is going to be about six to eight months. So you can see in the picture on the left is an actual spacecraft by Eutelsat that took seven months to start services. 
So on that way up there, you're getting blasted with radiation belts, and um, which means that the spacecraft become heavier and more resilient, thus more expensive. So traditional rockets too are more expensive to get to GEO than, uh, and less frequent than LEO launches. So all these things together even um, are such a huge problem, um, it's even before you think about the time that it takes to get there. Um, six to eight months to, in orbit rays is six to eight months that assets are not making profit. So we realized that we need better access, better solutions to be able to get to geosynchronous orbit. And thanks to the Artemis program and other well-funded government missions in general, there's going to be a whole bunch of extra capacity going around the moon. So at GeoJump, we are going to basically be using the moon as a roundabout. So you can see in the picture on the left, we instead of just having rockets go direct to LEO, we have them go lunar bound and then use the moon to effectively bring us back to Earth, use some breaking burns along the way. So this is um, less radiation, one pass through the Van Allen belts. And for customers with our rideshare access, it is less expensive than buying your own launch vehicle, kind of like, you know, a bus ride. And this is also faster for our customers to start generating revenue. This is on the order of weeks versus months. So this comes into our goal. At GeoJump, we have a four part offering. Um, the main one is just pure rideshare capacity to geo via our lunar flyby method. Um, in addition, we help facilitate financing options for high value customers with revenue share because some of these might be hosted on our system. Uh, in general, we also help Mission Architect to have multiple payloads and multiple companies going up together and are able to continue to provide on-orbit operations to support revenue generation on our platform. So we do this with a partnership with Spaceflight. So Spaceflight Industries is the industry leading launch services and mission management provider. As you can see in the chart, they've had hundreds of satellites to orbit. They've served hundreds or you know, 30 different countries and they work with 10 launch vehicles in general. But the key enabler for us is their Sherpa OTB. It can be chemical or electric propulsion and can take spacecraft up to 500 kilograms, which is pretty awesome for us. And the, the little cherry on top here is our relationship with, with Space Flight um, is that in exchange for cultivating and developing these customers for geo delivery, GeoJump has the only right of first offer to purchase all excess capacity going to the moon. So this is our key enabler here. And we have our first mission coming up. So we have real hardware that we're buying and real missions. Our first customer is OrbitFab. Um, which is pretty well known in the uh, small uh, new space ecosystem as being the people that are bringing propulsion up to space. So they already have a LEO uh, tanker and we're gonna be delivering their first gas station geosynchronous space. So this helps service all those traditional customers that are thinking about refueling their assets later. And our first launch is coming up soon, about a year from now. So that's pretty exciting as well. So, but what does this product look like, say, if you're not someone that wants to put a propulsion uh, tanker in space? So we will have our mission in general is to provide uh, uh, access for everybody. So this could look like a di few different things. And um, as you can see, I got my little colors that connect to all these boxes. Um, so the, for us, we've talked to customers that um, have just a demonstrator mission. So for them, we provide rideshare access, and this could become a TRL boost or technical level readiness, um, technical readiness level boost in some of the hardware that we've been talking about. But we've also talked to people that are very interested in art installations and getting pictures and video from space. Um, this could also look like hosted payloads, kind of like I mentioned before. So folks such that are doing you know, communications or cameras can use our OTV capabilities and join us with a shared mission. And for high value customers, we can consider revenue sharing to make those missions happen faster. But if you have an, a, like a 16 u spacecraft that you just wanna pop off and start working, we're happy to work with you too. We are able to do hosted satellite drop-off at your geo location. So all of this combined with our partners at Spaceflight gives a really compelling swath of capabilities in comparison to the, all the different companies that it would take to service the market that we're addressing. 
So for with our partnership with Spacelight, we're able to take on the traditional type um, of capabilities that launch vehicle providers, traditional aerospace companies, and even other rideshare companies can't do on their own. So we have a small but agile team. Um, our, my name is Issa, like I mentioned before, and I've got 10 years of experience in aerospace engineering and product development. Um, since I started my career, I've flown over a billion dollars of space assets to geo-orbit. Um, so I'm an orbit's nut. I love space, I love math. Um, but my colleagues, um, I have my co-founder is Megan Crawford, and she's our Space Fund venture partner. And she's also founded previous companies beforehand. Our CEO, which we brought, on, brought in in October, is um, a space lawyer. So, yep, those do exist. And he's got over 30 years of uh, defense and aerospace experience. So looking forward for our financials, we have the potential to produce over $200 million in revenue from our first four flights. And this is just based off the customer funnel that we've um, engendered since we started. Um, we anticipate requiring less than $10 million, $20 million in fundraising over the lifetime of our company. Um, but of course, if we fundraise more, then we're able to procure additional flights and additional capacity on the way. Um, so for us, we're right now continuing to build our portfolio out for customers and additional niches and launches. And this all moves into our scalability. Um, like I mentioned before, we've got uh, letters of interest in place, and we are talking right now to multiple different U.S. government assets and um, companies. So for us, we are raising our Series A. We're raising $9 million for our Series A round, and this will just help uh, bring on additional launch capacity and take additional payloads and customers to orbit. Primary use of funds is to procure the capacity beforehand, um, and then we have very low minimal overhead. Um, we anticipate a Series B later on in the year once we start manifesting customers and revenues generated. So thank you, everybody. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. And uh, if anyone's interested, we have a, we've got a launch that we're brokering and building up for 2024. So le please let me know if you have any questions. Okay, thanks so much. Judge, it's up to you. Uh, Stoney, your, turn on your... Uh... I've been waving my arms and you can't hear me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm probably okay. <laughs> Can you explain the system architecture for this first launch? So you have a customer payload that goes directly onto the Sherpa, or are you providing any hardware? And then the Sherpa gets attached to what that it's doing a ride share on? Can you explain yeah. how that works? Let me see if I can't kind of pull up the picture again. Um, but so for us, we our first customer is OrbitFab, and they're building out their their extra propellant tank that's going to be part of their um, their system for that's their okay. tanker. That's, that's um, okay. And that yeah, that gets mounted to the OTV. Our OTV we're procuring from Spaceflight. So those two get mounted together, and then that gets mounted onto the launch vehicle that is going towards the moon. And which one is that? Which launch SpaceX. vehicle? SpaceX. Uh, on which mission? Um, the first flight that we're going on is the, the Intuitive Machines launch that's happening in about a year from now. And you have a, a contract with SpaceX for that? We have a contract with uh, Space Flight that has a contract with Intuitive Machines and SpaceX. So yeah, all they're all connected, but uh, we are contracted for that launch. Okay. Um, so then sp the the, the sp Base flight uh, Sherpa, whatever it's called, uh, OTV would would separate from from the intuitive machines payload at some point before it circularizes its orbit in the moon, and you would just do a free fly trajectory back to to Geo, and then they would fire a, a circularization burn or something. Is that am I understanding that correct? Yep, you're you're understanding that correctly. And sorry for all the slide. Um, Get tossing around back there. Um, so uh, the logistics of it look like um, us being mounted barnacled to the side of the SpaceX uh, launch vehicle that's going lunar bound for the intuitive missions mission. I think it's about one day after launch, we separate from the system and then start doing slight trajectory corrections. Um, so that way, instead of you know going to the moon with uh, intuitive machines, we circularize and come back. 
And then after we do the lunar pass, there's a series of um, maneuvering to be able to circularize back to geo. So quick little pulses on the way outbound to the moon and then big braking burns to bring us to our operational location. And are you getting paid up front for this or is this one of these revenue sharing deals? Uh, I'm actually not quite sure how much I'm allowed to share, but uh, let's just say that we are uh, working out. Um, uh, we have uh, customers for this mission and the future missions that um, employ both rev share and direct capacity. Okay, thank you. Um, so space flight, did you used to work for them and then just decided to take this idea and, uh, and, and do it yourself or how, what's the connection between the two of you? So uh, it's actually really interesting. I used to come from the propulsion world in general. So I used to do um, propulsion design and um, system development. Um, so I've known Spaceflight just because they are the industry leaders. And the idea came out um, probably earlier this summer when we talked about this, this capability, this technology with them. Um, so they've been along for the ride for the entire time um, for us. And uh, so this one, we, we brokered the uh, partnership with them um, to be able to have this right of first offer. Um, but no, I did not. Uh, I did not leave Space White to start this. We just want to partner with them for our mission. So you said, at one point in time, you used the term excess capacity, and then the other term is available capacity. So what if they sell the whole thing? That means you're kind of out of luck, right? So we have the or we have the first pass on all of the access capacity. So um, if we can't use it, then it becomes available for other people. Okay. And and then in some of the other slides, you talked about um, financing things. Does that require capital on your behalf, or does that just mean you're taking the payments over time? So for uh, for us, the the big Thing that apparently some of our customers are interested in is revenue share. So uh, we would then cover their capacity, cover the payload um, capacity uh, charges, basically how much it costs to fly it in exchange for revenue that they generate on orbit. So we're basically paying for them to go first in exchange for revenue, a higher uh, amount of revenue coming back once they start operating. That, that, that gets to my earlier question. Like if you have a customer who's paying you and you pay, uh, space flight then you don't need you don't need capital so it sounds like this this first customer is actually not paying you right away if i can in infer that <laughs> i think um those could be good assumptions <laughs> well so that begs the question do you have any uh letters of intent or anything from customers that would pay up front for this service in the future we do, yeah. We actually have right now um, multiple customers that we're ne uh, in negotiation and conversations with for our future upcoming missions that are just pure direct capacity plays. Okay, thank you. So what happens to your vehicle after, um, after you've released the uh, passenger? Yep, so uh, for our systems, if we have um, like, a mix of these say that we have a couple of hosted payloads we drop them off on their uh in their location and then our spacecraft or our otv is available to do consistent on orbit operations for the hosted payloads that we have on board so depending on um who we're working with we're able to either move into a geo longitude and do operations say if somebody has a comm payload that they want um we can do operations for them there um but if if not, we can do slow, circular, slow circularizations around the geo arc um, to do, you know, tests or demonstrations. So we're able to do um, continuous operations after the deployments. What kind of services could you offer after a deployment? Um, so after deployments, we're able to, we're effectively like a spacecraft platform. So we can provide comms, telemetry back down to earth to send the data from the payloads. Um, and then also the systems are equipped with cameras. So taking pictures um, of the system on orbit if needed. Um, but basically it's almost, it's, it's like a, having a satellite infrastructure that you can work 
your platform into or work your payload into. Well, as you know, uh, the geo belt is is highly subscribed and difficult to uh, get all the licensing and require required. So, um, have you pursued the um, the licensing necessary to operate such a spacecraft after deployment of your your customer, your primary? We have. Yep. Um, so for the first mission, our, our tanker mission, um, that one's going to be slowly moving around the geo arc. So we don't need to have it be in a specific geo longitude. Um, having it be in the like slowly revolving around the arc is kind of like a traveling AAA in space in my head. Um, but for folks that have uh, uh, longitude needs, we would have to, of course, then start those, those conversations early. Okay, because uh, we just heard about orbital debris. I hope this doesn't become uh, geo orbital debris. <laughs> yeah, so I, I have a, I've been in aerospace for about ten years, and debris is always the the biggest fear I think for all operators and um, anyone that's in that field. So it's something that's you know very very strong in my mind too. It, this sounds like an opportunity for to do orbital servicing with the right attachments to your vehicle. Have you looked at that at all? We have. Um, so for, uh, I have a backup slide. I'm sorry, it's hard to control this in the speaker view. That could be uh, a pretty there we big go. business. Um, yep, it is something that we have thought talked about um, and thought about um, for, us, each of these has um, the capability to provide consistent operations with the payloads that we have or our own products. Um, so one of the things that we don't speak about publicly, um, but I can talk to you all more about um, offline is we are developing our first uh, proprietary product. Um, and our first flight would probably be in 2024 if we can get it um, completely built up and tested. Um, but yes, definitely along those lines, being able to do consistent operations um, over a suite of our uh, deliveries and platforms is definitely something that we've thought about. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. So if anyone's interested, you can feel free to reach out to me offline. Okay, if there are no other questions from the judges, then I think it is the top of the hour. We kind of have to call a halt to this, but uh, he said thanks so much. And thanks to everyone from the uh, who presented today. They all had really great presentations, and we're certainly glad to have you. And uh, something I don't know if I mentioned it earlier <laughs> in the beginning, or uh, but I'll make sure I mention it now. Uh, the, the judges and I will be going off to a breakout room to deliberate. This is a competition, and there can and there is a winner. There will be only one winner. But uh, I may not have mentioned that the uh, the winning team will receive a cash award of five thousand uh, dollars, sponsored by Foundation for the Future, uh, the hosts of this particular event today. So thanks again to F4F for all their great help and support. And we are going to move on to the breakout room. We'll be back probably around 3.30 this afternoon Eastern to uh, announce the winner. Uh, in the meantime, we have three great speakers coming up. And uh, so I'm gonna hand the microphone back to Rachel and uh, she can introduce them. And uh, so you'll have something great to look at while we're, uh, while we're deliberating. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Tom. Looking forward to our next three speakers um, while the judges are deliberating. Um, so our first speaker is named Michael Lane. Mr. Lane founded the Liftport group, group with the idea that an elevator to space could and should be built commercially. The concept for Liftport was simple, to develop the subsystems and precursor technologies needed for the elevator and to commercialize these as a method of payment for the larger, long -ter longer term project of building the elevator. Areas of focus are robotics, nanotech, and material sciences, finance, and media. So, Michael, it's great to have you here. Thanks. Oh, you're, you're muted. Oh, there always, you go. Always terrific. Um, I've been involved with the Conversations for the Future program since its very beginning, and it's terrific being back. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Um, so I hear that you have um, some information to share with us about yeah. um, what you're up to. Yeah, well, I'm not going to talk too much about the elevator. That wasn't really the uh, uh, the goal. That's not why 
Tom and Jeff asked me to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about a tool set that I created. Um, it, there's no roadmap for building uh, a space elevator on the moon, right? There's no, there's no best practices. It's never been done before. So long before I ever had to figure that out, I had to figure out how to figure it out, if that makes sense, right? Like, what are the tools? So I created a, uh, uh, a framework that I use every day. Uh, and it's been percolating around the space community for a little while. So I'm going to share that. Um, uh, and I'll go into more detail about that. That's, that's kind of the point of, of my conversation today. Um, but before I do that, um, uh, about a year ago on this program originally, uh, um, I was the host and I was riffing with uh, Michael Mealing with Starbridge, um, the, the venture capital company Starbridge. And we were talking about uh, the upcoming, very much in development, uh, Starship. And we coined the phrase Starship Singularity. And it was just a kind of a kind of a moment, right? It was a, it was a, it was a, an ad hoc ad hoc invention of the moment. And over time, over the last year, year and a half or so, uh, not quite a year and a half, um, that idea has started to percolate and percolate and percolate. And I was very surprised and very honored to be cited in. Uh, a pretty important document that came out at the end of last year, the uh, space industrial uh, base. Uh, gosh, it was the state of the industrial base. I'll, I'll post the link to it in a second. But, but that paper was, um, it was authored by the chief scientist of U.S. Space Force, um, the director of the Air Force Research Labs uh, vehicles, space vehicles directorate, uh, uh, Bucky Buteau from the Defense Innovation Unit. Um, so those are the authors. And then the folks that signed on the forward were General Raymond in charge of Space Force and, um, uh, and the NASA administrator. So, you know, arguably this document was crafted and, and, and uh, um, supported by the folks with the largest space budgets in the world and arguably the most influential people in the space arena. Um, so to get cited in this thing for this truly ad hoc idea of Starship Singularity, uh, I kind of was, uh, you know, in a friendly way, pressured by Peter Gerritsen to craft and create some language around what does it mean to be a starship singularity. So I'm going to kind of share some of my thoughts on that now, because I think it relates to all the businesses that are being presented here, and honestly, all future businesses. So uh, first, I'm just going to share a couple screenshots of pieces of information, data that I'm incorporating into this paper. I have not finished writing the paper yet. Um, uh, I hope to get, I hope to finish, write the first draft in the next week or two. Um, but then as I, as I was working on this document, I realized that um, I only have one perspective on this idea of the Starship Singularity, and that and that several other people have equally valid, equally weighted, um, uh, maybe even more, uh, uh, more important positions on this idea. Um, so I'm just gonna sh share a few things first and then, and then we'll go into it. And I'm not gonna go very far into this. This is still very much a work in progress, but I think this audience in particular will appreciate that there is something really profound coming and we don't yet know what it is. So let me do a couple screen shares of some, la, 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 la. too many, too many tabs. All right. Um, so first of all, SpaceX is aiming to get a launch a week 
up from 31 launches all last year. So 50, from 31 last year to 52 this year, that's the target, that's the goal. We all know that Musk tends to overreach and make claims that are not supported in time. He's very inaccurate by his time uh, predictions, but he usually hits the mark when it comes to uh, results. Um, and so I don't know whether we're going to hit 52 launches a week. Uh, sorry. <laughs> wow, that would be good. 52 launches a week would be fun. Um, 52 launches a year would be amazing. Um, uh, but even if he doesn't hit it this year, it's, it's a safe bet that he'll hit it next year. I, I'm, uh, I, for the record, I am not a SpaceX fanboy. Um, uh, I was an early skeptic. I've obviously been proven wrong. Um, happy to be proven wrong, but not, I am not a SpaceX fanboy. Um, it's actually been pretty amazing and somewhat, somewhat humbling me working on this uh, on this paper. So I dug in a little bit into their stats. Uh, by the way, this is a fascinating website. It's a fan run website by fanboys. So, you know, uh, it is what it is, but they've got some really great stats. I, I actually was pretty surprised by this. Um, you know, what they've launched, when they've launched it. Sometimes they crash, you know, it happens. This is the rocket business. Um, uh, you know, developing out different launch pad sites. But this, this graphic has really, really been intriguing to me. Um, so yeah, I know they discontinued, discontinued Falcon 1, and that brings their average down because they had a couple failures right from the beginning. But even if you look at all rockets, including their failures, they have a 96% success failure, uh, success rate. Um, I, I actually did not know it was that good uh, until I started doing this work in the last few weeks. Um, you know, you know, hats off to the Falcon 9, the work workforce of the industry. Uh, and then, you know, I, I think I think throwing in the Falcon Heavy is a little misleading because they've only had a few launches. So um, really the number to, that I'm kind of paying attention to is this one. Um, that's that's pretty astounding. Ninety eight plus percent success rate. Um, and then. And then this, okay, um, you know, uh, landing, landing and recovering uh, boosters. 106 landings out of 148 launches, right? Because they, they, weren't, they weren't recovering them in the beginning, right? So um, that's, a, that's a pretty astounding number as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then turnaround. Currently their fastest refit is 27 days. Um, this factors in and this factors in. So um, Musk's claim and what I've been describing as the Starship Singularity is that they are gonna launch uh, three times a day 1,095 trips a year um, with 100 metric tons at a time. Um, so what's 100 metric tons? 100, 100 metric tons is a herd of African elephants, approximately 60 to 80 full grown beasts. Um, that's a lot of elephants in space. Uh, it's also, you know, the International Space Station's what, 400, uh, 400 tons, uh, 400, yeah, 400 tons. So if Musk is right, if, if Starship Singularity occurs the way it's being described, you could launch that in a weekend. You could launch the ISS or the equivalent in a weekend instead of 15 years and $150 billion of construction time. Um, so that's why I'm saying that 
this capacity of this spacecraft changes everything. Not not just here, uh, not just not just in space. Like all the business plans that we've just evaluated, um, they're going to mod. Everybody's going to have to modify based on this capability. But I'm a former U.S. Marine. There's a lot of tension in uh, in Europe these days. Um, would that tension be greater or lesser if you had the ability to uh, to drop 500 or 5,000 combat ready Marines uh, in uh, around the Ukraine, around Kiev? Right? Would that be better or worse? I'm not here to predict that. I'm just saying that there is capacity soon to drop ship. I mean, that's that's a childhood dream, right? Starship troopers. Um, to drop ship Marines anywhere in the world in 90 minutes. Or equally, uh, you know, uh, the um, some of the island nations in the last few years have got pummeled by um, uh, 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 tidal waves. Um, Haiti just got, you know, uh, an earthquake and a hurricane back to back inside of a week a couple months ago. Uh, how'd you like to 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 drop a thousand um, Red Cross workers and a portable hospital as needed? Right. So I don't think we really understand what's about to happen with when this new capability comes online. And then the final final two pieces of this. Uh, I think everybody has has known that the price to orbit has been dropping, but going all the way back to the original days, and uh, you know the most expensive system on the on the on the chart uh, is in the '80s with the space shuttle. But I mean, this is just in the last ten years ish, fifteen years, where we've seen it go from thirteen thousand dollars to $200 approximate. Now, this is not realized. Nobody I know is writing a $200 check uh, to send a kilo to orbit, which by the way, doing conversions, that's $100 a pound, which was, which was mythical when I first started working on the Earth space elevator 20 years ago. The idea was that the Earth elevator would bring pricing down to that $100, $400 price tag uh, it's one of the reasons why I stopped working on the Earth elevator more than 10 years ago. Um, uh, but, you know, we all know that SpaceX isn't the only game in town. Uh, there are at least six reusable rocketry companies in development or, or are functioning now, right? Uh, uh, Virgin and, and, uh, and Blue. Um, and several others, Sierra and Astra and Rocket Lab, and there's a bunch, you know, kind of in the works, right? So we know that this price point is going to continue dropping, right? This is just highlighting one organization, but we know that there's several others. So this Starship Singularity doesn't just relate to SpaceX, it relates to the entire uh, U.S. and then extended global efforts to drop Price to orbit. Um, you know, this is highlighting one organization, but it's this is not a one organization story. It's a much, much, much broader, wider story. Um, and the idea of the singularity kind of came in. Uh, science fiction author wrote in 1993, Dr. Vendra in 1993, about how the technological singularity of advanced supercomputing was multiplying, 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 multiplying. By the way, I want to point out, this is a great read. It is definitely interesting. It's fascinating that it's 30 years ago, um, but it's kind of right that, that this, this uh, greater than in human intelligence uh, is happening kind of on schedule. And he's talking about between 20, 2005 and 2030. And my hunch is, is, is he is probably right on track. Um, and so this idea, coupled with the idea of massive space capacity, 
uh, underappreciated, under, uh, you know, we're not built, we're not, we're not right yet. We have not yet figured out how to use this massive capacity, a hundred tons, three times a day from one organization. If that's right, if that's true, and then based on the idea of the technological singularity that we have seen one singularity already, you know, unfold in our in our careers and our lifetimes, uh, I think it is very safe to say that there is another uh, rocket-based, space-based singularity about to begin, um, and that we don't yet understand it. So that's all I wanted to say about that. I talked a whole lot longer about that than I expected. Um, let, me, uh, let me ask if there are questions from the audience. If not, I will jump in and do a super fast overview of what the new media process is. Would there be any questions or should I shift over to the other kind of the question. previously planned? Sorry, go ahead. How are you? It's Nina Marcantoni from the DTEC. I work closely with a lot of senior leadership, and I think a few of them need to have a talk with you regarding your last comment. Uh, I think Rear Admiral Selby will be very happy to have him as a part of the team of team concept. Um, sure. Yeah, especially on the on what you just described on the on the the singularity point here, where we're going towards it's a it's a huge logistical advantage. We can kind of grasp at. Plus, he's also a very big fan of SpaceX. So, I mean, guys like that we work with very closely. So, um, yeah, just offline. Let's let, let's connect and see how we can bring you on. I'll make sure that I present. I'll post uh, I'll post my own connections here in the chat in just a moment. Happy to do that. Um, uh, I'll also post the the references to the to the articles I just uh, cited. Because uh, they're they're fascinating reads. Uh, the industrial space space meeting that is hosted every year by uh, Dr. Mosier and General Buto and and uh, Colonel Felt. Like that's a that's a fascinating meeting to be a part of. Uh, some really important national doctrine comes out of that meeting, um, and so I'll post that link. And then finally, you know my background from my earliest days in the Marine Corps were logistics, like how to get how to get stuff from where it is to where it needs to be. And it is a super underappreciated part of this, uh, this, this space business value chain that we're talking about. Um, and I think it's going to, I think it's going to be, uh, uh, we've already seen that COVID disrupted the space logistics chain. We all know that um, that cars are more expensive. You can't buy certain laptops. You can't buy certain certain gaming rigs. You can't buy a lot of stuff because the logistics of, of COVID have gotten a little screwed up. And I think we're only just beginning to appreciate that logistics play a critical role in uh, in all of space. It was interesting, again, on this program a couple of months ago, uh, we hosted um, Colonel Narav uh, from the Army Transportation Logistics Group. Um, and he was, they, they have, they've actually funded a study on how to use this Starship capability. Uh, which has not been released, by the way, as far as I'm aware. So uh, we're all kind of waiting to find out what that what that article comes out to say. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, I'd be happy to chat uh, offline. Um, as I write this, as I write this document, one of the things that was really clear was that. Uh, you know, other people needed to be a part of this story, that this is not a Michael Lane story. It's not a Liftport story. It's not even a story about SpaceX. Uh, and so if you'd like to kind of review this doc, um, I'm happy to share it as, a, as, as an advanced copy. And what I'm asking people to do is, uh, is, actually put in maybe write up a two page addendum of what their thoughts are of this thing, because, you know, the, 
it's it's a new idea, and I think it deserves other people's inputs to this. Um, you know, how are things going to change if if we can reliably, consistently write a hundred dollar check and send something to space, right? A, a pound of anything to space at a hundred dollars. I mean, that is a boggling idea. Um, yeah, one of the. Sorry, go ahead. For you, uh, the the OSD policy that is also includes space policy. Uh, the people that that present our technologies that are, are are we are true partners, true partners of the Pentagon. Like we work like on both sides of the aisle. So Mr. Hill up there is is, is the person that you would directly talk to. He's he's great friends with the Dr. Hampton that runs these forums with me. You know, he's been he's been a long, long time fan of ours. So yeah, that's the. Let's go straight to the top, guys. Uh, make noise, because I mean, senior leadership that can get this kind of stuff, the, the edge, right, the edge strategy that that we're working on. This is this is this is right, right up that alley of, of giving us that edge, and it's really a race, right? Because we're racing against our peer competitors. Just like I was saying before. Thank you. Very 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 awesome stuff. I I look forward to it. You know what the craziest idea is that was proposed in the early days of the space elevator? I think this might have been 2003 or 2004. When, when, when we were looking at, and you got, y'all can see, like, I've got robots behind me. I've got nanotech. I've got strings. Like, this, this was my world for a really long time. And we focus, we switched gears more than 10 years ago to focus on the, uh, the lunar elevator because we think that because of this technology, because of what's happening, uh, the lunar elevator is actually, a, it's, it's within reach now. We, we have the current technology to build it now. And um, as all of this rocketry potential comes online, there is more and more and more value of a lunar system. So we're, we're totally focused on that now. But in the earliest days, when we were still, maybe still under the NASA umbrella, maybe it was just after we left NASA's umbrella. Um, one of the ideas was, was pre-programmed uh, uh, meteor showers that you would take up, you know, these $100, $200 junker cars, you'd take them up to the right orbit. And then on November 7th at 6.15, you go out and you say, hey, look up, and you've launched, you've dropped, you basically dropped a junker car into the atmosphere so it burns up along the way. And that's a firework dedicated to your loved one's birthday, right? Like that's that's what you get when you have ridiculously low launch costs. At $100, uh, at $100 a pound, uh, everything changes. So um, we are kind of excited about that. Uh, I, I am going to throw in a plug about an event that we're going to host in about three months. Um, we've got a, a series called Better Futures, and we're going to be doing, we're going to be looking at what does the future look like in 2025, use that as a benchmark for 2030, and use that as a jumping off point to figure out what 2035 looks like. So uh, I'm happy to invite anybody to, to that event. Um, yeah, with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Rachel. I didn't talk about the Numenia process. If anybody wants to talk about that, I'm happy to do that too. It's a useful structure. Um, I didn't expect to go as long as I did on, on this uh, uh, Starship Singularity conversation. Hey Michael, uh, yeah. uh, regarding the 2030, the NG2030 uh, Special Operations Weekend, was, I was part of an RCA event uh, not too long ago. Uh, remind me to, to, to link you up to that group. Um, uh, Brian Cisco, okay, Brian Cisco. You know, I only got uh, the 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 last part of that. I didn't catch the first. Could you say it again? Yeah, just remind me to introduce you to Brian uh, Cisco because we we do a lot. So Brian Cisco at 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 NG uh, uh, Special Operations kind of because he was we we're working on something along these lines for. Cool. For that sure. future happy to out. happy to make the introductions. Um, I'm going to post all of my 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 stuff here in a second, and I'm going to turn it over to to Rachel. Thanks a lot, everybody. Appreciate your attention. Thank you so much, Michael. It's fascinating stuff, um, everything going on with Starship. Um, it was great to hear from you about it. Um, so our next speaker I can see is on the call is Jeff Krukin. Um, thank you for joining us today, Jeff. Um, so Jeff is active within the space community since 1989. 
He received the Pro Space Activist of the Year Award in 1998 for his instrumental work in creating and implementing that organization's lobbying strategy to move the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act of 2004 through Congress, laying the regulatory foundation for the new space industry. He was executive director of the Space Frontier Foundation from 2005 to 2007 and is credited with turning the grassroots advocacy organization into a professionally managed operation. While perhaps best known for his global lecturing, consulting, and leadership at the vanguard of what has become New Space, Kukin's seminal work, New Space Nation, America's Emerging Entrepreneurial Space Industry, was one of the first primers in what was then a national entrepreneurial domain. Jeff is a global speaker and strategic thinker, has appeared across the United States, Europe, and China, and was welcomed into the prestigious Explorers Club. He has been interviewed for podcasts, newspapers, magazines, radio, and television from Los Angeles to Palm Beach, as well as in Europe and Asia. Jeff co-founded Earth Space Commerce Advisors LLC in 2019 and is current, currently VP Business Growth at Orbital Transports. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today, Jeff. Rachel, thanks very much. Uh, really delighted to be here. Uh, you know, Michael, always, always enjoyed listening to you. You just always give me ideas and you help feed into what I'm going to be discussing today, which really I don't have a, a, a presentation, just, just some general thoughts about, I guess, being an entrepreneur, a space entrepreneur, why we do boot camps, why we do mentoring, you know, things learned over the last, uh, well, as Tom said, th this competition has been going on since 2009. I've been involved with it. I think since 2010 or 11 as a co-manager, a, a boot camp coach. Uh, Michael's been involved for, I guess, about that long. Michael, I'm sorry if I don't remember the exact year. Kevin Russell, if you're still here, I see you on the screen. He was one of our very first coaches and has helped out in that capacity on occasion. Well, going back to what you said, Michael, when you were talking about SpaceX, and it just reminded me that what was it? He had three, SpaceX had three failed launches before they were successful. Um, and all during that time, this is something that just infuriated me when this is going on. You had Senator Shelby, representative of uh, a senator from Alabama. Uh, and what's in Alabama? Huntsville Space Flight Center, you know, NASA's Huntsville Space Flight Center, which for them, SpaceX was a direct potential competitor. And every time there was a failure, you could count on some press release coming out of Senator Shelby's office, just poo-pooing SpaceX and, you know, and so on and so forth. So I, I guess, Michael, he never became a fanboy either. Uh, but the point <laughs> I'm making is, the point I'm making is, you know, one of the traditional definitions of insanity is doing the same thing twice and expecting different results each time. I say shelve that definition. The real definition of insanity is being a space entrepreneur. I mean, you got to be a masochist because space is hard. Being an entrepreneur is hard. You put those things together. I mean, are you out of your minds? And yet we do it. All right. We do it because there's a deeply embedded passion in our soul. And if you haven't got that, what's going to keep you going? When your business plan isn't working out as you anticipated, it may be 150 brilliantly written pages, but there's going to be mornings you wake up in a cold sweat and wondering why the hell everything isn't working the way you expected it to. And the only thing that's going to keep you going is that passion to get through those kind of problems. And if there's nothing else, take away uh, SpaceX's technology accomplishments, the fact that Elon kept the team together by sheer grit or however else he did it and kept them going through those failures when you had elements of the US government saying it isn't gonna work, let alone so many others in the industry. So as entrepreneurs, yes, it's different now than when SpaceX started. A lot of things have been proven. It does not necessarily require a well-funded government agency, but yet, all right, we may, for the most part, be able to do launch consistently, reliably, but not 100%, right? There are still the occasional failures, but so much of what we have seen you entrepreneurs present today, we're moving into new realms. I mean, just as an example, on-orbit servicing and manufacturing, and it's going to be more a commercial environment 
doing the work than a government environment. So the pressure is on to deliver. And, and there's a lot, you know, really relying on all, all of space entre entrepreneurship to succeed. So leading into just some general thoughts about what, what we, when I say we, Michael, Tom, myself, Kevin, others that have been doing the boot camps for over 10 years, some of the things that we've learned that we have seen over and over and over again. And this is not, I, I want to say what I'm saying is not, uh, I am not just uh, referring to the presentations of today. I'm referring to the presentations and the coaching that go back a decade or longer. And again, some of the things that we've learned. Uh, and I want to talk about the technology because while the technology is crucial, God knows we love our technology, right? I mean, overwhelmingly, these companies are founded by entrepreneurs who are technologists or engineers or they're scientists. They started a company because they have this incredible idea that they are absolutely in love with, right? They are so passionate about it. It's what, it's the reason they founded the company. But as someone said, I think it was Eva Jane Lark who said during one of the presentations today, it doesn't matter how good your technology is. It does not matter how incredibly brilliant and dedicated and capable your technology team is. If you don't understand business, if you don't understand sales and marketing, if you do not now do not know how to communicate and sell your very technical product or service to a non-technical business decision maker who's going to write the check to make that purchase, you're not going to survive as a company. So one of the things that I've seen over many, many years is the very first presentations are overwhelmingly about the technology. Most of that pitch, the first time we do a run through is about the technology and I get it. It's why you started the company. It's also what you tend to be comfortable with. Now I'm making some generalizations here, but by and large, and I've been around engineers my entire professional life, by and large engineers are really great at talking with other engineers because right? speak the same language. But I've been in many presentations. I'm not talking about the ones I've watched, but in my own professional life, I've been in many presentations with deeply, deeply technical engineers who cannot, to save themselves, discuss and present to a business decision-making audience. And time and time again, I've seen startups trip over this, not just in presentations, but when in terms of the pitch decks that we see, but when they're out in the real world trying to sell a product. And the first clues you hopefully will, will get about this are when you're going through a boot camp, right? And so I really want to drive that point home. The really good, really wise founders, good's the wrong word. The really wise founders, in my opinion, of startups, especially if they're the technical person that founded the company, yes, they will be the first CEO. That's, that's pretty typical. But if their company succeeds over a couple of years and starts to grow, at some point, they may recognize or be forced to recognize and have to acknowledge they're not the best person to be the CEO. They're the best person to be the CTO. And they need to go out and get a CEO who brings the business sense, the business experience, the business talents, and so forth. So I really want to uh, drive that point home, uh, which I think I've done. Um, so another thing that we often see is absolutely no mention in the first run through of a pitch deck is what's the business problem you're solving? Not the technical problem, that's important. But again, going back to why is somebody going to write a check for Bitcoin if that's what, I don't know, how do you write a Bitcoin? Uh, we're getting out of my area of expertise. Anyway, so you've got to be able to communicate with that audience and you've got to be able to get beyond just that the technical part of the problem and talk about the business problem that you're solving. And that's not as easy to do if you're a technical person. You're very comfortable talking about the technical problem that you're solving. 
But that's more than likely not going to be enough when you've got that investment and now you're out there going after that first customer. And I know it's great when you're an entrepreneur and you start your company, you're excited because your mother said, I will buy 12 of whatever you make as soon as they're ready. I don't understand what you're making, but I love you. I'll buy 12 of them. Right? That's not a business model. It's good. It's not a business model. So, so moving on, some other thoughts, uh, some things that I've seen. Pardon me for looking at my notes here. Uh, I want to talk about the use of, of color in presentations. I key very much on how a presentation looks, right? I'm not the one that's going to dig deep into the financials. Tom's really good at that, for example. Others are very good at that. I key on the visuals, right? How is this presentation coming across? How is it likely to be received? And there were some very excellent examples today of, of using color to make a point, to emphasize something. Uh, one of the ones that really stuck out was Issa Fritz's presentation where she even said, and you can see I'm using three different colors where she was relaying the information in the blocks of different colors to the image of the spacecraft. Far too many times I have seen colors used just for the sake of let's have some color, not one or two colors. Let's have a lot of color. Let's make this really pretty. No. I, Tom, you'll remember this. And Michael, I don't, I don't think you were one of the coaches, but Tom and I were one of the coaches of a startup a couple of years ago. Loved purple. Loved purple. I like purple. I like it. It's a nice, vibrant color. Looks god-awful in a pitch deck with a black background. It's very hard to read purple text. I don't know how many times we had to tell them, get rid of the purple. They finally did. But the point was, use color to emphasize a point, to strengthen your presentation, not just for the sake of being color. Too much is a distraction. And the last thing that you want to do when you have seven or eight or nine minutes to pitch to an investor or a group of investors is do anything at all that is distracting. It takes their attention away from what you are saying and what they are seeing. And that brings me to my next point. And I understand that we all have different levels of comfort when it comes to making presentations. We have different communication skills, and some of us are better at, better at it than others. It's not a criticism. It's just the truth. It's an observation. Our minds, we're all wired differently. We all have different strengths. We all have other things that we're not so good at, right? And a really good team will use the different strengths of the people on that team when they're putting together a pitch deck and doing the presentation. And one of the things that is extremely distracting is having way too much text on slides, especially full sentences, especially paragraphs of full sentences. The first thing that happens when those slides pop up, it's human nature. The people that are watching tend to start reading, which means they aren't listening to you. And that's a distraction. You have got to know your business, your technology, and your pitch deck well enough where you do not even have to look at the slides. And you certainly don't want to be reading your slides, and you don't want the audience spending the entire time reading sentence after sentence after sentence when you want their attention focused on you. So there's just... Great examples of presentations that are mostly graphics, and we saw some of that today, with a little bit of bulleted text to reinforce the graphic, but not so much text that someone who you are pitching to is reading complete sentences instead of listening to you. I think this is something that is just either not well understood or maybe just maybe a lot of people think it's not that big a deal. It is a big deal. Again, the whole point is you want to tell a story very strongly. You want to project confidence. 
not arrogance, confidence. There's a maybe a fine gray area between the two. It's a judgmental call, but they're different. When you're pitching to an investor, groups of investors, they want to sense emotional confidence. And one of the ways you do that is knowing your material so well, you're standing in a room in front of investors and your presentation is on the wall behind you. And if you can pitch that without ever having to turn around and look at your presentation, you have just made a hell, a hell of a presence and a hell of a performance in front of those people watching you. You've just demonstrated how well you know your business and what you want to do. And that is incredible. That will set you apart from so many of your competitors. And speaking of your competition, Something else that we've seen many times over the years is a pitch deck where the presenter will say, we don't really have any competition. What we're doing is so new, is so incredible. We have spent 11 years in our labs and we have manufactured the most incredible oscillation overthruster and combined it with a flux capacity. you're pretty much not going to be believed, even if it's true. And that's the sorry part if it is true. But don't try to position your company as being so far out there with your capability that there really are no competitors. Maybe there's only a few. Show them, make it clear that you understand what you're going up against, not just in the marketplace of new ideas, new capabilities, but other companies that are out there. And at the same time, have one or two points specific to your company, your technology, your team, something that really do differentiate you. I am so tired of seeing company startup after startup after startup in the same industry. When I say, I should say same subsector of the space industry, launch satellite propulsion, use the same words to say why we're different from everybody else. That's just laziness, right? That's just laziness. If you don't know your company or your technology well enough to really be able to identify a point or two specific to your company to differentiate yourself from all other competitors, what the hell are you doing? Have you really come up with something that someone should invest in? That really is going to solve a problem differently or better or lower cost from your competitors. This is a sales presentation. It's a sales meeting. Back to my comment about you've got to have someone who understands how to do sales. So there's a really great phrase within sales in general, the idea of show up to throw up. Been around a lot of salespeople. One of my jobs when I was a systems engineer at IBM. I worked with sales reps. I was the technical part of the sales. They were the non-technical part. Over the decades, I've seen far too many sales reps in different industries want to impress the hell out of their potential customer by showing what they know, show up to throw up, just spew it all out there. Never stop to breathe, never stop to ask questions. When you're doing your sales pitch, you want to find a nice balance between making it clear that you know what the hell you're talking about, but you're not trying to answer every potential question in one sales pitch. You're not trying to necessarily complete the sale in one sales pitch. What you are wanting to accomplish is making it clear that you are doing something different, that you are worth having another conversation with, and that you leave some potential questions in the mind of your potential customer or your investor so they want to follow up with you versus having spewed so much information that the result is they say to you, thanks very much. We'll be in touch if we have any questions. It's always great to leave your audience wanting more. Sometimes that means even if you know the answer to a question, don't answer it. If that feels like your only opportunity to continue the discussion, you can say, you know, I, 
I really want to dig into that a little bit more. Let us talk again in a couple of days so I can give you a really thorough answer, something like that. The idea is to continue the conversation for the investor or the customer to have a reason to want to keep talking to you, for them to want to actively get back in touch with you. That's a successful sales pitch. Of course, if someone writes a check right away, that's even more successful. I don't know how often that happens. So I, I was asked to talk for about 15 to 20 minutes, and I see it's 10 minutes before the hour. So let me stop at this point. Uh, curious to open this up for any questions uh, that people might have. If not, we'll keep talking for another 10 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. If there are any audience questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or turn on your mic and ask them. Um, um, Jeff, I just want to make a comment to, because, you know, we've worked together on this stuff ourselves for many years. And I kind of caught in the middle of your uh, your thing about, you know, presentation management and graphics and things like that. I still think, just a comment, one of the, one of the knowledge masters of that minimalist kind of style was the late great Steve Jobs. I mean, the, the stuff that he did inspires me to this day uh, with let it, letting a, just a graphic almost like, and in many cases, a graphic without text. Just, just make that, if you can pull it off, it, may, it just it makes a very interesting comment. And you're talking to that and people are list, but people are always then listening to you and letting the the graphic just kind of help you tell the tale. I think it's just a marvelous way to do things. I try to do it as much as I can. I don't always get to succeed, but uh, sometimes numbers matter and you have to put them in there. No, thanks for saying that because that reminds me, I said earlier, if you can give your presentation where you never have to turn around and look at the slides behind you, I don't know how many of us can do that, right? We're all busy people. We don't all necessarily have the time to nail our presentations on our minds that well. So another great reason to have this minimalist approach is in your presentation, you have graphics that key the thoughts in your mind that you want to make. So they're not only useful to the audience, of course, they're useful to you. So if you can't have your presentation memorized so well that you never have to turn around and look at it, the next best thing is, you don't need to read text at all. You have that in your mind, but still it's helpful to have some graphics that mean something to you by themselves may not necessarily convey enough information to your audience, but they will in conjunction with the words you're gonna say when you refer back to that particular graph. So thank you, Tom. Hey, I'd, I'd like to make a, a comment back to your discussion about SpaceX. And, um, you know, all the, the um, kind of doubts that a lot of people had about them. Gwen Shotwell came and pitched about SpaceX to my office at NASA. I'm retired from JSC and advanced development office. She came to, um, to present about Elon, what he wanted to do, SpaceX, how they were going to do things. This was back before Falcon 1 had done anything but been put in a, uh, a mock-up on the back of a tractor trailer semi-rig and parked in front of headquarters and she gave just the the most excellent pitch i think you know and i think of all the all the pitches i ever heard at nasa i think it was one of the best ones and you know what I mean, she was able to answer just about every question anybody in the group had um, but no question whatsoever in her mind about uh, you know if somebody asked her something she didn't knew didn't know I'll get back with you about that. She had the small group of us absolutely convinced that SpaceX was going to be successful. And we basically, you know, had to fight that whole thing about, you know, well, they just can't possibly do this with the rest of the agency. Uh, it was, it was really a lot of fun. Uh, I worked pretty closely with the uh, space portal folks at Ames and, uh, you know, it was just an interesting kind of thing. It's funny though, she, she, I think I remember her saying she never expected SpaceX to have more than a few hundred employees. Uh, David, uh, I, I said I was not an uh, Elon Musk fanboy. I am totally a Gwen Shotwell fanboy. 
Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and if you go to that uh, that site I posted about SpaceX stats, uh, there's a countdown clock. She predicted. Uh, she made a bet on on a TED interview that point to point suborbital would happen. You know, sometime in this decade before this decade is out, right? And so. Uh, you know, I, I have a lot of confidence in her. She's pretty, pretty epic. <laughs> yeah, well, I think one of the best decisions Elon made was to get and keep Quinn interested in working there because, uh, yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, David, you know, and, there was, and, there was, and there was all the discussion about, oh, those three, well, nine engines on a Falcon 9, that'll never work. Well, it's like, you know... <laughs> It's like, well, if that's the case, how does a B-52 with eight engines work? How does a fleet of B-52s work? <laughs> you know, it's, there's, a, there's a factor if you build a lot of them and you get to work the bugs out. <laughs> anyway, but that's, no, I just wanted to add that. that. No, I'm, I was, thank you for telling that story and especially for mentioning, you know, when Gwen would say, I'll get back to you. You know, I mean... When I was going through my IBM training in my early 20s, I absolutely hated the idea of being in front of a customer and not being able to answer a question. Now, I, I knew enough not to lie and make up an answer. <laughs> but, you know, when somebody told me this is like, you know, one of those epic learning moments when one of the more seasoned systems engineers that was mentoring me said, Jeff, it is okay to say to a customer, I don't know. I'll get mm -hmm. back to you. <laughs> Until I was told that, it never occurred to me that that was okay to say to a potential yeah. customer. Like, oh, my God, they expect me to know everything. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and we don't, and we can't. And sometimes the customer is more intelligent and knowledgeable than us. Sometimes they're not. So I really do appreciate you telling that that story, dude, and especially yeah. that That's, comment. Yeah, it's, it's just you know one of the coolest experiences to uh, to live through and, and see that happen. And you know, with our space settlement design competition just la just two weekends ago, I had one student that obviously did not know the the chart, the trade study he was presenting, and he's sitting there trying to blunder his way through it. I'm on Discord. No, no, stop! I told you, don't. Don't bluff your way through. Just say you don't know. And anyway, it, it was interesting. I think he learned a Thank life you. lesson. <laughs> his, his company yeah. still won, though. Learned. Or our company still won that one. But anyway. Any other questions or comments? If not, I, I want to finish out just by reading something, but certainly interested in any other questions or comments. So, okay, uh, I, used to, I used to blog many years ago when I had my own website, you know, before LinkedIn existed and before LinkedIn became as incredibly useful and powerful as, as it is now. And I was so incensed, going back to what I was saying about Senator Shelby and, you know, the responses to SpaceX's failures. I was so incensed by that, that I was like, man, there's got to be a way to answer this. And I was looking for something to use when, you know, I was being invited to give talks about this. What the hell is this commercial entrepreneurial space industry? You know, to audiences that were like, you're nuts. Only the government can do this. And I, I, I have a book. So I'm going to read something from this. This was published in 1978 by NASA. It's called Moonport, the History of Apollo Launch Facilities and Operations. And the book's about this thick probably can't get it in hard copy anymore, or even if at all. But in the preface is this, and I'm, I'm reading from the preface. On July 28th, 1960, NASA announced a new manned spaceflight program called Apollo. Its aim was to put three astronauts into sustained Earth orbit or into a flight around the moon. The timing of the announcement was not auspicious. The next day, NASA's first Mercury Atlas disintegrated and fell into the ocean 58 seconds after takeoff from Cape Canaveral. This disaster ushered in a bleak four months during which the test rocket Little Joe 5 joined the Mercury Atlas in the ocean and the first Mercury Redstone lifted a fraction of an inch and settled back onto its launch pad. 
not gently, exploded. I added that part. So back then, it wasn't true that only government could do this. They had the same learning pains that Elon Musk did and the same challenges and frustrations and setbacks that probably every space entrepreneur is going to have, or at least a significant portion of space entrepreneurs. And you just have to know, welcome to the club. Right? If Elon Musk is your role model, three failed launches before the first successful one. And now he's made launch so mundane that now we get excited when two boosters come back and land at the same time. I don't care about the launch anymore. I want to see those boosters land together, right? Well, eventually that will become mundane, right? We've moved, moved past those early challenges of being able to launch things into orbit. But all of you that are building startups now and looking at doing things that aren't being done yet, you're going to face those same technical challenges. You're going to face the same drawbacks. Welcome to the club. Yet seek help. It's out there one foot in front of the other, it's a crazy dance and you're not always gonna be moving forward. Just keep moving. Anyway, thank you. Rachel, thank you. Jeff, thank you so much. That was a beautiful way to end that talk. And uh, thank you so much for that discussion. Um, really, really interesting. I think a lot of really useful information for um, those in this call who are working on building companies right now. Um, so with that, I am thrilled to announce our next speaker before um, the judges come back to speak to you all. Um, so our next speaker is Antonio Stark. Um, Antonio Stark is the incubator program lead for SGAC, a global nonprofit organization for students and young professionals in the space sector, as well as the COO for UEL, a Korean startup building rovers for lunar construction. He previously worked with various startup accelerators and VCs, including SoftBank Ventures, 500 Startups, and T-Hub in Korea, Silicon Valley, and India, respectively. Antonio is the Asia Pacific Regional Coordinator for Space, Gener Space Generation Advisory Council and the East Asia Regional Coordinator for the Moon Village Association. He is a speaker and consultant for space policy and strategy with a fo focus on Asia Pacific region and emerging countries. So Antonio, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much for introducing me. I, I do see a few uh, faces that I already know, familiar faces here, so it's great to be here. Um, I know it's, uh, it's actually pretty early. Here, I wanted to, so I was invited to come and talk about the incubator program that we just did and it's a space Station advisory council, and also like just generally how the new space economy works. Um, I'm here to mostly to also like have a conversation. I've been told that this would be sort of like a smaller group to talk to, especially with like uh, experts in the field and whatnot. But I can quickly give an overview about the program that we developed in a space general supervisory council and the what are the things that we're looking forward to doing in the new space economy. So um, for those who might know, space generation advisory council is a non uh, profit non-government organization that was based out of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. We usually call it like UN COPUS. Um, it's an international organization that kind of represents the more young professional student set of things. The incubator program was based off our Blue Origin grant, the one million dollar grant that we received from Blue Origin um, just last year. Uh, we try to, we're trying to find a way to use that money for a great cause and trying to develop startups as one good way of doing it. The incubator program uh, will has accepted uh, 10 teams last year, and we are also looking forward to do so in next year as well. Uh, we are looking, like again, incubator programs, like always, just uh, accepts teams that wants to incubate a new idea of what we are different than most other incubator programs that we have both internal and external teams that we are trying to invest in like internal teams are for SGC organizational internal external teams are for things that do not necessarily have to be for space generation advisory council, council as an organization and can be anything else that will benefit our community and we have various factors that we take into when we consider the amount of funding that we want to give them the period they want to invest in um, we give them a lot of different support apart from financial investments such as mentoring programs and social and like social media exposure etc 
Um, but again, that's just one side of an incubator program that you usually won't see in the natural new space environment because it's a nonprofit that is running the whole program. We don't actually take equity from the startups yet. So we do have a lot different way of assessing the uh, startups and the impact that the startups uh, of these teams that will make to our community that is non-financial, more value-based in nature. Um, but again, I, I'm uh, also like here to listen to a lot of opinions and like also receive a lot of questions and comments uh, from the people here in general in how we could run these programs or also how uh, startups in the new space area, especially from non-Western countries in the emerging sectors could also receive their investment uh, and also add value to the global, um, to the global like supply chain. Thanks so much, Antonio. Are there any questions from the audience on um, the incubator or anything else for Antonio? Feel free to drop them in the chat or to just turn on your mic and then speak. Royal wants to know how they can apply. So they get to apply from the from our website. So, but that's pretty standard. Uh, it's just that uh, we have two ways of really identifying our potential teams. Is that uh, we have an open application where teams literally just sign up for. But a lot of times we get a lot of requests uh, from members saying. So it's not that, uh, so sometimes we get existing teams that apply to part of the incubator program, which is pretty straightforward, but we also try to incubate a lot of teams on our own, really try to push our members to create something to apply for the incubator program, especially for internal incubator programs, because we want to ensure that we have something of value to add to the SGS community, especially in just like internal things like we have one app, develop better, uh, in, a bit. We want to develop a better internal team. We want to try to see if we can develop an internal like merch center, like a merch pro uh, merch program website. Um, those things we actually need to create our own team members from our community to say, do you can we grab a few of our members together, get them into a team, get them through uh, like a hackathon program to see if they have any idea on what else that can be done for our community. So that's another side thing that we are developing right now because it is always great to, to kind of like create new startup teams that will just go out there in the world and do things. But trying to assess that impact is a lot more difficult than trying to get teams, trying to like just create new teams and see how those teams will be able to do things immediately for our organization um, that is just unique for us. So that's, um, that's like one new web, web uh, one new method that we're trying to do. And then like, um, again, uh, as I also mentioned in my introduction, uh, the SJC incubator program is just one thing that I do here. Um, I also work as the CEO of the startup company in South Korea as well, where the investment environment is also very different from the investment environment that I used to work when I, in, I worked in investment companies and startup accelerators in Silicon Valley, in Norway, in India, and in South Korea as well. And what I experienced in those spheres is also very different. Um, and I can also like receive questions about that as well. Yeah, Anthony, um, I'm interested to know um, what the investing environment is like in Korea and how it varies from um, the environment in the U.S. and the other places that you have experience in. Right. So in, in the West, especially in Silicon Valley, and just like based from all my different experiences. So in Norway and in Silicon Valley, you uh, evidently have these very wealthy investors who don't necessarily need to like see much more than a pitch tech or, you know, you already have a very well established investment community where uh, investment equity taking and risk assessment and management and like the assessment of like port the potential of different startups is very standard. Um, so you can receive a large fund investment with very little equity divestment. Uh, but in India and South Korea, where the investment structure is still being set up and the amount of risk assessment is mostly based on trust than on actual quantifiable measurements. So the whole pitching environment is very different. So in Silicon Valley and Nora, you can literally go to a very new community or you can go to very new investment investors and just talk to them. 
um, you will get referred to uh, from here to there, but mostly you can cold call up investors and literally just say, hey, this is something that I believe that you will be in in interested in. This is a sector that I know that you have an interest in. But in India and South Korea, if you do not have personal connections or referrals, it is very difficult to get the frontline seat for investment. And a lot of times, um, good companies don't necessarily come out from having good skills alone. It's more like how many people you have. It's very much, it's very expensive to be able to have very well-connected people into your C-suite environment to be able to even start that discussion of investment. And a lot of times they will not invest large sums of money straight on. Uh, you will have to dilute your equity um, to a sufficient amount and have quite a few of those investors on to your board members. Um, more than you would usually have in the Western countries in order for you to go to the next round and see and really ha and really see um, larger sums of investment coming through later on. But it does mean that a lot of your decision making strategies, a lot of your decision making capabilities are offboarded in very earlier stages of your startup. So it is very difficult for smaller startups or startups with more radical ideas to try to break through. Um, so right now, what we're actually seeing in the South Korean sector, as well as Indian sector, is that you are seeing these consortium investors, because investors also know that this is um, more unhealthy in trying to get the next leap of startups, because they are, they are, very, they are risk averse. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to pull a lot of their investment into these consortium of uh, common goal companies and trying to um compete them against each other so for example uh, in korea you have the samsung group the the, the hyundai group the hanwha group uh the lg group uh the kai the korean air industries group uh, all these industries the major players the multi-billion dollar companies in the aerospace um in the aerospace industries that actually has a lot of subsidiaries and a lot of the subsidiaries co-sponsoring a lot of different consortiums so that uh, when each consortium make their bid uh, for a, for example, a launch company in Korea, we have about uh, like four different major launcher development companies they're trying to do. They're all backed by different consortiums, but each major stockholder um, uh, conglomerate company still has a stake in every single one of those consortiums so that they're hedging their bets. And uh, when I was uh, living in India and also investing in Korean, that's also a very similar strategy that I'm seeing uh, because a lot of these conglomerates will try to hedge their bets by, by siphoning their dollars into these subsidiary companies and then putting them into a different consortium of, um, of investments that will also uh, pull different investments from different subsidiaries, from different like mega industries. So that's a very unique structure that I don't usually see as a standard practice in the Western, in, in the Western countries. Yeah, some really interesting differences. And we have a question from Tom in the chat. Um, he's asked how many teams have been through your accelerator program to date and how have they gained from that experience? So right now, uh, we've only had one cohort, a one year core is a very new program. We've had 10 teams, um, which has been exciting to work with. But um, <laughs> maybe people keep on telling me that I have too high expectations for my teams of coming from just very grueling accelerator programs in the past. Um, so honestly, they weren't that great, but they, they can they can get a lot better. Um, they do need a lot more commitment on the team side of things. How are you learning from that experience and uh, improving your accelerator going forward? So I'm trying, I'm learning to stratify my accelerator teams a lot more because uh, before I did think that all team have similar levels of commitment when coming into the accelerator program and going forward. Uh, but now I'm actually uh, trying to have four different strands of team. I mean, actually I actually have two different strands that people that the teams could apply for and for each strand uh, to subdivide them after the selection on our judgment into two other streams, uh, more active and less active strands. So um, what we're having is that we're trying to recruit nonprofit and for-profit teams in the application stage. Uh, nonprofits don't necessarily need to make profit, but they do need to uh, prove that they are making an impact into our uh, SGAC community. Uh, for for-profit, it's a lot more uh, straightforward. Like you just need to make profit uh, with the amount of money that we give you. But for each 
strand of the companies, we have uh, very low commitment and high commitment teams. Low commitment teams don't need to uh, prove as much of an improvement in their short term, but also they're not get, going to get like lo lower investment. So these are teams are, that are sort of already established. They already have a lot of operations going onwards. Uh, they are more self-sustainable. Um, they just need extra cash and um, more so, more like a mentoring network and social media exposure for them to get ahead with the programs and the projects that they already have. Higher commitment teams are teams that don't have as much to show. Uh, they're barely in their prototyping phase uh, or like in the pre-seed stage. So we're trying to get them into uh, having their MVPs rolled out. Um, so they're or our investment into those companies or non-companies for like the nonprofit ones are just for us trying to get them to get that MVP so that they can get more investment uh, and more investors by the end of our program. So that's the kind of like the four different types of programs that we're trying to develop based on our, I wouldn't say failure, but like based on the things that we learned from the different expectations that we received from our uh, previous incubator program. Sure. I'm curious to know um, what you think are kind of the most exciting um, sectors in the space industry right now. What new technologies, new companies you're seeing that um, have the most potential for investment or for really making a difference in the industry? So it's actually a very difficult question because a lot of the space companies that we're seeing right now a lot of the successful ones actually are more targeted to defense and they go exclusively towards defense contracts. Um, a lot of companies that are coming out right now have been in stealth mode for five plus years. They've been recruiting very silently through personal networks. They do not open recruit. They do not uh, open source investment. So it's actually very hard to know who are the open players in the market. Um, um, and the open players in the market, they tend to be more public sector, they tend to be more satellite service oriented uh, than launcher oriented, but the lot more lucrative startups are in the um, launcher market or in satellite servicing or, um, or I wouldn't say launcher, but like space access and space maneuverability and space situational awareness that is of dire concern to a lot of governments, in the, especially in the national security arm of things. So it's hard for civil sector people to come in and know that without the military level intelligence that you would get from um, being one of the people who would actually write and dispense those contracts out to the startups. But um, at least in the civil sector, um, more in the satellite imagery and like satellite communications, satellite manufacturing, the more banal side of things. Um, it is becoming a lot more, again, as, as you know, uh, more democratic, more uh, globalized um, and and whatnot, um, but it, you, uh, what you are seeing is that we are seeing a lot of different uh, vendors coming into the market. It's becoming very saturated red ocean market with uh, the profit margins decreasing every single year with more companies coming in. And uh, what I'm what I'm going to say is that not that there will be a few successful startups, but a lot of startups will fail out because they will simply not be able to hold true to the market growth that they have been that they have been expecting a lot of companies are saying this is the satellite market that's going to be in the coming for you this is the amount of payloads that we're going to launch we simply do not have enough payloads or enough customers to be able to sustain that market growth like uh, unless these companies can come up with ways to satisfy their own um supply needs such as spacex they're literally of satisfying their own launcher demands by having their own satellite constellation, unless you can come up with your own, the own demands for your product, you will uh, be unable to continue on that market path. Um, so what we're seeing is that companies are either subdividing and literally just creating their own market branch to satisfy that demand, or there's, we're seeing a consortium of companies that are coming together to form a newer company or a, quite a few companies going into m and in order to, in order to sustain uh, and hedge the risk of that future growth that they only kind of like talked about vaguely in the market sector. Interesting. If anybody has any other questions, please feel free to chime in um, whenever you like. 
otherwise I will just keep going. But I'm curious to hear um, what you think about, we've, we've heard a lot of discussion lately about a talent shortage in the space industry and about how um, companies are struggling to recruit um, um, talent. Oh, Wael is also asking for the website address for your incubator. Um, so whenever you want to drop that in the chat, that would be great. Um, but I'm curious if you've noticed that trend in Korea or through your accelerator, whether that's a real talent shortage or whether um, you think that companies are just kind of struggling to um, reach the, the talent that they're looking for. There's definitely a talent shortage. And this is something that's ubiquitous across all high tech industries. Um, is that you, I mean, a lot of people want work, but a lot of people are not finding work. A lot of companies are trying to find employees. They're not uh, finding employees because there's that gap of expectation. A lot of companies need people to come in and start work right away uh, with like uh, quite a few years of experience in like different sectors. Uh, but simply because the market has been expanding so fast, it is statistically impossible to, uh, to find people who have had that much experience and that much um, expertise um, in a certain field when that field has has not been of that size in previous years. And a lot of people are looking for work, but there are simply not enough entry-level positions in the companies because the, they are all startups. They are trying to prove something. They are trying to prototype it rapidly and prove it. Uh, but entry-level jobs, entry-level uh, personnel won't be able to satisfy that requirement. Um, especially of what's very interesting in the space sector is that we do have the national boundaries uh, that are set up. Engineering jobs are... Uh, most notorious in having limited country to country boundaries. Um, we, I mean, we have the marketing ploy that engineering jobs are valued everywhere else. Engineering jobs are translatable across borders, which is true if you work in the IT sector um, or in one of those sectors where it can be fluid and where companies have a large amount of visa uh, sponsorship uh, and immigration sponsorship statuses, but for actual hardware jobs because they are very platform dependent and where standardization of different hardware um, um, specifications are different across borders and international standard has not been established just yet. Like in Europe, it's uh, perfectly fine because you do have the ECSS standards and other standards that regulate the space industry that allows us to, that allows you uh, the, the European region to translate engineering talent from one country to another, but for especially emerging countries in Africa, in the, in the Asia Pacific and Latin America, um, it is very hard to translate uh, those particular region engineering um, structures into uh, other countries, like an uh, um, engineer from South Korea would find it very difficult to start working at an engineering company uh, in the United States in the skill level um, alone. But then you also go into the visa sponsorship and the legal arguments and trying to uh, remove one engineer from one country to a different country because in the IT sector, that's very easy. But in um, uh, both for the hardware companies, uh, uh, but in the hardware industry, that's a lot more difficult because you, for IT, you can just have a two-year contract, three-year contract, and they will like move around in the same countries. But for hardware contracts, because it is very dependent on particular systems, you need five plus 10-year contracts in order to hire an immigrant or hire someone outside. And it's very difficult for a country to make the commitment um, early on without knowing, without being able to prove. So uh, most companies will tend to, it's a lot easier for those companies to look domestically into the pool, but finding domestic talent for such high and new technologies is again, very difficult or it's very difficult with the price range that you're looking for. So you do need to go uh, find immigrant um, uh, immigrant work. So it's, it's, a, it's this self-conflict of what you are expecting, what you need uh, in the price range, the skill level, and being unable to satisfy that requirement uh, from um, a, uh, trying to satisfy that from a global workforce because Anywhere you have an, a workforce shortage is usually because of the lack of uh, cross-country workforce um, that you can develop. And that's why the IT industry have been able to like go ahead so much because they've been able to tap into the global workforce. Um, the space industry has been very behind on that. Definitely. Do you think that there are any steps that governments could take or that the space industry could take to kind of 
resolve some of those issues and conflicts, um, anything that they could borrow from the IT industry, for example, that would make it easier to resolve some of those talent issues? Yes, um, yes and no. So it's, uh, it's not so much as, oh, I need more people, so we need to change the policy, because that's not going to happen. That's, uh, that's what, you know, the, the top-down approach, you actually need to change the policies of the government, the bureaucracies, um, because it has to be a multilateral approach. Like one country changing their policies wouldn't necessarily affect them because the other country that you're also trying to get the engineers from will also change their policies. And that is actually, the, and, and that's going to be insanely difficult. And that's just not going to be in the purview of for, a lot of the country, uh, for a lot of the companies out there. What uh, the successful um, approach that we have seen is not by seeing the need and trying to um, pull the engineer into that need, but seeing that the need is there. And if you have a need to subcontract, to actually just cut that arm off and locating yourself, co-locating yourself to the talent that actually exists. So instead of trying to pull the engineers to you, the pushing yourself out to where the engineers are, and that's been the only successful approach that I uh, that we've been able to see in the space industry so far. Like if you literally have a satellite, man for a lot of the uh, satellite manufacturing companies, if you have um, like just being able to go internally and see, this is a satellite manufacturing supply chain. Uh, these are the areas that we can actually develop in house. These are our strengths, that's where where we can uh, commit to on this country end and for the uh and also identify segment that they can't I necessarily uh, satisfy or fulfill domestically or in-house actually just cutting out that whole portion and moving it to companies in, like in india in taiwan uh, in japan and south korea uh, and just making that particular segment um, be able to cross the borders, uh, getting like special approval from the government to be able to outsource that, uh, to transfer that particular uh, piece of technology uh, to an offshore office or factory, um, which is actually pretty easy. Just by collaborating with a different lab or like different company, you can set up a different um, legal entity that will allow you, which would be independent, which would be different from your company, but still in our like legal structure, like financial structures, you're still getting all the income uh, within your company. So the transferring up a certain um, modules and uh, certain components, uh, having that developed by that country where they're engineers, and then just like shipping those models uh, straight on to your satellite manufacturer, how I'm just consolidating. And that's the only successful approach that we've been able to see in the space industry so far, not to change the policies, but literally just uh, cut off your arm, put it where, uh, the talent is. All right, that's really interesting. I think we're pretty much, we're getting very close to the end of our time here. If there are no other questions from the audience, Antonio, I think I will let you go. I'll give them one minute to speak up, speak up if there are any more. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been really interesting to hear from you. Um, and I think I'm going to pass this back to Tom. Is that right? Yeah. Right, okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Antonio. Thanks for coming. It was great. I'm glad I could get you to do this. I know it's like 5 a.m. or something Saturday morning where you are. So this is a early day for you and I appreciate it so much. This is great. And we have a lot more conversations we're going to be having very soon now as well. Well, research and investment environment in the Asia Pacific is something that we could go into on and on about like the particulars of like different governments. I, I just wanted to talk more global um, situations and like global um, trends, but the more granular that we could get with these investment um, with these like investment opportunities for particular countries like South Korea, Japan, China, India, Singapore, uh, I can I can talk a lot more into that. So, but it's been very informative to also come to this conference to hear these questions and also like um, uh, seeing uh, you, Tom, uh, Tom, and also like Michael Lane over there. Uh, great to see some familiar faces, people who uh, kind of like mentor me in the whole space industry. So it's great to be here on the other side of the space spectrum and, um, in these conferences. Okay, um, I know this is kind of a moment a lot of people have been waiting for. We did a wonderful, uh, we had a great uh, uh, set of business plan competition presentations uh, the last few hours. Uh, the judges had, a, had some time to contemplate that now. Um, before I mention that, of course, I want to always lead off with uh, a lot of thank yous. 
I really uh, thank you to all the, uh, the finalists who, who took the risk and stepped up and worked with us on the, uh, on the coaching and uh, got and, and it really shows the quality of the, the pitches that we saw today. Uh, I think it was a testament to all the work we all did together to make this happen. Um, definitely want to thank the coaches, including uh, our own Jeff Kruken and Michael Lane, Kevin Russell, who's here. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and especially, I want to thank the judges, uh, Walt Anderson, uh, Dan Stone, and Eva Jane Lark. And just something I want to mention as an aside, uh, Eva Jane generally has a standing open offer. She is open to communications uh, with any of the finalists who would like to have them for uh for more feedback on their particular pitch and their particular business plan and model um and that's something you're interested in let me know and i will make sure uh we get you guys hooked up uh and of course finally i want to thank all the great great people at foundation for the future for putting on this event and sponsoring our grand prize of five thousand um, dollars thank you so much tim christman rachel uh, April and all the other great people that I've had a chance to work with off and on at this very fine organization. So uh, with that, um, the judges had a conversation. And, uh, and while all the, of course, all the teams were good teams, they had great plans and they had great ideas and they're very innovative and very interesting to look at. Uh, in their minds, in the minds of the judges, one team stood out in the in the several ways one they were technical they thought they're they're offering their technical solutions very well thought out they were serving a market niche that was relatively unserved at this uh, stage of the game uh, their technical team was extremely robust and they had something it's uh, that makes that's always good they have a recurring revenue business model and that's always a nice thing to have. Um, and so uh, without further ado, I'm going to announce the, the winner of the 21st New Space Business Plan competition is Innova Space. Yay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Alika, any fine words for us? Uh, thank you, thank you. We are thrilled to to receive this award, especially because uh, of the level that we find uh, here in the competition and the judges and I think the, the coaching and the other teams were. It's a, it was a very high uh, expectation, you know. It was a, it was a very difficult competition. It was not uh, a low level, so we're we're very happy and we're very grateful for you for to recognize this work of us. Great. I mean, that, and that just mentions something. There's a lot of work that we all did to make this happen. As I mentioned before, uh, all the teams and us coaches all got, to, all got together with them a couple of times over the last week and a half. And it could be grueling going through, going through those things. I found just this last week prepping for this event, I don't know about some of the rest of you guys, but I felt like I was at a space conference for a week. Is, is one of those things where you just you just say goodbye to your normal diet and your normal sleep pattern <laughs> because that's what happens and you you know because you want to get it done and you want to do things the right way and you're you know you're interacting with a whole lot of people uh, to make this a success <clears throat> and so I was really thrilled to see how today went it was a really great day and. Uh, as far as the future goes, we've got a couple of events in the planning stages right now. So uh, one of which may be another virtual uh, BPC event, and we're looking at maybe sometime in July for that. And of course, something else we've been working on long term is to have the first real live staged business plan competition event that we've had that we haven't had one of those since uh, 2019 because of all the COVID stuff. But uh, we're planning that for the end of September as part of the International Astronautical Congress in Paris. So uh, stay tuned for further information on that. And just for just for giggles, I'm going to uh, make sure everybody knows how to reach us at the Center for Space Commerce and Finance. Space. 
And there you go. And we can you can stay tuned there. We have a blog and we have other ways of getting information. And if you want to join our mailing list, you certainly can. We'll let you know everything that's going on in that regard. So uh, thank you again, everyone. Thanks especially to uh, Tim and the crew at uh, Foundation for the Future. And it was fun. And I hope to see you all again very soon. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, uh, crew. Uh, congrats, uh, Innova Space. Uh, well deserved. And uh, with that, we close out our February conversations for the future. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you next month. Take care. Thank you.